Forward of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2016. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Forward. President Lyndon B. Johnson, by Executive Order No. 11130, dated November 29, 1963, created this commission to investigate the assassination on November 22, 1963, of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States. The President directed the commission to evaluate all the facts and circumstances surrounding the assassination and the subsequent killing of the alleged assassin and to report its findings and conclusions to him. The subject of the Commission's inquiry was a chain of events which saddened and shocked the people of the United States and of the world. The assassination of President Kennedy and the simultaneous wounding of John B. Connolly, Jr., Governor of Texas, had been followed within an hour by the slaying of patrolman J. D. Tippett of the Dallas Police Department. In the United States and abroad, these events evoked universal demands for an explanation. Immediately after the assassination, state and local officials in Dallas devoted their resources to the apprehension of the assassin. The U.S. Secret Service, which is responsible for the protection of the president, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation began an investigation at the direction of President Johnson. Within 35 minutes of the killing of Patrolman Tippett, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested by the Dallas police as a suspect in that crime. Based on evidence provided by federal, state, and local agencies, the state of Texas arraigned Oswald within 12 hours of his arrest, charging him with the assassination of President Kennedy and the murder of Patrolman Tippett. On November 24, 1963, less than 18 hours after his arrest, Oswald was fatally shot in the basement of the Dallas Police Department by Jack Ruby, a Dallas nightclub owner. This shooting took place in full view of a national television audience. The events of these two days were witnessed with shock and disbelief by a nation grieving the loss of its young leader. Throughout the world, reports on these events were disseminated in massive detail. Theories and speculations mounted regarding the assassination. In many instances, the intense public demand for facts was met by partial and frequently conflicting reports from Dallas and elsewhere. After Oswald's arrest and his denial of all guilt, public attention focused both on the extent of the evidence against him and the possibility of a conspiracy, domestic or foreign. His subsequent death heightened public interest and stimulated additional suspicions and rumors. The Commission and its Powers after Lee Harvey Oswald was shot by Jack Ruby, it was no longer possible to arrive at the complete story of the assassination through normal judicial procedures during a trial of the alleged assassin. Alternative means for instituting a complete investigation were widely discussed. Federal and state officials conferred on the possibility of initiating a court of inquiry before a state magistrate in Texas. An investigation by the Grand Jury of Dallas County also was considered. A speculation about the existence of a foreign or domestic conspiracy became widespread. Committees in both houses of Congress weighed the desirability of congressional hearings to discover all the facts relating to the assassination. By his order of November 29th establishing the commission, President Johnson sought to avoid parallel investigations and to concentrate fact-finding in a body having the broadest national mandate. As chairman of the commission, President Johnson selected Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States, former governor and attorney general of the state of California. 
from the u s senate he chose richard b russell democratic senator from georgia and chairman of the senate armed services committee former governor of and county attorney in the state of georgia and john sherman cooper republican senator from kentucky former county and circuit judge state of kentucky and u s ambassador to india two members of the commission were drawn from the u s house of representatives hale boggs democratic u s representative from louisiana and majority whip and gerald r ford republican u s representative from michigan and chairman of the house republican conference from private life president johnson selected two lawyers by profession both of whom have served in the administrations of democratic and republican presidents allen w dulles former director of central intelligence and john j mccloy former president of the international bank for reconstruction and development former u s high commissioner for germany and during world war ii the assistant secretary of war from its first meeting on december fifth nineteen sixty three the commission viewed the executive order as an unequivocal presidential mandate to conduct a thorough and independent investigation because of the numerous rumors and theories the commission concluded that the public interest in ensuring that the truth was ascertained could not be met by merely accepting the reports or the analysis of federal or state agency not only were the premises and conclusions of those reports critically reassessed but all assertions or rumors relating to a possible conspiracy or the complicity of others than oswald which have come to the attention of the commission were investigated on december thirteenth nineteen sixty three congress enacted senate joint resolution one hundred thirty seven public law eighty eight two o two empowering the commission to issue subpoenas requiring the testimony of witnesses and the production of evidence relating to any matter under its investigation in addition the resolution authorized the commission to compel testimony from witnesses claiming the privilege against self-incrimination under the fifth amendment to the u s constitution by providing for the grant of immunity to persons testifying under such compulsion immunity under these provisions was not granted to any witness during the commission's investigation the commission took steps immediately to obtain the necessary staff to fulfill its assignment j lee ranking former solicitor general of the united states was sworn in as general counsel for the commission on december sixteenth nineteen sixty three Additional members of the legal staff were selected during the next few weeks. The Commission has been aided by 14 assistant counsel with high professional qualifications, selected by it from widely separated parts of the United States. This staff undertook the work of the Commission with a wealth of legal and investigative experience and a total dedication to the determination of the truth. The Commission has been assisted also by highly qualified personnel from several federal agencies assigned to the Commission at its request. This group included lawyers from the Department of Justice, agents of the Internal Revenue Service, a senior historian from the Department of Defense, an editor from the Department of State, and secretarial and administrative staff supplied by the General Services Administration and other agencies. In addition to the assistance afforded by federal agencies, the Commission throughout its inquiry had the cooperation of representatives of the City of Dallas and the State of Texas. The Attorney General of Texas, Wagoner Carr, aided by two distinguished lawyers of that state, Robert G. Story of Dallas, retired dean of the Southern Methodist University Law School and former president of the American Bar Association, and Leon Jaworski of Houston, former president of the Texas State Bar Association, has been fully informed at all times as to the progress of the investigation, and has advanced such suggestions as he and his special assistants considered helpful to the accomplishment of the Commission's assignment. Attorney General Carr has promptly supplied the Commission with pertinent information possessed by Texas officials. 
Dallas officials, particularly those from the police department, have fully complied with all requests made by the Commission. The Investigation During December and early January, the Commission received an increasing volume of reports from federal and state investigative agencies. Of principal importance was the five-volume report of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, submitted on December 9, 1963, which summarized the results of the investigation conducted by the Bureau immediately after the assassination. After reviewing this report, the Commission requested the Federal Bureau of Investigation to furnish the underlying investigative materials relied upon in the summary report. The first investigative reports submitted in response to this request were delivered to the Commission on December 20, 1963. On December 18, the Secret Service submitted a detailed report on security precautions taken before President Kennedy's trip to Texas and a summary of the events of November 22, as witnessed by Secret Service agents. A few days later, the Department of State submitted a report relating to Oswald's defection to the Soviet Union in 1959 and his return to the United States in 1962. On January 7 and 11, 1964, the Attorney General of Texas submitted an extensive set of investigative materials, largely Dallas police reports, on the assassination of President Kennedy and the killing of Oswald. As these investigative reports were received, the staff began analyzing and summarizing them. The members of the legal staff, divided into teams, proceeded to organize the facts revealed by these investigations, determine the issues, sort out the unresolved problems, and recommend additional investigation by the Commission. Simultaneously, to ensure that no relevant information would be overlooked, the Commission directed requests to the ten major departments of the federal government, fourteen of its independent agencies or commissions, and four congressional committees for all information relating to the assassination or the background and activities of Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby. After reviewing the accumulating materials, the Commission directed numerous additional requests to federal and state investigative agencies. The Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Secret Service executed the detailed requests for statements of witnesses and examinations of physical evidence with dispatch and thoroughness. All these reports were reviewed and analyzed by the Commission. Additional investigative requests, where appropriate, were handled by Internal Revenue Service, Department of State, and the military intelligence agencies with comparable skill. Investigative analyses of particular significance and sensitivity in the foreign areas were contributed by the Central Intelligence Agency. On occasion, the Commission used independent experts from state and city governments to supplement or verify information. During the investigation, the Commission on several occasions visited the scene of the assassination and other places in the Dallas area pertinent to the inquiry. The scope and detail of the investigative effort by the federal and state agencies are suggested in part by statistics from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Secret Service. Immediately after the assassination, more than 80 additional FBI personnel were transferred to the Dallas office on a temporary basis to assist in the investigation. Beginning November 22, 1963, the Federal Bureau of Investigation conducted approximately 25,000 interviews and re-interviews of persons having information of possible relevance to the investigation, and by September 11, 1964, submitted over 2,300 reports totaling approximately 25,400 pages to the Commission. During the same period, the Secret Service conducted approximately 1,550 interviews and submitted 800 reports, totaling some 4,600 pages. Because of the diligence, cooperation and facilities of federal investigative agencies, 
it was unnecessary for the commission to employ investigators other than the members of the commission's legal staff the commission recognized however that special measures were required whenever the facts or rumors called for an appraisal of the acts of the agencies themselves the staff reviewed in detail the actions of several federal agencies particularly the federal bureau of investigation the secret service the central intelligence agency and the department of state initially the commission requested the agencies to furnish all their reports relating to the assassination and their relationships with oswald or ruby on the basis of these reports the commission submitted specific questions to the agency involved members of the staff followed up the answers by reviewing the relevant files of each agency for additional information in some instances members of the commission also reviewed the files in person finally the responsible officials of these agencies were called to testify under oath dean rusk secretary of state c douglas dillon secretary of the treasury john a mccone director of the central intelligence agency j edgar hoover director of the federal bureau of investigation and james j rowley chief of the secret service appeared as witnesses and testified fully regarding their agency's participation in the matters under scrutiny by the commission commission hearings in addition to the information resulting from these investigations the commission has relied primarily on the facts disclosed by the sworn testimony of the principal witnesses to the assassination and related events beginning on february third nineteen sixty four the commission and its staff has taken the testimony of five hundred fifty two witnesses of this number ninety four appeared before members of the commission three hundred ninety five were questioned by members of the commission's legal staff sixty one supplied sworn affidavits and two gave statements under commission procedures all witnesses were advised that they had the right to the presence and the advice of their lawyer during the interrogation with the corollary rights to raise objections to any questions asked to make any clarifying statements on the record after the interrogation and to purchase a copy of their testimony commission hearings were closed to the public unless the witness appearing before the commission requested an open hearing under these procedures testimony of one witness was taken in a public hearing on two occasions no other witness requested a public hearing the commission concluded that the premature publication by it of testimony regarding the assassination or the subsequent killing of oswald might interfere with ruby's rights to a fair and impartial trial on the charges filed against him by the state of texas the commission also recognized that testimony would be presented before it which would be inadmissible in judicial proceedings and might prejudice innocent parties if made public out of context in addition to the witnesses who appeared before the commission numerous others provided sworn depositions affidavits and statements upon which the commission has relied since this testimony as well as that taken before the commission could not always be taken in logical sequence the commission concluded that partial publication of testimony as the investigation progressed was impractical and could be misleading the commission's function the commission's most difficult assignments have been to uncover all the facts concerning the assassination of president kennedy and to determine if it was in any way directed or encouraged by unknown persons at home or abroad in this process its objective has been to identify the person or persons responsible for both the assassination of president kennedy and the killing of oswald through an examination of the evidence the task has demanded unceasing appraisal of the evidence by the individual members of the commission in their effort to discover the whole truth the procedures followed by the commission in developing and assessing evidence necessarily differed from those of a court conducting a criminal trial of a defendant present before it since under our system there is no provision for a posthumous trial 
If Oswald had lived, he could have had a trial by American standards of justice, where he would have been able to exercise his full rights under the law. A judge and a jury would have presumed him innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. He might have furnished information which could have affected the course of his trial. He could have participated in and guided his defence. There could have been an examination to determine whether he was sane under prevailing legal standards. All witnesses, including possibly the defendant, could have been subjected to searching examination under the advisory system of American trials. The Commission has functioned neither as a court presiding over an adversary proceeding, nor as a prosecutor determined to prove a case, but as a fact-finding agency committed to the ascertainment of the truth. In the course of the investigation of the facts and rumours surrounding these matters, it was necessary to explore hearsay and other sources of information not admissible in a court proceeding obtained from persons who saw or heard, and others in a position to observe what occurred. In fairness to the alleged assassin and his family, the Commission on February 25, 1964, requested Walter E. Craig, President of the American Bar Association, to participate in the investigation and to advise the Commission whether in his opinion the proceedings conformed to the basic principles of American justice. Mr. Craig accepted this assignment and participated fully and without limitation. He attended Commission hearings in person or through his appointed assistants. All working papers, reports and other data in Commission files were made available and Mr. Craig and his associates were given the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, to recall any witnesses heard prior to his appointment, and to suggest witnesses whose testimony they would like to have the Commission hear. This procedure was agreeable to counsel for Oswald's widow. The Commission's Report In this report the Commission submits the results of its investigation. Each member of the Commission has given careful consideration to the entire report and concurs in its findings and conclusions. The report consists of an initial chapter summarizing the Commission's basic findings and conclusions, followed by a detailed analysis of the facts and the issues raised by the events of November 22, 1963 and the two following days. Individual chapters consider the trip to Dallas, the shots from the Texas School Book Depository, the identity of the assassin, the killing of Lee Harvey Oswald, the possibility of a conspiracy, Oswald's background and possible motive, and arrangements for the protection of the President. In these chapters, rather than rely on cross-references, the Commission on occasion has repeated certain testimony in order that the reader might have the necessary information before him while examining the conclusions of the Commission on each important issue. With this report, the Commission is submitting the complete testimony of all the witnesses who appeared before the Commission or gave sworn depositions or affidavits, the accompanying documentary exhibits, and other investigative materials which are relied upon in this report. The Commission is committing all of its reports and working papers to the National Archives, where they can be permanently preserved under the rules and regulations of the National Archives and applicable federal law. End of foreword. Section 1 of the Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 1, Summary and Conclusions, Part 1. The assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy on November 22, 1963, was a cruel and shocking act of violence directed against a man, a family, a nation, and against all mankind. 
a young and vigorous leader whose years of public and private life stretched before him, was the victim of the fourth presidential assassination in the history of a country dedicated to the concepts of reasoned argument and peaceful political change. This commission was created on November 29, 1963, in recognition of the right of people everywhere to a full and truthful knowledge concerning these events. This report endeavors to fulfill that right, and to appraise this tragedy by the light of reason and the standard of fairness. It has been prepared with a deep awareness of the Commission's responsibility to present to the American people an objective report of the facts relating to the assassination. Narrative of Events At 11.40 a.m. Central Standard Time, on Friday, November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy, Mrs. Kennedy, and their party arrived at Love Field, Dallas, Texas. Behind them was the first day of a Texas trip, planned five months before, by the President, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, and John B. Connolly, Jr., Governor of Texas. After leaving the White House on Thursday morning, the President had flown initially to San Antonio, where Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson joined the party, and the President dedicated new research facilities at the U.S. Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine. Following a testimonial dinner in Houston for U.S. Representative Albert Thomas, the President flew to Fort Worth, where he spent the night and spoke at a large breakfast gathering on Friday. Planned for later that day were a motorcade through downtown Dallas, a luncheon speech at the Trade Mart, and a flight to Austin, where the President would attend a reception and speak at a Democratic fundraising dinner. From Austin, he would proceed to the Texas ranch of the Vice President. Evident on this trip were the varied roles which an American President performs. Head of State, Chief Executive, Party Leader, and, in this instance, Prospective Candidate for Re-Election. The Dallas motorcade, it was hoped, would evoke a demonstration of the President's personal popularity in a city which he had lost in the 1960 election. Once it had been decided that the Texas trip would span two days, those responsible for planning, primarily Governor Connolly and Kenneth O'Donnell, a special assistant to the President, agreed that a motorcade through Dallas would be desirable. The Secret Service was told on November 8th that 45 minutes had been allotted to the motorcade procession from Love Field to the site of a luncheon planned by Dallas business and civic leaders in honor of the President. After considering the facilities and security problems of several buildings, the Trade Mart was chosen as the luncheon site. Given this selection, and in accordance with the customary practice of affording the greatest number of people an opportunity to see the President, the motorcade route selected was a natural one. The route was approved by the local host committee and White House representatives on November 18th, and publicized in the local papers starting on November 19th. This advance publicity made it clear that the motorcade would leave Main Street and pass the intersection of Elm and Houston Streets as it proceeded to the Trade Mart by way of the Stemmons Freeway. By mid-morning of November 22nd, clearing skies in Dallas dispelled the threat of rain, and the President greeted the crowds from his open limousine without the bubble top which was at that time a plastic shield furnishing protection only against inclement weather. To the left of the President in the rear seat was Mrs. Kennedy. In the jump seats were Governor Connolly, who was in front of the President, and Mrs. Connolly at the Governor's left. Agent William R. Greer of the Secret Service was driving, and Agent Roy H. Kellerman was sitting to his right. Directly behind the presidential limousine was an open follow-up car with eight Secret Service agents, two in the front seat, two in the rear, and two on each running board. These agents, in accordance with normal Secret Service procedures, were instructed to scan the crowds, the roofs, and windows of buildings, overpasses, and crossings for signs of trouble. Behind the follow-up car was the vice-presidential car, 
carrying the Vice President and Mrs. Johnson, and Senator Ralph W. Yarborough. Next were a Vice Presidential follow-up car, and several cars and buses for additional dignitaries, press representatives, and others. The motorcade left Love Field shortly after 11.50 a.m. and proceeded through residential neighborhoods, stopping twice at the President's request to greet well-wishers among the friendly crowds. Each time the President's car halted, Secret Service agents from the follow-up car moved forward to assume a protective stance near the President and Mrs. Kennedy. As the motorcade reached Main Street, a principal east-west artery in downtown Dallas, the welcome became tumultuous. At the extreme west end of Main Street, the motorcade turned right on Houston Street and proceeded north for one block in order to make a left turn on Elm Street, the most direct and convenient approach to the Stemmons Freeway and the Trade Mart. As the President's car approached the intersection of Houston and Elm Streets, there loomed directly ahead on the intersection's northwest corner a seven-story orange brick warehouse and office building, the Texas School Book Depository. Riding in the vice president's car, Agent Rufus W. Youngblood of the Secret Service noticed that the clock atop the building indicated 12.30 p.m., the scheduled arrival time at the trade mart. The president's car, which had been going north, made a sharp turn toward the southwest onto Elm Street. At a speed of about 11 miles per hour, it started down the gradual descent toward a railroad overpass, under which the motorcade would proceed before reaching the Stemmons Freeway. The front of the Texas School Book Depository was now on the president's right, and he waved to the crowd assembled there as he passed the building. Dealey Plaza, an open landscaped area marking the western end of downtown Dallas, stretched out to the president's left. A Secret Service agent riding in the motorcade radioed the trade mart that the president would arrive in five minutes. Seconds later, shots resounded in rapid succession. The president's hands moved to his neck. He appeared to stiffen momentarily and lurch slightly forward in his seat. A bullet had entered the base of the back of his neck, slightly to the right of the spine. It traveled downward and exited from the front of the neck, causing a nick in the left lower portion of the knot in the president's necktie. Before the shooting started, Governor Connolly had been facing toward the crowd on the right. He started to turn toward the left and suddenly felt a blow on his back. The governor had been hit by a bullet which entered at the extreme right side of his back, at a point below his right armpit. The bullet traveled through his chest in a downward and forward direction, exited below his right nipple, passed through his right wrist which had been in his lap, and then caused a wound to his left thigh. The force of the bullet's impact appeared to spin the governor to his right, and Mrs. Connolly pulled him down into her lap. Another bullet then struck President Kennedy, in the rear portion of his head, causing a massive and fatal wound. The President fell to the left into Mrs. Kennedy's lap. Secret Service Agent Clinton J. Hill, riding on the left running board of the follow-up car, heard a noise which sounded like a firecracker, and saw the President suddenly lean forward and to the left. Hill jumped off the car and raced towards the president's limousine. In the front seat of the vice presidential car, Agent Youngblood heard an explosion and noticed unusual movements in the crowd. He vaulted into the rear seat and sat on the vice president in order to protect him. At the same time, Agent Kellerman, in the front seat of the presidential limousine, turned to observe the president. Seeing that the president was struck, Kellerman instructed the driver, "'Let's get out of here. We're hit.' He radioed ahead to the lead car, "'Get us to the hospital immediately.' Agent Greer immediately accelerated the presidential car. As it gained speed, Agent Hill managed to pull himself onto the back of the car where Mrs. Kennedy had climbed. Hill pushed her back into the rear seat 
and shielded the stricken President and Mrs. Kennedy as the President's car proceeded at high speed to Parkland Memorial Hospital, four miles away. At Parkland, the President was immediately treated by a team of physicians who had been alerted for the President's arrival by the Dallas Police Department as a result of a radio message from the motorcade after the shooting. The doctors noted irregular breathing movements and a possible heartbeat, although they could not detect a pulse beat. They observed the extensive wound in the President's head and a small wound approximately one-fourth inch in diameter in the lower third of his neck. In an effort to facilitate breathing, the physicians performed a tracheotomy by enlarging the throat wound and inserting a tube. Totally absorbed in the immediate task of trying to preserve the President's life, the attending doctors never turned the President over for an examination of his back. At 1 p.m., after all heart activity had ceased and the last rites were administered by a priest, President Kennedy was pronounced dead. Governor Connolly underwent surgery and ultimately recovered from his serious wounds. Upon learning of the President's death, Vice President Johnson left Parkland Hospital under close guard and proceeded to the presidential plane at Love Field. Mrs. Kennedy, accompanying her husband's body, boarded the plane shortly thereafter. At 2.38 p.m. in the central compartment of the plane, Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as the 36th President of the United States by Federal District Court Judge Sarah T. Hughes. The plane immediately left for Washington, D.C., arriving at Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, at 5.58 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The President's body was taken to the National Naval Medical Center, Bethesda, Maryland, where it was given a complete pathological examination. The autopsy disclosed the large head wound observed at Parkland and the wound in the front of the neck, which had been enlarged by the Parkland doctors when they performed the tracheotomy. Both of these wounds were described in the autopsy report as being presumably of exit. In addition, the autopsy revealed a small wound of entry in the rear of the President's skull and another wound of entry near the base of the back of the neck. The autopsy report stated the cause of death as gunshot wound, head, and the bullets which struck the President were described as having been fired from a point behind and somewhat above the level of the deceased. At the scene of the shooting, there was evident confusion at the outset concerning the point of origin of the shots. Witnesses differed in their accounts of the direction from which the sound of the shots had emanated, Within a few minutes, however, attention centered on the Texas School Book Depository building as the source of the shots. The building was occupied by a private corporation, the Texas School Book Depository Company, which distributed school textbooks for several publishers and leased space to representatives of the publishers. Most of the employees in the building worked for these publishers. The balance, including a 15-man warehouse crew, were employees of the Texas School Book Depository Company itself. Several eyewitnesses in front of the building reported that they saw a rifle being fired from the southeast corner window on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. One eyewitness, Howard L. Brennan, had been watching the parade from a point on Elm Street directly opposite and facing the building. He promptly told a policeman that he had seen a slender man, about five feet ten inches, in his early thirties, take deliberate aim from the sixth floor corner window and fire a rifle in the direction of the president's car. Brennan thought he might be able to identify the man, since he had noticed him in the window a few minutes before the motorcade made the turn onto Elm Street. At 12.34 p.m., the Dallas police radio mentioned the depository building as a possible source of the shots, and at 12.45 p.m., the police radio broadcast a description of the suspected assassin, based primarily on Brennan's observations. When the shots were fired, a Dallas motorcycle patrolman, Marion L. Baker, was riding in the motorcade at a point several cars behind the president. 
he had turned right from Main Street on to Houston Street, and was about two hundred feet south of Elm Street when he heard a shot. Baker, having recently returned from a week of deer hunting, was certain the shot came from a high-powered rifle. He looked up and saw pigeons scattering in the air from their perches on the school book depository building. He raced his motorcycle to the building, dismounted, scanned the area to the west, and pushed his way through the spectators toward the entrance. There he encountered Roy Truly, the building superintendent, who offered Baker his help. They entered the building and ran toward the two elevators in the rear. Finding that both elevators were on an upper floor, they dashed up the stairs. Not more than two minutes had elapsed since the shooting. When they reached the second floor landing, on their way up to the top of the building, Patrolman Baker thought he caught a glimpse of someone through the small glass window in the door separating the hall area near the stairs from the small vestibule leading into the lunchroom. Gun in hand, he rushed to the door and saw a man about twenty feet away walking toward the other end of the lunchroom. The man was empty-handed. At Baker's command, the man turned and approached him. Truly, who had started up the stairs to the third floor ahead of Baker, returned to see what had delayed the patrolman. Baker asked Truly whether he knew the man in the lunchroom. Truly replied that the man worked in the building, whereupon Baker turned from the man and proceeded with Truly up the stairs. The man they encountered had started working in the Texas School Book Depository Building on October 16, 1963. His fellow workers described him as very quiet, a loner, his name was Lee Harvey Oswald. Within about one minute after his encounter with Baker and Truly, Oswald was seen passing through the second-floor offices. In his hand was a full Coke bottle which he had purchased from a vending machine in the lunchroom. He was walking toward the front of the building, where a passenger elevator and a short flight of stairs provided access to the main entrance of the building on the first floor. Approximately seven minutes later, at about 12.40 p.m., Oswald boarded a bus at a point on Elm Street, seven short blocks east of the depository building. The bus was traveling west, toward the very building from which Oswald had come. Its route lay through the Oak Cliff section in southwest Dallas, where it would pass seven blocks east of the rooming house in which Oswald was living, at 1026 North Beckley Avenue. On the bus was Mrs. Mary Bledsoe, one of Oswald's former landladies, who immediately recognized him. Oswald stayed on the bus approximately three or four minutes, during which time it proceeded only two blocks, because of the traffic jam created by the motorcade in the assassination. Oswald then left the bus. A few minutes later he entered a vacant taxi four blocks away, and asked the driver to take him to a point on North Beckley Avenue, several blocks beyond his rooming house. This trip required five or six minutes. At about 1 p.m., Oswald arrived at the rooming house. The housekeeper, Mrs. Erlene Roberts, was surprised to see Oswald at midday, and remarked to him that he seemed to be in quite a hurry. He made no reply. A few minutes later, Oswald emerged from his room, zipping up his jacket, and rushed out of the house. Approximately fourteen minutes later, just forty-five minutes after the assassination, another violent shooting occurred in Dallas. The victim was Patrolman J. D. Tippett of the Dallas Police, an officer with a good record during his more than eleven years with the police force. He was shot near the intersection of 10th Street and Patton Avenue, about nine-tenths of a mile from Oswald's rooming house. At the time of the assassination, Tippett was alone in his patrol car, the routine practice for most police patrol officers at this time of day. He had been ordered by radio at 12.45 p.m. to proceed to the central Oak Cliff area as part of a concentration of patrol car activity around the center of the city following the assassination. At 12.54, Tippett radioed that he had moved as directed and would be available for any emergency. By this time, the police radio had broadcast several messages alerting the police to the suspect described by Brennan at the scene of the assassination. 
slender white male, about 30 years old, 5 feet 10 inches, and weighing about 165 pounds. At approximately 1.15 p.m., Tippett was driving slowly in an easterly direction on East 10th Street in Oak Cliff. About 100 feet past the intersection of 10th Street and Patton Avenue, Tippett pulled up alongside a man walking in the same direction. The man met the general description of the suspect wanted in connection with the assassination. He walked over to Tippett's car, rested his arms on the door on the right-hand side of the car, and apparently exchanged words with Tippett through the window. Tippett opened the door on the left side and started to walk around the front of the car. As he reached the front wheel on the driver's side, the man on the sidewalk drew a revolver and fired several shots in rapid succession, hitting Tippett four times and killing him instantly. An automobile repairman, Domingo Benavides, heard the shots and stopped his pickup truck on the opposite side of the street, about 25 feet in front of Tippett's car. He observed the gunman start back toward Patton Avenue, removing the empty cartridge cases from the gun as he went. Benavides rushed to Tippett's side. The patrolman, apparently dead, was lying on his revolver, which was out of its holster. Benavides promptly reported the shooting to police headquarters over the radio in Tippett's car. The message was received shortly after 1.16 p.m. As the gunman left the scene, he hurriedly walked back toward Patton Avenue and turned left, heading south. Standing on the northwest corner of 10th Street and Patton Avenue was Helen Markham, who had been walking south on Patton Avenue and had seen both the killer and Tippett cross the intersection in front of her as she waited on the curb for the traffic to pass. She witnessed the shooting, and then saw the man with a gun in his hand walk back toward the corner and cut across the lawn of the corner house as he started south on Patton Avenue. In the corner house itself, Mrs. Barbara Jeanette Davis and her sister-in-law, Mrs. Virginia Davis, heard the shots. They rushed to the door in time to see the man walk rapidly across the lawn, shaking a revolver as if he were emptying it of cartridge cases. Later that day, each woman found a cartridge case near the home. As the gunman turned the corner, he passed alongside a taxi cab, which was parked on Patton Avenue a few feet from 10th Street. The driver, William W. Scoggins, had seen the slaying, and was now crouched behind his cab on the street side. As the gunman cut through the shrubbery on the lawn, Scoggins looked up and saw the man approximately 12 feet away. In his hand was a pistol, and he muttered words which sounded to Scoggins like, Poor dumb cop, or poor damn cop. After passing Scoggins, the gunman crossed to the west side of Patton Avenue, and ran south toward Jefferson Boulevard, a main Oak Cliff thoroughfare. On the east side of Patton, between 10th Street and Jefferson Boulevard, Ted Calloway, a used car salesman, had heard the shots and ran to the sidewalk. As the man with the gun rushed past, Calloway shouted, What's going on? The man merely shrugged, ran on to Jefferson Boulevard, and turned right. On the next corner was a gas station with a parking lot in the rear. The assailant ran into the lot, discarded his jacket, and then continued his flight west on Jefferson. In a shoe store a few blocks further west on Jefferson, the manager, Johnny Calvin Brewer, heard the siren of a police car moments after the radio in his store had announced the shooting of the police officer in Oak Cliff. Brewer saw a man step quickly into the entranceway of the store and stand there with his back toward the street. When the police car made a U-turn and headed back in the direction of the tippet shooting, the man left, and Brewer followed him. He saw the man enter the Texas Theater, a motion picture house about 60 feet away, without buying a ticket. Brewer pointed this out to the cashier, Mrs. Julia Postal, who called the police. The time was shortly after 1.40 p.m. At 1.29 p.m., the police radio had noted the similarity in the descriptions of the suspects in the Tippett shooting and the assassination. At 1.45 p.m., in response to Mrs. Postal's call, 
the police radio sounded the alarm. Have information a suspect just went into the Texas theater on West Jefferson. Within minutes, the theater was surrounded. The house lights were then turned up. Patrolman M. N. MacDonald and several other policemen approached the man who had been pointed out to them by Brewer. MacDonald ordered the man to his feet, and heard him say, Well, it's all over now. The man drew a gun from his waist with one hand, and struck the officer with the other. MacDonald struck out with his right hand, and grabbed the gun with his left hand. After a brief struggle, MacDonald and several other police officers disarmed and handcuffed the suspect, and drove him to police headquarters, arriving at approximately 2 p.m. Following the assassination, police cars had rushed to the Texas School Book Depository in response to the many radio messages reporting that the shots had been fired from the depository building. Inspector J. Herbert Sawyer of the Dallas Police Department arrived at the scene shortly after hearing the first of these police radio messages at 12.34 p.m. Some of the officers who had been assigned to the area of Elm and Houston Streets for the motorcade were talking to witnesses and watching the building when Sawyer arrived. Sawyer entered the building and rode a passenger elevator to the fourth floor, which was the top floor for this elevator. He conducted a quick search, returned to the main floor, and between approximately 12.37 and 12.40 p.m. ordered that no one be permitted to leave the building. Shortly before 1 p.m., Captain J. Will Fritz, chief of the Homicide and Robbery Bureau of the Dallas Police Department, arrived to take charge of the investigation. Searching the sixth floor, Deputy Sheriff Luke Mooney noticed a pile of cartons in the southeast corner. He squeezed through the boxes and realized immediately that he had discovered the point from which the shots had been fired. On the floor were three empty cartridge cases. A carton had apparently been placed on the floor at the side of the window so that a person sitting on the carton could look down Elm Street toward the overpass and scarcely be noticed from the outside. Between this carton and the half-open window were three additional cartons arranged at such an angle that a rifle resting on the top carton would be aimed directly at the motorcade as it moved away from the building. The high stack of boxes, which had first attracted Mooney's attention, effectively screened a person at the window from the view of anyone else on that floor. Mooney's discovery intensified the search for additional evidence on the sixth floor, and at 1.22 p.m., approximately ten minutes after the cartridge cases were found, Deputy Sheriff Eugene Boone turned his flashlight in the direction of two rows of boxes in the northwest corner near the staircase. Stuffed between the two rows was a bolt-action rifle with a telescopic sight. This rifle was not touched until it could be photographed. When Lieutenant J. C. Day of the Police Identification Bureau decided that the wooden stock and the metal knob at the end of the bolt contained no prints, he held the rifle by the stock while Captain Fritz ejected a live shell by operating the bolt. Lieutenant Day promptly noted that stamped on the rifle itself was the serial number C-2766, as well as the markings 1940, Made Italy, and caliber 6.5. The rifle was about 40 inches long, and when disassembled, could fit into a handmade paper sack, which, after the assassination, was found in the southeast corner of the building, within a few feet of the cartridge cases. As Fritz and Day were completing their examination of this rifle on the sixth floor, Roy Truly, the building superintendent, approached with information which he felt should be brought to the attention of the police. Earlier, while the police were questioning the employees, Truly had observed that Lee Harvey Oswald, one of the fifteen men who worked in the warehouse, was missing. After Truly provided Oswald's name, address, and general description, Fritz left for police headquarters. He arrived at headquarters shortly after 2 p.m., and asked two detectives to pick up the employee who was missing from the Texas School Book Depository. Standing nearby were the police officers who had just arrived with the man arrested in the Texas theater. When Fritz mentioned the name of the missing employee, he learned that that man was already in the interrogation room. 
the missing school book depository employee and the suspect who had been apprehended in the Texas theater were one and the same, Lee Harvey Oswald. The suspect Fritz was about to question in connection with the assassination of the president and the murder of a policeman was born in New Orleans on October 18, 1939, two months after the death of his father. His mother, Marguerite Clavery Oswald, had two older children. One, John Pick, was a half-brother to Lee from an earlier marriage which had ended in divorce. The other was Robert Oswald, a full brother to Lee and five years older. When Lee Oswald was three, Mrs. Oswald placed him in an orphanage, where his brother and half-brother were already living, primarily because she had to work. In January 1944, when Lee was four, he was taken out of the orphanage, and shortly thereafter his mother moved with him to Dallas, Texas, where the older boys joined them at the end of the school year. In May of 1945, Marguerite Oswald married her third husband, Edwin A. Ekdahl. While the two older boys attended a military boarding school, Lee lived at home and developed a warm attachment to Ekdahl, occasionally accompanying his mother and stepfather on business trips around the country. Lee started school in Benbrook, Texas, but in the fall of 1946, after a separation from Ekdahl, Marguerite re-entered Lee in the first grade in Covington, Louisiana. In January 1947, while Lee was still in the first grade, the family moved to Fort Worth, Texas, as the result of an attempted reconciliation between Ekdahl and Lee's mother. A year and a half later, before Lee was nine, his mother was divorced from her third husband as the result of a divorce action instituted by Ekdahl. Lee's school record during the next five and a half years in Fort Worth was average, although generally it grew poorer each year. The comments of teachers and others who knew him at that time do not reveal any unusual personality traits or characteristics. End of Section 1 Recording by Maria Casper Section 2 of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 1. Summary and Conclusions. Part 2. Another change for Lee Oswald occurred in August 1952, a few months after he completed the sixth grade. Marguerite Oswald and her twelve-year-old son moved to New York City, where Marguerite's oldest son, John Pick, was stationed with the Coast Guard, the ensuing year and one half in New York was marked by Lee's refusals to attend school and by emotional and psychological problems of a seemingly serious nature. Because he had become a chronic school truant, Lee underwent psychiatric study at Youth House, an institution in New York for juveniles who have had truancy problems or difficulties with the law, and who appear to require psychiatric observation or other types of guidance. The social worker assigned to his case described him as seriously detached and withdrawn, and noted a rather pleasant, appealing quality about this emotionally starved, affectionless youngster. Lee expressed the feeling to the social worker that his mother did not care for him and regarded him as a burden. He experienced fantasies about being all-powerful and hurting people, but during his stay at Youth House he was apparently not a behavior problem. He appeared withdrawn and evasive, a boy who preferred to spend his time alone reading and watching television. His tests indicated that he was above average in intelligence for his age group. 
the chief psychiatrist of Youth House diagnosed Lee's problem as a personality pattern disturbance with schizoid features and passive-aggressive tendencies. He concluded that the boy was an emotionally quite disturbed youngster and recommended psychiatric treatment. In May 1953, after having been at Youth House for three weeks, Lee Oswald returned to school, where his attendance and grades temporarily improved. By the following fall, however, the probation officer reported that virtually every teacher complained about the boy's behavior. His mother insisted that he did not need psychiatric assistance. Although there was apparently some improvement in Lee's behavior during the next few months, the court recommended further treatment. In January 1954, while Lee's case was still pending, Marguerite and Lee left for New Orleans, the city of Lee's birth. Upon his return to New Orleans, Lee maintained mediocre grades, but had no obvious behavior problems. Neighbors and others who knew him outside of school remembered him as a quiet, solitary, and introverted boy who read a great deal and whose vocabulary made him quite articulate. About one month after he started the tenth grade, and eleven days before his sixteenth birthday, in October 1955, he brought to school a note, purportedly written by his mother, stating that the family was moving to California. The note was written by Lee. A few days later he dropped out of school and almost immediately tried to join the Marine Corps, because he was only 16, he was rejected. After leaving school, Lee worked the next 10 months at several jobs in New Orleans as an office messenger or clerk. It was during this period that he started to read communist literature. Occasionally, in conversations with others, he praised communism and expressed to his fellow employees a desire to join the Communist Party. At about this time, when he was not yet seventeen, he wrote to the Socialist Party of America, professing his belief in Marxism. Another move followed in July 1956, when Lee and his mother returned to Fort Worth. He re-entered high school, but again dropped out after a few weeks, and enlisted in the Marine Corps in October 1956, six days after his seventeenth birthday. On December 21, 1956, during boot camp in San Diego, Oswald fired a score of 212 for a record with the M1 rifle, two points over the minimum for a rating of sharpshooter on a marksman sharpshooter expert scale. After his basic training, Oswald received training in aviation fundamentals and then in radar scanning. Most people who knew Oswald in the Marines described him as a loner who resented the exercise of authority by others. He spent much of his free time reading. He was court-martialed once for possessing an unregistered, privately owned weapon, and on another occasion for using provocative language to a non-commissioned officer. He was, however, generally able to comply with Marine discipline, even though his experiences in the Marine Corps did not live up to his expectations. Oswald served 15 months overseas until November 1958, most of it in Japan. During his final year in the Marine Corps, he was stationed for the most part in Santa Ana, California, where he showed marked interest in the Soviet Union and sometimes expressed politically radical views with dogmatic conviction. Oswald again fired the M1 rifle for record on May 6, 1959, and this time he shot a score of 191 on a shorter course than before, only one point over the minimum required to be a marksman. According to one of his fellow Marines, Oswald was not particularly interested in his rifle performance, and his unit was not expected to exhibit the usual rifle proficiency, during this period he expressed strong admiration for Fidel Castro and an interest in joining the Cuban army. He tried to impress those around him as an intellectual, but his thinking appeared to some as shallow and rigid. Oswald's marine service terminated on September 11, 1959, 
when at his own request he was released from active service a few months ahead of his scheduled release he offered as the reason for his release the ill health and economic plight of his mother he returned to fort worth remained with his mother only three days and left for new orleans telling his mother he planned to get work there in the shipping or import export business in new orleans he booked passage on the freighter s s marion likes which sailed from new orleans to le havre france on september twentieth nineteen fifty nine Lee Harvey Oswald had presumably planned this step in his life for quite some time. In March of 1959, he had applied to the Albert Schweitzer College in Switzerland for admission to the spring 1960 term. His letter of application contained many blatant falsehoods concerning his qualifications and background. A few weeks before his discharge, he had applied for and obtained a passport listing the Soviet Union as one of the countries which he planned to visit. During his service in the Marines, he had saved a comparatively large sum of money, possibly as much as $1,500, which would appear to have been accomplished by considerable frugality, and apparently for a specific purpose. The purpose of the accumulated fund soon became known. On October 16, 1959, Oswald arrived in Moscow by train, after crossing the border from Finland, where he had secured a visa for a six-day stay in the Soviet Union. He immediately applied for Soviet citizenship. On the afternoon of October 21, 1959, Oswald was ordered to leave the Soviet Union by 8 p.m. that evening. The same afternoon, in his hotel room, Oswald, in an apparent suicide attempt, slashed his left wrist, he was hospitalized immediately. On October 31st, three days after his release from the hospital, Oswald appeared at the American Embassy, announced that he wished to renounce his U.S. citizenship and become a Russian citizen, and handed the embassy officer a written statement that he had prepared for the occasion. When asked his reasons, Oswald replied, I am a Marxist. Oswald never formally complied with the legal steps necessary to renounce his American citizenship. The Soviet government did not grant his request for citizenship. But in January 1960, he was given permission to remain in the Soviet Union on a year-to-year -year basis. At the same time, Oswald was sent to Minsk, where he worked in a radio factory as an unskilled laborer. In January 1961, his permission to remain in the Soviet Union was extended for another year. A few weeks later, in February 1961, he wrote to the American Embassy in Moscow expressing a desire to return to the United States. The following month, Oswald met a 19-year-old Russian girl, Marina Nikolaevna Prusakova, a pharmacist who had been brought up in Leningrad but was then living with an aunt and uncle in Minsk. They were married on April 30, 1961. Throughout the following year, he carried on a correspondence with American and Soviet authorities, seeking approval for the departure of himself and his wife to the United States. In the course of this effort, Oswald and his wife visited the U.S. Embassy in Moscow in July of 1961. Primarily on the basis of an interview and questionnaire completed there, the embassy concluded that Oswald had not lost his citizenship, a decision subsequently ratified by the Department of State in Washington, D.C. Upon their return to Minsk, Oswald and his wife filed with the Soviet authorities for permission to leave together. Their formal application was made in July 1961, and on December 25, 1961, Marina Oswald was advised it would be granted. A daughter was born to the Oswalds in February 1962. In the months that followed, they prepared for their return to the United States. On May 9, 1962, the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service, at the request of the Department of State, agreed to waive a restriction under the law which would have prevented the issuance of a United States visa to Oswald's Russian wife until she had left the Soviet Union. 
They finally left Moscow on June 1, 1962, and were assisted in meeting their travel expenses by a loan of $435.71 from the U.S. Department of State. Two weeks later, they arrived in Fort Worth, Texas. For a few weeks, Oswald, his wife, and child lived with Oswald's brother, Robert. After a similar stay with Oswald's mother, they moved into their own apartment in early August. Oswald obtained a job on July 16th as a sheet metal worker. During this period in Fort Worth, Oswald was interviewed twice by agents of the FBI. The report of the first interview, which occurred on June 26th, described him as arrogant and unwilling to discuss the reasons why he had gone to the Soviet Union. Oswald denied that he was ever involved in Soviet intelligence activities, and promised to advise the FBI if Soviet representatives ever communicated with him. He was interviewed again on August 16th, when he displayed a less belligerent attitude, and once again agreed to inform the FBI of any attempt to enlist him in intelligence activities. In early October 1962, Oswald quit his job at the sheet metal plant and moved to Dallas. While living in Fort Worth, the Oswalds had been introduced to a group of Russian-speaking people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Many of them assisted the Oswalds by providing small amounts of food, clothing, and household items. Oswald himself was disliked by almost all this group, whose help to the family was prompted primarily by sympathy for Marina Oswald and the child. Despite the fact that he had left the Soviet Union disillusioned with its government, Oswald seemed more firmly committed than ever to his concepts of Marxism. He showed disdain for democracy, capitalism, and American society in general. He was highly critical of the Russian-speaking group because they seemed devoted to American concepts of democracy and capitalism and were ambitious to improve themselves economically. In February 1963, the Oswalds met Ruth Payne at a social gathering. Ruth Payne was temporarily separated from her husband and living with her two children in their home in Irving, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. Because of an interest in the Russian language and sympathy for Marina Oswald, who spoke no English and had little funds, Ruth Payne befriended Marina and during the next two months visited her on several occasions. On April 6, 1963, Oswald lost his job with a photography firm. A few days later, on April 10th, he attempted to kill Major General Edwin A. Walker, retired U.S. Army, using a rifle which he had ordered by mail one month previously under an assumed name. Marina Oswald learned of her husband's act when she confronted him with a note which he had left, giving her instructions in the event he did not return. That incident, and their general economic difficulties, impelled Marina Oswald to suggest that her husband leave Dallas and go to New Orleans to look for work. Oswald left for New Orleans on April 24, 1963. Ruth Payne, who knew nothing of the Walker shooting, invited Marina Oswald and the baby to stay with her in the Payne's modest home, while Oswald sought work in New Orleans. Early in May, upon receiving word from Oswald that he had found a job, Ruth Payne drove Marina Oswald and the baby to New Orleans to rejoin Oswald. During the stay in New Orleans, Oswald formed a fictitious New Orleans chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. He posed as secretary of this organization and represented that the president was A.J. Hiddell, in reality, Hiddell was a completely fictitious person created by Oswald, the organization's only member. Oswald was arrested on August 9th in connection with a scuffle which occurred while he was distributing pro-Castro leaflets. The next day, while at the police station, he was interviewed by an FBI agent after Oswald requested the police to arrange such an interview. Oswald gave the agent false information about his own background and was evasive in his replies concerning fair play for Cuba activities. During the next two weeks, Oswald appeared on radio programs twice, 
claiming to be the spokesman for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee of New Orleans. On July 19, 1963, Oswald lost his job as a greaser of coffee processing machinery. In September, after an exchange of correspondence with Marina Oswald, Ruth Payne drove to New Orleans and on September 23rd transported Marina, the child, and the family belongings to Irving, Texas. Ruth Payne suggested that Marina Oswald, who was expecting her second child in October, should live at the Payne house until after the baby was born. Oswald remained behind, ostensibly to find work, either in Houston or some other city. Instead, he departed by bus for Mexico, arriving in Mexico City on September 27th, where he promptly visited the Cuban and Russian embassies. His stated objective was to obtain official permission to visit Cuba on his way to the Soviet Union. The Cuban government would not grant his visa unless the Soviet government would also issue a visa permitting his entry into Russia. Oswald's efforts to secure these visas failed, and he left for Dallas, where he arrived on October 3, 1963. When he saw his wife the next day, it was decided that Oswald would rent a room in Dallas and visit his family on weekends. For one week, he rented a room from Mrs. Bledsoe, the woman who later saw him on the bus shortly after the assassination. On October 14, 1963, he rented the Beckley Avenue room and listed his name as O. H. Lee. On the same day, at the suggestion of a neighbor, Mrs. Payne phoned the Texas School Book Depository and was told there was a job opening. She informed Oswald, who was interviewed the following day at the depository, and started to work there on October 16, 1963. On October 20th, the Oswald's second daughter was born. During October and November, Oswald established a general pattern of weekend visits to Irving, arriving on Friday afternoon and returning to Dallas Monday morning with a fellow employee, Buell Wesley Frazier, who lived near the Paines. On Friday, November 15th, Oswald remained in Dallas at the suggestion of his wife, who told him that the house would be crowded because of a birthday party for Ruth Payne's daughter. On Monday, November 18th, Oswald and his wife quarreled bitterly during a telephone conversation because she learned for the first time that he was living at the rooming house under an assumed name. On Thursday, October 21st, Oswald told Frazier that he would like to drive to Irving to pick up some curtain rods for an apartment in Dallas. His wife and Mrs. Payne were quite surprised to see him since it was a Thursday night. They thought he had returned early to make up after Monday's quarrel. He was conciliatory, but Marina Oswald was still angry. Later that evening, when Mrs. Payne had finished cleaning the kitchen, she went into the garage and noticed that the light was burning. She was certain that she had not left it on, although the incident appeared unimportant at the time. In the garage were most of the Oswald's personal possessions. The following morning, Oswald left while his wife was still in bed feeding the baby, she did not see him leave the house, nor did Ruth Payne. On the dresser in their room, he left his wedding ring, which he had never done before. His wallet, containing $170, was left intact in a dresser drawer. Oswald walked to Fraser's house about a half a block away, and placed a long, bulky package made out of wrapping paper and tape into the rear seat of the car. He told Frazier that the package contained the curtain rods. When they reached the depository parking lot, Oswald walked quickly ahead. Frazier followed and saw Oswald enter the depository building carrying the long bulky package with him. During the morning of November 22nd, Marina Oswald followed President Kennedy's activities on television. She and Ruth Payne cried when they heard that the president had been shot. Ruth Payne translated the news of the shooting to Marina Oswald as it came over the television, including the report that the shots were probably fired from the building where Oswald worked. 
when marina oswald heard this she recalled the walker episode and the fact that her husband still owned that rifle she went quietly to payne's garage where the rifle had been concealed in a blanket among their other belongings it appeared to her that the rifle was still there although she did not actually open the blanket at about three p m the police arrived at the payne house and asked marina oswald whether her husband owned a rifle she said that he did and led them into the garage and pointed to the rolled-up blanket as the police officer lifted it the blanket hung limply over either side of his arm the rifle was not there meanwhile at police headquarters captain fritz had begun questioning oswald soon after the start of the first interrogation agents of the fbi and the u s secret service arrived and participated in the questioning Oswald denied having anything to do with the assassination of President Kennedy or the murder of Patrolman Tippett. He claimed that he was eating lunch at the time of the assassination, and that he then spoke with his foreman for five or ten minutes before going home. He denied that he owned a rifle, and when confronted in a subsequent interview with a picture showing him holding a rifle and pistol, he claimed that his face had been superimposed on someone else's body. He refused to answer any questions about the presence in his wallet of a selective service card with his picture and the name Alec J. Hiddell. During the questioning of Oswald on the third floor of the police department, more than 100 representatives of the press, radio, and television were crowded into the hallway through which Oswald had to pass when being taken from his cell to Captain Fritz's office for interrogation. Reporters tried to interview Oswald during these trips. Between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning, he appeared in this hallway at least 16 times. The generally confused conditions outside and inside Captain Fritz's office increased the difficulty of police questioning. Advised by the police that he could communicate with an attorney, Oswald made several telephone calls on Saturday in an effort to procure representation of his own choice, and discussed the matter with the president of the local bar association, who offered to obtain counsel. Oswald declined the offer, saying that he would first try to obtain counsel by himself. By Sunday morning he had not yet engaged an attorney. At 7.10 p.m. on November 22, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was formally advised that he had been charged with the murder of Patrolman J.D. Tippett. Several witnesses to the Tippett slaying and to the subsequent flight of the gunman had positively identified Oswald in police lineups. While positive firearm identification evidence was not available at the time, the revolver in Oswald's possession at the time of his arrest was of a type which could have fired the shots that killed Tippett. The formal charge against Oswald for the assassination of President Kennedy was lodged shortly after 1.30 a.m. on Saturday, November 23rd. By 10 p.m. on the day of the assassination, the FBI had traced the rifle found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository to a mail-order house in Chicago, which had purchased it from a distributor in New York. Approximately six hours later, the Chicago firm advised that this rifle had been ordered in March 1963 by an A. Hiddell for shipment to Post Office Box 2915 in Dallas, Texas, a box rented by Oswald. The payment for the rifle was remitted by a money order signed by A. Hiddell. By 6.45 p.m. on November 23rd, the FBI was able to advise the Dallas police that as a result of handwriting analysis of the documents used to purchase the rifle, it had concluded that the rifle had been ordered by Lee Harvey Oswald. Throughout Friday and Saturday, the Dallas police released to the public many of the details concerning the alleged evidence against Oswald, Police officials discussed important aspects of the case, usually in the course of impromptu and confused press conferences in the third-floor corridor. Some of the information divulged was erroneous. Efforts by the news media representatives to reconstruct the crime and promptly report details 
frequently led to erroneous and often conflicting reports. At the urgings of the newsmen, Chief of Police Jesse E. Curry brought Oswald to a press conference in the police assembly room shortly after midnight of the day Oswald was arrested. The assembly room was crowded with newsmen who had come to Dallas from all over the country. They shouted questions at Oswald and flashed cameras at him. Among this group was a 52-year-old Dallas nightclub operator, Jack Ruby. On Sunday morning, November 24th, arrangements were made for Oswald's transfer from the city jail to the Dallas County Jail about one mile away. The news media had been informed on Saturday night that the transfer of Oswald would not take place until after 10 a.m. on Sunday. Earlier on Sunday, between 2.30 and 3 a.m., anonymous telephone calls threatening Oswald's life had been received by the Dallas office of the FBI and by the office of the county sheriff. Nevertheless, on Sunday morning, television, radio, and newspaper representatives crowded into the basement to record the transfer. As viewed through television cameras, Oswald would emerge from a door in front of the cameras and proceed to the transfer vehicle. To the right of the cameras was a down ramp from Main Street on the north. To the left was an up ramp leading to Commerce Street on the south. The armored truck in which Oswald was to be transferred arrived shortly after 11 a.m. Police officials then decided, however, that an unmarked police car would be preferable for the trip because of its greater speed and maneuverability. At approximately 11.20 a.m., Oswald emerged from the basement jail office, flanked by detectives on either side and at his rear. He took a few steps toward the car and was in the glaring light of the television cameras when a man suddenly darted out from an area on the right of the cameras where newsmen had been assembled. The man was carrying a Colt thirty-eight revolver in his right hand, and while millions watched on television, he moved quickly to within a few feet of Oswald and fired one shot into Oswald's abdomen. Oswald groaned with pain as he fell to the ground and quickly lost consciousness. Within seven minutes, Oswald was at Parkland Hospital, where, without having regained consciousness, he was pronounced dead at 1.07 p.m. The man who killed Oswald was Jack Ruby. He was instantly arrested, and minutes later confined in a cell on the fifth floor of the Dallas police jail. Under interrogation, he denied that the killing of Oswald was in any way connected with a conspiracy involving the assassination of President Kennedy. He maintained that he had killed Oswald in a temporary fit of depression and rage over the president's death. Ruby was transferred the following day to the county jail, without notice to the press or to police officers not directly involved in the transfer. Indicted for the murder of Oswald by the state of Texas on November 26, 1963, Ruby was found guilty on March 14, 1964, and sentenced to death. As of September 1964, his case was pending on appeal. End of Section 2. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 3 of the Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, Chapter 1, Summary and Conclusions, Part 3. Conclusions This commission was created to ascertain the facts relating to the preceding summary of events and to consider the important questions which they raised. The commission has addressed itself to this task and has reached certain conclusions based on all the available evidence. No limitations have been placed on the commission's inquiry, it has conducted its own investigation, 
and all government agencies have fully discharged their responsibility to cooperate with the Commission in its investigation. These conclusions represent the reasoned judgment of all members of the Commission, and are presented after an investigation which has satisfied the Commission that it has ascertained the truth concerning the assassination of President Kennedy, to the extent that a prolonged and thorough search makes this possible. 1. The shots which killed President Kennedy and wounded Governor Connolly were fired from the sixth floor window at the southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository. This determination is based upon the following. A. Witnesses at the scene of the assassination saw a rifle being fired from the sixth floor window of the depository building, and some witnesses saw a rifle in the window immediately after the shots were fired. B. The nearly whole bullet found on Governor Connolly's stretcher at Parkland Memorial Hospital, and the two bullet fragments found in the front seat of the presidential limousine, were fired from the 6.5 mm Manlicher Carcano rifle found on the sixth floor of the depository building, to the exclusion of all other weapons. C. The three used cartridge cases found near the window on the sixth floor at the southeast corner of the building were fired from the same rifle which fired the above described bullet and fragments to the exclusion of all other weapons. D. The windshield in the presidential limousine was struck by a bullet fragment on the inside surface of the glass but was not penetrated. E. The nature of the bullet wounds suffered by President Kennedy and Governor Connolly, and the location of the car at the time of the shots, establish that the bullets were fired from above and behind the presidential limousine, striking the President and the Governor as follows. 1. President Kennedy was first struck by a bullet which entered at the back of his neck and exited through the lower front portion of his neck, causing a wound which would not necessarily have been lethal. The President was struck a second time by a bullet which entered the right rear portion of his head, causing a massive and fatal wound. 2. Governor Connolly was struck by a bullet which entered on the right side of his back and traveled downward through the right side of his chest, exiting below his right nipple, the bullet then passed through his right wrist and entered his left thigh, where it caused a superficial wound. F. There is no credible evidence that the shots were fired from the triple underpass ahead of the motorcade, or from any other location. 2. The weight of the evidence indicates that there were three shots fired. 3. Although it is not necessary to any essential findings of the Commission to determine just which shot hit Governor Connolly, there is very persuasive evidence from the experts to indicate that the same bullet which pierced the President's throat also caused Governor Connolly's wounds. However, Governor Connolly's testimony and certain other factors have given rise to some difference of opinion as to this probability. But there is no question in the mind of any member of the Commission that all the shots which caused the President's and Governor Connolly's wounds were fired from the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository. 4. The shots which killed President Kennedy and wounded Governor Connolly were fired by Lee Harvey Oswald. This conclusion is based upon the following. A. The Manlicher Carcano 6.5 mm Italian rifle from which the shots were fired was owned by and in the possession of Oswald. B. Oswald carried this rifle into the depository building on the morning of November 22, 1963. C. Oswald, at the time of the assassination, was present at the window from which the shots were fired. D. Shortly after the assassination, the Manlicher Carcano rifle belonging to Oswald was found partially hidden between some cartons on the sixth floor, and the improvised paper bag in which Oswald brought the rifle to the depository was found close by the window from which the shots were fired. E. Based on the testimony of experts and their analysis of films of the assassination, 
the commission has concluded that a rifleman of lee harvey oswald's capabilities could have fired the shots from the rifle used in the assassination within the elapsed time of the shooting the commission has concluded further that oswald possessed the capability with a rifle which enabled him to commit the assassination f oswald lied to the police after his arrest concerning important and substantive matters g oswald had attempted to kill major general edwin a walker retired u s army on april tenth nineteen sixty three thereby demonstrating his disposition to take human life five oswald killed dallas police patrolman j d tippett approximately forty five minutes after the assassination this conclusion upholds the finding that oswald fired the shots which killed president kennedy and wounded governor connolly and is supported by the following a two eyewitnesses saw the tippett shooting and seven eyewitnesses heard the shots and saw the gunman leave the scene with the revolver in hand. These nine eyewitnesses positively identified Lee Harvey Oswald as the man they saw. B. The cartridge cases found at the scene of the shooting were fired from the revolver in the possession of Oswald at the time of his arrest, to the exclusion of all other weapons. C. The revolver in Oswald's possession at the time of his arrest was purchased by and belonged to Oswald. D. Oswald's jacket was found along the path of flight taken by the gunman as he fled from the scene of the killing. 6. Within 80 minutes of the assassination and 35 minutes of the Tippett killing, Oswald resisted arrest at the theater by attempting to shoot another Dallas police officer. 7. The Commission has reached the following conclusions concerning Oswald's interrogation and detention by the Dallas police. a. Except for the force required to effect his arrest, Oswald was not subjected to any physical coercion by any law enforcement officials. He was advised that he could not be compelled to give any information, and that any statements made by him might be used against him in court. He was advised of his right to counsel, he was given the opportunity to obtain counsel of his own choice, and was offered legal assistance by the Dallas Bar Association, which he rejected at that time. b. Newspaper, radio, and television reporters were allowed uninhibited access to the area through which Oswald had to pass when he was moved from his cell to the interrogation room and other sections of the building thereby subjecting Oswald to harassment and creating chaotic conditions which were not conducive to orderly interrogation or the protection of the rights of the prisoner. c. The numerous statements, sometimes erroneous, made to the press by various local law enforcement officials during this period of confusion and disorder in the police station would have presented serious obstacles to the obtaining of a fair trial for Oswald to the extent that the information was erroneous or misleading it helped to create doubts speculations and fears in the mind of the public which might not otherwise have arisen eight the commission has reached the following conclusions concerning the killing of oswald by jack ruby on november twenty fourth nineteen sixty three a Ruby entered the basement of the Dallas Police Department shortly after 11.17 a.m. and killed Lee Harvey Oswald at 11.21 a.m. b. Although the evidence on Ruby's means of entry is not conclusive, the weight of the evidence indicates that he walked down the ramp leading from Main Street to the basement of the Police Department. c. There is no evidence to support the rumor that Ruby may have been assisted by any members of the Dallas Police Department in the killing of Oswald. d. The Dallas Police Department's decision to transfer Oswald to the county jail in full public view was unsound. The arrangements made by the Police Department on Sunday morning, only a few hours before this attempted transfer, were inadequate of critical importance was the fact that news media representatives and others were not excluded from the basement 
even after the police were notified of threats to Oswald's life. These deficiencies contributed to the death of Lee Harvey Oswald. 9. The Commission has found no evidence that either Lee Harvey Oswald or Jack Ruby was part of any conspiracy, domestic or foreign, to assassinate President Kennedy. The reasons for this conclusion are a. The Commission has found no evidence that anyone assisted Oswald in planning or carrying out the assassination. In this connection, it has thoroughly investigated, among other factors, the circumstances surrounding the planning of the motorcade route through Dallas, the hiring of Oswald by the Texas School Book Depository Company on October 15, 1963, the method by which the rifle was brought into the building, the placing of cartons of books at the window, Oswald's escape from the building, and the testimony of eyewitnesses to the shooting. B. The Commission has found no evidence that Oswald was involved with any person or group in a conspiracy to assassinate the President, although it has thoroughly investigated, in addition to other possible leads, all facets of Oswald's associations, finances, and personal habits, particularly during the period following his return from the Soviet Union in June 1962. C. The Commission has found no evidence to show that Oswald was employed, persuaded, or encouraged by any foreign government to assassinate President Kennedy, or that he was an agent of any foreign government, although the Commission has reviewed the circumstances surrounding Oswald's defection to the Soviet Union, his life there from October of 1959 to June of 1962, so far as it can be reconstructed, his known contacts with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, and his visits to the Cuban and Soviet embassies in Mexico City during his trip to Mexico from September 26 to October 3, 1963, and his known contacts with the Soviet embassy in the United States. D. The Commission has explored all attempts by Oswald to identify himself with various political groups, including the Communist Party USA, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, and the Socialist Workers' Party, and has been unable to find any evidence that the contacts which he initiated were related to Oswald's subsequent assassination of the President. E. All of the evidence before the Commission established that there was nothing to support the speculation that Oswald was an agent, employee, or informant of the FBI, the CIA, or any other governmental agency, it has thoroughly investigated Oswald's relationships prior to the assassination with all agencies of the U.S. government. All contacts with Oswald by any of these agencies were made in the regular exercise of their different responsibilities. F. No direct or indirect relationship between Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby has been discovered by the Commission nor has it been able to find any credible evidence that either knew the other, although a thorough investigation was made of the many rumors and speculations of such a relationship. G. The Commission has found no evidence that Jack Ruby acted with any other person in the killing of Lee Harvey Oswald. H. After careful investigation, the Commission has found no credible evidence either that Ruby and Officer Tippett, who was killed by Oswald, knew each other, or that Oswald and Tippett knew each other. Because of the difficulty of proving negatives to a certainty, the possibility of others being involved with either Oswald or Ruby cannot be established categorically, but if there is any such evidence, it has been beyond the reach of all the investigative agencies and resources of the United States, and has not come to the attention of this Commission. 10. In its entire investigation, the Commission has found no evidence of conspiracy, subversion, or disloyalty to the U.S. government by any federal, state, or local official. 11. On the basis of the evidence before the Commission, it concludes that Oswald acted alone. Therefore, to determine the motives for the assassination of President Kennedy, one must look to the assassin himself. 
Clues to Oswald's motives can be found in his family history, his education, or lack of it, his acts, his writings, and the recollections of those who had close contacts with him throughout his life. The Commission has presented with this report all of the background information bearing on motivation which it could discover. Thus, others may study Lee Oswald's life and arrive at their own conclusions as to his possible motives. The Commission could not make any definitive determination of Oswald's motives. It has endeavored to isolate factors which contributed to his character and which might have influenced his decision to assassinate President Kennedy. These factors were a. His deep-rooted resentment of all authority, which was expressed in a hostility toward every society in which he lived. b. His inability to enter into meaningful relationships with people, and a continuous pattern of rejecting his environment in favor of new surroundings. c. His urge to try to find a place in history, and despair at times over failures in his various undertakings. d. His capacity for violence, as evidenced by his attempt to kill General Walker. e. His avowed commitment to Marxism and Communism as he understood the terms and developed his own interpretation of them. This was expressed by his antagonism toward the United States, by his defection to the Soviet Union, by his failure to be reconciled with life in the United States, even after his disenchantment with the Soviet Union, and by his efforts, though frustrated, to go to Cuba. Each of these contributed to his capacity to risk all in cruel and irresponsible actions. 12. The Commission recognizes that the varied responsibilities of the President require that he make frequent trips to all parts of the United States and abroad. Consistent with their high responsibilities, Presidents can never be protected from every potential threat. The Secret Service's difficulty in meeting its protective responsibility varies with the activities and the nature of the occupant of the office of President, and his willingness to conform to plans for his safety. In appraising the performance of the Secret Service, it should be understood that it has to do its work within such limitations. Nevertheless, the Commission believes that recommendations for improvements in presidential protection are compelled by the facts disclosed in this investigation. A. The complexities of the presidency have increased so rapidly in recent years that the Secret Service has not been able to develop or to secure adequate resources of personnel and facilities to fulfill its important assignment. This situation should be promptly remedied. B. The Commission has concluded that the criteria and procedures of the Secret Service designed to identify and protect against persons considered threats to the President were not adequate prior to the assassination. 1. The Protective Research Section of the Secret Service, which is responsible for its preventive work, lacked sufficient trained personnel and the mechanical and technical assistance needed to fulfill its responsibility. 2. Prior to the assassination, the Secret Service's criteria dealt with direct threats against the President. Although the Secret Service treated these direct threats against the President adequately, it failed to recognize the necessity of identifying other potential sources of danger to his security. The Secret Service did not develop adequate and specific criteria defining those persons or groups who might represent a danger to the President. In effect, the Secret Service largely relied upon other federal or state agencies to supply the information necessary for it to fulfill its preventive responsibilities, although it did ask for information about direct threats to the President. C. The Commission has concluded that there was insufficient liaison and coordination of information between the Secret Service and other federal agencies necessarily concerned with presidential protection. Although the FBI, in the normal exercise of its responsibility, had secured considerable information about Lee Harvey Oswald, 
it had no official responsibility under the Secret Service criteria existing at the time of the President's trip to Dallas to refer to the Secret Service the information it had about Oswald. The Commission has concluded, however, that the FBI took an unduly restrictive view of its role in preventive intelligence work prior to the assassination. A more carefully coordinated treatment of the Oswald case by the FBI might very well have resulted in bringing Oswald's activities to the attention of the Secret Service. D. The Commission has concluded that some of the advance preparations in Dallas made by the Secret Service, such as the detailed security measures taken at Love Field and the Trade Mart, were thorough and well executed. In other respects, however, the Commission has concluded that the advance preparations for the President's trip were deficient. 1. Although the Secret Service is compelled to rely to a great extent on local law enforcement officials, its procedures at the time of the Dallas trip did not call for well-defined instructions as to the respective responsibilities of the police officials and others assisting in the protection of the President. 2. The procedures relied upon by the Secret Service for detecting the presence of an assassin located in a building along the motorcade route were inadequate. At the time of the trip to Dallas, the Secret Service, as a matter of practice, did not investigate or cause to be checked any building located along the motorcade route to be taken by the President. The responsibility for observing windows in these buildings during the motorcade was divided between local police personnel stationed on the streets to regulate the crowds and Secret Service agents riding in the motorcade. Based on its investigation, the Commission has concluded that the arrangements made during the trip to Dallas were clearly not sufficient. e. The configuration of the presidential car and the seating arrangements of the Secret Service agents in the car did not afford the Secret Service agents the opportunity they should have had to be of immediate assistance to the President at the first sign of danger. F. Within these limitations, however, the Commission finds that the agents most immediately responsible for the President's safety reacted promptly at the time the shots were fired from the Texas School Book Depository Building. Recommendations Prompted by the assassination of President Kennedy, the Secret Service has initiated a comprehensive and critical review of its total operations. As a result of studies conducted during the past several months, and in cooperation with this Commission, the Secret Service has prepared a planning document, dated August 27, 1964, which recommends various programs considered necessary by the service to improve its techniques and enlarge its resources. The Commission is encouraged by the efforts taken by the Secret Service since the assassination and suggests the following recommendations. 1. A committee of Cabinet members, including the Secretary of the Treasury and the Attorney General, or the National Security Council, should be assigned the responsibility of reviewing and overseeing the protective activities of the Secret Service and other federal agencies that assist in safeguarding the President. Once given this responsibility, such a committee would ensure that the maximum resources of the federal government are fully engaged in the task of protecting the President, and would provide guidance in defining the general nature of domestic and foreign dangers to presidential security. 2. Suggestions have been advanced to the Commission for the transfer of all or parts of the Presidential Protective Responsibilities of the Secret Service to some other department or agency. The Commission believes that if there is to be any determination of whether or not to relocate these responsibilities and functions, it ought to be made by the Executive and the Congress perhaps upon recommendations based on studies by the previously suggested committee. 3. Meanwhile, in order to improve daily supervision of the Secret Service within the Department of the Treasury, the Commission recommends that the Secretary of the Treasury appoint a special assistant with the responsibility of supervising the Secret Service. This special assistant should have sufficient stature and experience in law enforcement 
intelligence, and allied fields to provide effective continuing supervision and to keep the Secretary fully informed regarding the performance of the Secret Service. One of the initial assignments of this special assistant should be the supervision of the current effort by the Secret Service to revise and modernize its basic operating procedures. 4. The Commission recommends that the Secret Service completely overhaul its facilities devoted to the advanced detection of potential threats against the President. The Commission suggests the following measures. A. The Secret Service should develop as quickly as possible more useful and precise criteria defining those potential threats to the President which should be brought to its attention by other agencies. The criteria should, among other additions, provide for prompt notice to the Secret Service of all returned defectors. B. The Secret Service should expedite its current plans to utilize the most efficient data processing techniques. C. Once the Secret Service has formulated new criteria delineating the information it desires, it should enter into agreements with each federal agency to ensure its receipt of such information. 5. The Commission recommends that the Secret Service improve protective measures followed in the planning and conducting of presidential motorcades. In particular, the Secret Service should continue its current effort to increase the precautionary attention given to buildings along the motorcade route. 6. The Commission recommends that the Secret Service continue its recent efforts to improve and formalize its relationships with local police departments in areas to be visited by the President. 7. The Commission believes that when the new criteria and procedures are established, the Secret Service will not have sufficient personnel or adequate facilities. The Commission recommends that the Secret Service be provided with the personnel and resources which the Service and the Department of the Treasury may be able to demonstrate are needed to fulfill its important mission. 8. Even with an increase in Secret Service personnel, the protection of the President will continue to require the resources and cooperation of many Federal agencies. The Commission recommends that these agencies, specifically the FBI, continue the practice as it has developed, particularly since the assassination, of assisting the Secret Service upon request by providing personnel or other aid, and that there be a closer association and liaison between the Secret Service and all Federal agencies. 9. The Commission recommends that the President's physician always accompany him during his travels, and occupy a position near the President where he can be immediately available in case of any emergency. 10. The Commission recommends to Congress that it adopt legislation which would make the assassination of the President and Vice President a federal crime. A state of affairs where U.S. authorities have no clearly defined jurisdiction to investigate the assassination of a President is anomalous. 11. The Commission has examined the Department of State's handling of the Oswald matters and finds that it followed the law throughout. 12. However, the Commission believes that the Department, in accordance with its own regulations, should in all cases exercise great care in the return to this country of defectors who have evidenced disloyalty or hostility to this country, or who have expressed a desire to renounce their American citizenship and that when such persons are so returned, procedures should be adopted for the better dissemination of information concerning them to the intelligence agencies of the government. 13. The Commission recommends that representatives of the Bar, law enforcement associations, and the news media work together to establish ethical standards concerning the collection and presentation of information to the public so that there will be no interference with pending criminal investigations, court proceedings, or the right of individuals to a fair trial. End of Section 3. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 4 of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. 
the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 2. The Assassination, Part 1. This chapter describes President Kennedy's trip to Dallas, from its origin through its tragic conclusion. The narrative of these events is based largely on the recollections of the participants, although in many instances documentary or other evidence has also been used by the Commission. Beginning with the advance plans and Secret Service preparations for the trip, this chapter reviews the motorcade through Dallas, the fleeting moments of the assassination, the activities at Parkland Memorial Hospital, and the return of the presidential party to Washington, an evaluation of the procedures employed to safeguard the president, with recommendations for improving these procedures, appears in Chapter 8 of the report. Planning the Texas Trip President Kennedy's visit to Texas in November 1963 had been under consideration for almost a year before it occurred. He had made only a few brief visits to the state since the 1960 presidential campaign, and in 1962 he began to consider a formal visit. During 1963, the reasons for making the trip became more persuasive. As a political leader, the president wished to resolve the factional controversy within the Democratic Party in Texas before the election of 1964. The party itself saw an opportunity to raise funds by having the president speak at a political dinner eventually planned for Austin. As chief of state, the president always welcomed the opportunity to learn firsthand about the problems which concerned the American people. Moreover, he looked forward to the public appearances which he personally enjoyed. The basic decision on the November trip to Texas was made at a meeting of President Kennedy, Vice President Johnson and Governor Connolly on June 5, 1963, at the Cortez Hotel in El Paso, Texas. The President had spoken earlier that day at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and had stopped in El Paso to discuss the proposed visit and other matters with the Vice President and the Governor. The three agreed that the President would come to Texas in late November 1963. The original plan called for the president to spend only one day in the state, making whirlwind visits to Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Houston. In September, the White House decided to permit further visits by the president and extended the trip to run from the afternoon of November 21 through the evening of Friday, November 22. When Governor Connolly called at the White House on October 4 to discuss the details of the visit, it was agreed that the planning of events in Texas would be left largely to the governor. At the White House, Kenneth O'Donnell, special assistant to the president, acted as coordinator for the trip. Everyone agreed that if there was sufficient time, a motorcade through downtown Dallas would be the best way for the people to see their president. When the trip was planned for only one day, Governor Connolly had opposed the motorcade because there was not enough time. The governor stated, however, that, quote, once we got San Antonio moved from Friday to Thursday afternoon, where that was his initial stop in Texas, then we had the time, and I withdrew my objections to a motorcade, end quote. According to O'Donnell, quote, we had a motorcade wherever we went, end quote, particularly in large cities where the purpose was to let the president be seen by as many people as possible. In his experience, quote, it would be automatic, end quote, for the Secret Service to arrange a route which would, within the time allotted, bring the president, quote, through an area which exposes him to the greatest number of people, end quote. Advanced Preparations for the Dallas Trip Advanced preparations for President Kennedy's visit to Dallas were primarily the responsibility of two Secret Service agents, Special Agent Winston G. Lawson, a member of the White House Detail, who acted as the advance agent, and Forrest V. Sorrells, special agent in charge of the Dallas office. 
Both agents were advised of the trip on November 4. Lawson received a tentative schedule of the Texas trip on November 8 from Roy H. Kellerman, assistant special agent in charge of the White House detail, who was the Secret Service official responsible for the entire Texas journey. As advance agent working closely with Sorrells, Lawson had responsibility for arranging the timetable for the President's visit to Dallas and coordinating local activities with the White House staff, the organizations directly concerned with the visit, and local law enforcement officials. Lawson's most important responsibilities were to take preventive action against anyone in Dallas considered a threat to the President, to select the luncheon site and motorcade route, and to plan security measures for the luncheon and the motorcade. Preventive Intelligence Activities The Protective Research Section, PRS, of the Secret Service maintains records of people who have threatened the President or so conducted themselves as to be deemed a potential danger to him. On November 8, 1963, after undertaking the responsibility for advance preparations for the visit to Dallas, Agent Lawson went to the PRS offices in Washington. A check of the geographic indices there revealed no listing for any individual deemed to be a potential danger to the President in the territory of the Secret Service Regional Office, which includes Dallas and Fort Worth. To supplement the PRS files, the Secret Service depends largely on local police departments and local offices of other federal agencies, which advise it of potential threats immediately before the visit of the President to their community. Upon his arrival in Dallas on November 12, Lawson conferred with the local police and the local office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation about potential dangers to the President. Although there was no mention in PRS files of the demonstration in Dallas against Ambassador Adlai Stevenson on October 24, 1963, Lawson inquired about the incident and obtained through the local police photographs of some of the persons involved. On November 22, a Secret Service agent stood at the entrance to the Trade Mart, where the President was scheduled to speak, with copies of these photographs. Dallas detectives in the lobby of the Trade Mart and in the luncheon area also had copies of these photographs. A number of people who resembled some of those in the photographs were placed under surveillance at the Trade Mart. The FBI office in Dallas gave the local Secret Service representatives the name of a possibly dangerous individual in the Dallas area who was investigated. It also advised the Secret Service of the circulation on November 21 of a handbill sharply critical of President Kennedy, discussed in Chapter 6 of this report. Shortly before, the Dallas police had reported to the Secret Service that the handbill had appeared on the streets of Dallas. Neither the Dallas police nor the FBI had yet learned the source of the handbill. No one else was identified to the Secret Service through local inquiry as potentially dangerous, nor did PRS develop any additional information between November 12, when Lawson left Washington, and November 22. The adequacy of the intelligence system maintained by the Secret Service at the time of the assassination including a detailed description of the available data on Lee Harvey Oswald and the reasons why his name had not been furnished to the Secret Service, is discussed in Chapter 8. The Luncheon Site An important purpose of the President's visit to Dallas was to speak at a luncheon given by business and civic leaders. The White House staff informed the Secret Service that the President would arrive and depart from Dallas's Love Field, that a motorcade through the downtown area of Dallas to the luncheon site should be arranged, and that following the luncheon, the President would return to the airport by the most direct route. Accordingly, it was important to determine the luncheon site as quickly as possible so that security could be established at the site and the motorcade route selected. On November 4, Gerald A. Benn, agent in charge of the White House detail, asked Sorrells to examine three potential sites for the luncheon. One building, Market Hall, was unavailable for November 22. The second, 
the women's building at the state fairgrounds, was a one-story building with few entrances and easy to make secure, but it lacked necessary food handling facilities and had certain unattractive features, including a low ceiling with exposed conduits and beams. The third possibility, the trademark, a handsome new building with all the necessary facilities, presented security problems. It had numerous entrances, several tiers of balconies surrounding the central court where the luncheon would be held, and several catwalks crossing the court at each level. On November 4, Sorrells told Ben he believed security difficulties at the trademark could be overcome by special precautions. Lawson also evaluated the security hazards at the trademark on November 13. Kenneth O'Donnell made the final decision to hold the luncheon at the trademark. Ben so notified Lawson on November 14. Once the trademark had been selected, Sorrells and Lawson worked out detailed arrangements for security at the building. In addition to the preventive measures already mentioned, they provided for controlling access to the building, closing off and policing areas around it, securing the roof, and ensuring the presence of numerous police officers inside and around the building. Ultimately, more than 200 law enforcement officers, mainly Dallas police, but including eight Secret Service agents, were deployed in and around the trademark. The Motorcade Route On November 8, when Lawson was briefed on the itinerary for the trip to Dallas, he was told that 45 minutes had been allotted for a motorcade procession from Love Field to the luncheon site. Lawson was not specifically instructed to select the parade route, but he understood that this was one of his functions. Even before the trademark had been definitely selected, Lawson and Sorrells began to consider the best motorcade route from Love Field to the trademark. On November 14, Lawson and Sorrells attended a meeting at Love Field, and on their return to Dallas, drove over the route which Sorrells believed best suited for the proposed motorcade. This route, eventually selected for the motorcade from the airport to the trademark, measured 10 miles and could be driven easily within the allotted 45 minutes. From Love Field, the route passed through a portion of suburban Dallas, through the downtown area along Main Street, and then to the trademark via Stemmons Freeway. For the president's return to Love Field following the luncheon, the agents selected the most direct route, which was approximately four miles. After the selection of the trademark as the luncheon site, Lawson and Sorrells met with Dallas Chief of Police Jesse E. Curry, Assistant Chief Charles Batchelor, Deputy Chief N.T. Fisher, and several other command officers to discuss details of the motorcade and possible routes. The route was further reviewed by Lawson and Sorrells, with Assistant Chief Batchelor, and members of the local host committee on November 15. The police officials agreed that the route recommended by Sorrells was the proper one and did not express a belief that any other route might be better. On November 18, Sorrells and Lawson drove over the selected route with Bachelor and other police officers, verifying that it could be traversed within 45 minutes. Representatives of the local host committee and the White House staff were advised by the Secret Service of the actual route on the afternoon of November 18. The route impressed the agents as a natural and desirable one. Sorrells, who had participated in presidential protection assignments in Dallas since a visit by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1936, as testified that the traditional parade route in Dallas was along Main Street, since the tall buildings along the street gave more people an opportunity to participate. The route chosen from the airport to Main Street was the normal one, except where Harwood Street was selected as the means of access to Main Street, in preference to a short stretch of the Central Expressway, which presented a minor safety hazard and could not accommodate spectators as conveniently as Harwood Street. According to Lawson, the chosen route seemed to be the best. It afforded us wide streets most of the way because of the buses that were in the motorcade. 
it afforded us a chance to have alternative routes if something happened on the motorcade route it was the type of suburban area a good part of the way where the crowds would be able to be controlled for a great distance and we figured that the largest crowds would be downtown which they were and that the wide streets that we would use downtown would be of sufficient width to keep the public out of our way elm street parallel to main street and one block north was not used for the main portion of the downtown part of the motorcade because Main Street offered better vantage points for spectators. To reach the trademark from Main Street, the agents decided to use the Stemmons Freeway, Route number 77, the most direct route. The only practical way for westbound traffic on Main Street to reach the northbound lanes of the Stemmons Freeway is via Elm Street, which Route number 77 traffic is instructed to follow in this part of the city. Elm Street was to be reached from Maine by turning right at Houston, going one block north and then turning left onto Elm. On this last portion of the journey, only five minutes from the trademark, the President's motorcade would pass the Texas School Book Depository building on the northwest corner of Houston and Elm Streets. The building overlooks Dealey Plaza, an attractively landscaped triangle of three acres. From Houston Street, which forms the base of the triangle, three streets, Commerce, Main, and Elm, trisect the plaza, converging at the apex of the triangle to form a triple underpass beneath a multiple railroad bridge almost 500 feet from Houston Street. Elm Street, the northernmost of the three, after intersecting Houston, curves in a southwesterly arc through the underpass and leads into an access road which branches off to the right and is used by traffic going to the Stemmons Freeway and the Dallas-Fort Worth Turnpike. The Elm Street approach to the Stemmons Freeway is necessary in order to avoid the traffic hazards which would otherwise exist if right turns were permitted from both Main and Elm into the freeway. To create this traffic pattern, a concrete barrier between Main and Elm Streets presents an obstacle to a right turn from Main across Elm to the access road to Stemmons Freeway and the Dallas-Fort Worth Turnpike. This concrete barrier extends far enough beyond the access road to make it impracticable for vehicles to turn right from Main directly to the access road. A sign located on this barrier instructs Main Street traffic not to make any turns. In conformity with these arrangements, traffic proceeding west on Main is directed to turn right at Houston in order to reach the Dallas-Fort Worth Turnpike, which has the same access road from Elm Street as does the Stemmons Freeway. The planning for the motorcade also included advanced preparations for security arrangements along the route. Sorrells and Lawson reviewed the route in cooperation with Assistant Chief Bachelor and other Dallas police officials who took notes on the requirements for controlling the crowds and traffic, watching the overpasses, and providing motorcycle escort. To control traffic, arrangements were made for the deployment of foot patrolmen and motorcycle police at various positions along the route. Police were assigned to each overpass on the route and instructed to keep them clear of unauthorized persons. No arrangements were made for police or building custodians to inspect buildings along the motorcade route since the Secret Service did not normally request or make such a check. Under standard procedures, the responsibility for watching the windows of buildings was shared by local police stationed along the route and Secret Service agents riding in the motorcade. As the date for the President's visit approached, the two Dallas newspapers carried several reports of his motorcade route. The selection of the trademark as the possible site for the luncheon first appeared in the Dallas Times-Herald on November 15, 1963. The following day, the newspaper reported that the presidential party, quote, apparently will loop through the downtown area, probably on Main Street, en route from Dallas Love Field, end quote, on its way to the trademark. On November 19, the Times-Herald afternoon paper detailed the precise route. From the airport, the president's party will proceed to Mockingbird Lane, to Lemon, and then to Turtle Creek, 
turning south to Cedar Springs. The motorcade will then pass through downtown on Harwood, and then west on Main, turning back to Elm at Houston, and then out Stemmons Freeway to the Trademark. Also on November 19, the Morning News reported that the President's motorcade would travel from Love Field along specified streets, then Harwood to Maine, Maine to Houston, Houston to Elm, Elm under the triple underpass to Stemmons Freeway, and on to the Trademark. On November 20, a front-page story reported that the streets on which the presidential motorcade would travel included Maine and Stemmons Freeway. On the morning of the president's arrival, the morning news noted that the motorcade would travel through downtown Dallas onto the Stemmons Freeway and reported that, quote, the motorcade will move slowly so that crowds can get a good view of President Kennedy and his wife. End quote. Dallas before the visit. The president's intention to pay a visit to Texas in the fall of 1963 aroused interest throughout the state. The two Dallas newspapers provided their readers with a steady stream of information and speculation about the trip, beginning on September 13 when the Times-Herald announced, in a front-page article, that President Kennedy was planning a brief one-day tour of four Texas cities, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Houston. Both Dallas papers cited White House sources on September 26 as confirming the president's intention to visit Texas on November 21 and 22, with Dallas scheduled as one of the stops. Articles, editorials, and letters to the editor in the Dallas Morning News and the Dallas Times-Herald after September 13 reflected the feeling in the community toward the forthcoming presidential visit. Although there were critical editorials and letters to the editors, the news stories reflected the desire of Dallas officials to welcome the president with dignity and courtesy. An editorial in the Times-Herald of September 17 called on the people of Dallas to be congenial hosts, even though Dallas didn't vote for Mr. Kennedy in 1960, may not endorse him in 64. On October 3, the Dallas Morning News quoted U.S. Representative Joe Poole's hope that President Kennedy would receive a good welcome and would not face demonstrations like those encountered by Vice President Johnson during the 1960 campaign. Increased concern about the President's visit was aroused by the incident involving the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai E. Stevenson. On the evening of October 24, 1963, after addressing a meeting in Dallas, Stevenson was jeered, jostled, and spat upon by hostile demonstrators outside the Dallas Memorial Auditorium Theater. The local, national, and international reaction to this incident evoked from Dallas officials and newspapers strong condemnations of the demonstrators. Mayor Earl Cabell called on the city to redeem itself during President Kennedy's visit. He asserted that Dallas had shed its reputation of the 20s as the, quote, Southwest hate capital of Dixie, end quote. On October 26, the press reported Chief of Police Curry's plans to call in 100 extra off-duty officers to help protect President Kennedy. Any thought that the president might cancel his visit to Dallas was ended when Governor Connolly confirmed on November 8 that the president would come to Texas on November 21 and 22 and that he would visit San Antonio, Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas, and Austin. During November, the Dallas papers reported frequently on the plans for protecting the president, stressing the thoroughness of the preparations. They conveyed the pleas of Dallas leaders that citizens not demonstrate or create disturbances during the president's visit. On November 18, the Dallas City Council adopted a new city ordinance prohibiting interference with attendance at lawful assemblies. Two days before the president's arrival, Chief Curry warned that the Dallas police would not permit improper conduct during the president's visit. Meanwhile, on November 17, the president of the Dallas Chamber of Commerce referred to the city's reputation for being the friendliest town in America 
and asserted that citizens would, quote, greet the President of the United States with the warmth and pride that keep the Dallas spirit famous the world over, end quote. Two days later, a local Republican leader called for a civilized, nonpartisan welcome for President Kennedy, stating that, in many respects, Dallas County has isolated itself from the mainstream of life in the world in this decade. Another reaction to the impending visit, hostile to the president, came to a head shortly before his arrival. On November 21, there appeared on the streets of Dallas the anonymous handbill mentioned above. It was fashioned after the wanted circulars issued by law enforcement agencies. Beneath two photographs of President Kennedy, one full face and one profile, appeared the caption, quote, wanted for treason, end quote, followed by a scurrilous bill of particulars that constituted a vilification of the president. And on the morning of the president's arrival, there appeared in the morning news a full black-bordered advertisement headed, Welcome, Mr. Kennedy, to Dallas, sponsored by the American Fact-Finding Committee, which the sponsor later testified was an ad hoc committee, quote, formed strictly for the purpose of having a name to put in the paper, end quote. The welcome consisted of a series of statements and questions critical of the president and his administration. End of section four. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section five of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 2, The Assassination, Part 2. Visits to Other Texas Cities The trip to Texas began with the departure of President and Mrs. Kennedy from the White House by helicopter at 10.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on November 21, 1963, for Andrews Air Force Base. They took off in the presidential plane, Air Force One, at 11 a.m., arriving at San Antonio at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They were greeted by Vice President Johnson and Governor Connolly, who joined the presidential party in a motorcade through San Antonio. During the afternoon, President Kennedy dedicated the U.S. Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine at Brooks Air Force Base. Late in the afternoon, he flew to Houston, where he rode through the city in a motorcade, spoke at the Rice University Stadium, and attended a dinner in honor of U.S. Representative Albert Thomas. At Rice Stadium, a very large enthusiastic crowd greeted the president. In Houston, as elsewhere during the trip, the crowds showed much interest in Mrs. Kennedy. David F. Powers of the president's staff later stated that when the president asked for his assessment of the day's activities, Powers replied, quote, that the crowd was about the same as the one which came to see him before, but there were 100,000 extra people on hand who came to see Mrs. Kennedy. End quote. Late in the evening, the presidential party flew to Fort Worth, where they spent the night at the Texas Hotel. On the morning of November 22, President Kennedy attended a breakfast at the hotel and afterward addressed a crowd at an open parking lot. The president liked outdoor appearances because more people could see and hear him. Before leaving the hotel, the president, Mrs. Kennedy, and Kenneth O'Donnell talked about the risks inherent in presidential public appearances. According to O'Donnell, the president commented that, quote, if anybody really wanted to shoot the president of the United States, it was not a very difficult job. All one had to do was get a high building some day with a telescopic rifle, and there was nothing anybody could do to defend against such an attempt. End quote. Upon concluding the conversation, 
the president prepared to depart for Dallas. Arrival at Love Field In Dallas, the rain had stopped, and by mid-morning a gloomy overcast sky had given way to the bright sunshine that greeted the presidential party when Air Force One touched down at Love Field at 11.40 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Governor and Mrs. Connolly and Senator Ralph W. Yarborough had come with the president from Fort Worth. Vice President Johnson's airplane, Air Force Two, had arrived at Love Field at approximately 11.35 a.m., and the vice president and Mrs. Johnson were in the receiving line to greet President and Mrs. Kennedy. After a welcome from the Dallas Reception Committee, President and Mrs. Kennedy walked along a chain-link fence at the reception area, greeting a large crowd of spectators that had gathered behind it. Secret Service agents formed a cordon to keep the press and photographers from impeding their passage, and scanned the crowd for threatening movements. Dallas police stood at intervals along the fence, and Dallas plainclothesmen mixed in the crowd. Vice President and Mrs. Johnson followed along the fence, guarded by four members of the vice presidential detail. Approximately ten minutes after the arrival at Love Field, the President and Mrs. Kennedy went to the presidential automobile to begin the motorcade. Organization of the Motorcade Secret Service arrangements for presidential trips, which were followed in the Dallas motorcade, are designed to provide protection while permitting large numbers of people to see the president. Every effort is made to prevent unscheduled stops, although the president may, and in Dallas did, order stops in order to greet the public. When the motorcade slows or stops, agents take positions between the president and the crowd. The order of vehicles in the Dallas motorcade was as follows. Motorcycles. Dallas police motorcycles preceded the pilot car. The pilot car. Manned by officers of the Dallas Police Department, this automobile preceded the main party by approximately quarter of a mile. Its function was to alert police along the route that the motorcade was approaching and to check for signs of trouble. Motorcycles. Next came four to six motorcycle policemen whose main purpose was to keep the crowd back. The lead car. Described as a rolling command car, this was an unmarked Dallas police car driven by Chief of Police Curry and occupied by Secret Service agents Sorrells and Lawson and by Dallas County Sheriff J. E. Decker. The occupants scanned the crowd and the buildings along the route. Their main function was to spot trouble in advance and to direct any necessary steps to meet the trouble. Following normal practice, the lead automobile stayed approximately four to five car lengths ahead of the president's limousine. The presidential limousine. The president's automobile was specially designed 1961 Lincoln convertible with two collapsible jump seats between the front and rear seats. It was outfitted with a clear plastic bubble top, which was neither bulletproof nor bullet resistant. Because the skies had cleared in Dallas, Lawson directed that the top not be used for the day's activities. He acted on instructions he had received earlier from Assistant Special Agent in Charge Roy H. Kellerman, who was in Fort Worth with the President. Kellerman had discussed the matter with O'Donnell, whose instructions were, quote, If the weather is clear and it is not raining, have that bubble top off, end quote. Elevated approximately 15 inches above the back of the front seat was a metallic frame with four handholds that riders in the car could grip while standing in the rear seat during parades. At the rear, on each side of the automobile, were small running boards, each designed to hold a Secret Service agent, with a metallic handle for the rider to grasp. The President had frequently stated that he did not want agents to ride on these steps during a motorcade except when necessary. 
He had repeated this wish only a few days before, during his visit to Tampa, Florida. President Kennedy rode on the right-hand side of the rear seat, with Mrs. Kennedy on his left. Governor Connolly occupied the right jump seat, Mrs. Connolly the left. Driving the presidential limousine was Special Agent William R. Greer of the Secret Service. On his right sat Kellerman. Kellerman's responsibilities included maintaining radio communications with the lead and follow-up cars, scanning the route, and getting out and standing near the president when the cars stopped. Motorcycles. Four motorcycles, two on each side, flanked the rear of the presidential car. They provided some cover for the president, but their main purpose was to keep back the crowd. On previous occasions, the president had requested that, to the extent possible, these flanking motorcycles keep back from the sides of his car. Presidential follow-up car. This vehicle, a 1955 Cadillac eight-passenger convertible, especially outfitted for the Secret Service, followed closely behind the president's automobile. It carried eight Secret Service agents, two in the front seat, two in the rear, and two on each of the right and left running boards. Each agent carried a 38 caliber pistol, and a shotgun and automatic rifle were also available. Presidential assistants David F. Powers and Kenneth O'Donnell sat in the right and left jump seats, respectively. The agents in this car, under established procedure, had instructions to watch the route for signs of trouble, scanning not only the crowds but the windows and roofs of the buildings, overpasses, and crossings. They were instructed to watch particularly for thrown objects, sudden actions in the crowd, and any movements toward the presidential car. The agents on the front of the running boards had directions to move immediately to positions just to the rear of the president and Mrs. Kennedy when the president's car slowed to a walking pace or stopped, or when the press of the crowd made it impossible for the escort motorcycles to stay in position on the car's rear flanks. The two agents on the rear of the running boards were to advance toward the front of the president's car whenever it stopped or slowed down sufficiently for them to do so. Vice Presidential Car The vice presidential automobile, a four-door Lincoln convertible obtained locally for use in the motorcade, proceeded approximately two to three car lengths behind the president's follow-up car. This distance was maintained so that spectators would normally turn their gaze from the president's automobile by the time the vice president came into view. Vice President Johnson sat on the right-hand side of the rear seat, Mrs. Johnson in the center, and Senator Yarborough on the left. Rufus W. Youngblood, special agent in charge of the vice president's detail, occupied the right-hand side of the front seat, and Herschel Jacks of the Texas State Highway Patrol was the driver. Vice Presidential Follow-Up Car Driven by an officer of the Dallas Police Department, this vehicle was occupied by three Secret Service agents and Clifton C. Garter, assistant to the Vice President. These agents performed for the Vice President the same functions that the agents in the Presidential Follow-Up Car performed for the President. Remainder of Motorcade The remainder of the motorcade consisted of five cars for other dignitaries, including the mayor of Dallas and Texas congressmen, telephone and Western Union vehicles, a White House communications car, three cars for press photographers, an official party bus for White House staff members and others, and two press buses. Admiral George G. Berkeley, physician to the president, was in a car following those, quote, containing the local and national representatives, end quote. Police car and motorcycles. A Dallas police car and several motorcycles at the rear kept the motorcade together and prevented unauthorized vehicles from joining the motorcade. Communications in the motorcade. A base station at a fixed location in Dallas 
operated a radio network which linked together the lead car, presidential car, presidential follow-up car, White House communications car, trademarked, love field, and the presidential and vice presidential airplanes. The vice presidential car and vice presidential follow-up car used portable sets with a separate frequency for their own car-to-car -car communication. The drive through Dallas the motorcade left Love Field shortly after 11.50 a.m. and drove at speeds up to 25 to 30 miles an hour through thinly populated areas on the outskirts of Dallas. At the President's direction, his automobile stopped twice, the first time to permit him to respond to a sign asking him to shake hands. During this brief stop, Agents in the front positions on the running boards of the presidential follow-up car came forward and stood beside the president's car, looking out toward the crowd, and Special Agent Kellerman assumed his position next to the car. On the other occasion, the president halted the motorcade to speak to a Catholic nun and a group of small children. In the downtown area, large crowds of spectators gave the president a tremendous reception. The crowds were so dense that Special Agent Clinton J. Hill had to leave the left front running board of the President's follow-up car four times to ride on the rear of the President's limousine. Several times, Special Agent John D. Reddy came forward from the right front running board of the presidential follow-up car to the right side of the President's car. Special Agent Glenn A. Bennett once left his place inside the follow-up car to help keep the crowd away from the president's car. When a teenage boy ran toward the rear of the president's car, Reddy left the running board to chase the boy back into the crowd. On several occasions when the vice president's car was slowed down by the throng, Special Agent Youngblood stepped out to hold the crowd back. According to plan, the president's motorcade proceeded west through downtown Dallas on Main Street to the intersection of Houston Street, which marks the beginning of Dealey Plaza. From Main Street, the motorcade turned right and went north on Houston Street, passing tall buildings on the right and headed toward the Texas School Book Depository Building. The spectators were still thickly congregated in front of the buildings which lined the east side of Houston Street, but the crowd thinned abruptly along Elm Street, which curves in a southwesterly direction as it proceeds downgrade toward the Triple Underpass and the Stemmons Freeway. As the motorcade approached the intersection of Houston and Elm Streets, there was general gratification in the presidential party about the enthusiastic reception. Evaluating the political overtones, Kenneth O'Donnell was especially pleased because it convinced him that the average Dallas resident was like other American citizens in respecting and admiring the president. Mrs. Connolly, elated by the reception, turned to President Kennedy and said, quote, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. End quote. The president replied, That is very obvious. The assassination. At 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as the President's open limousine proceeded at approximately 11 miles per hour along Elm Street toward the Triple Underpass, shots fired from a rifle mortally wounded President Kennedy and seriously injured Governor Connolly. One bullet passed through the President's neck. A subsequent bullet, which was lethal, shattered the right side of his skull. Governor Connolly sustained bullet wounds in his back, the right side of his chest, right wrist, and left thigh. The time. The exact time of the assassination was fixed by the testimony of four witnesses. Special Agent Rufus W. Youngblood observed that the large electric sign clock atop the Texas School Book Depository building showed the numerals 1230 as the vice presidential automobile proceeded north on Houston Street a few seconds before the shots were fired. 
Just prior to the shooting, David F. Powers, riding in the Secret Service follow-up car, remarked to Kenneth O'Donnell that it was 12.30 p.m., the time they were due at the trademark. Seconds after the shooting, Roy Kellerman, riding in the front seat of the presidential limousine, looked at his watch and said, 12.30, to the driver, Special Agent Greer. The Dallas police radio log reflects that Chief of Police Curry reported the shooting of the president and issued his initial orders at 12.30 p.m. Speed of the Limousine William Greer, operator of the presidential limousine, estimated the car's speed at the time of the first shot as 12 to 15 miles per hour. Other witnesses in the motorcade estimated the speed of the president's limousine from 7 to 22 miles per hour. A more precise determination has been made from motion pictures taken on the scene by an amateur photographer, Abraham Zapruder. Based on these films, the speed of the president's automobile is computed at an average speed of 11.2 miles per hour. The car maintained this average speed over a distance of approximately 186 feet immediately preceding the shot which struck the president in the head. While the car traveled this distance, the Zapruder camera ran 152 frames. Since the camera operates at a speed of 18.3 frames per second, it was calculated that the car required 8.3 seconds to cover the 136 feet. This represents a speed of 11.2 miles per hour. In the presidential limousine. Mrs. John F. Kennedy, on the left of the rear seat of the limousine, looked toward her left and waved to the crowds along the route. Soon after the motorcade turned onto Elm Street, she heard a sound similar to a motorcycle noise and a cry from Governor Connolly, which caused her to look to her right. On turning, she saw a quizzical look on her husband's face as he raised his left hand to his throat. Mrs. Kennedy then heard a second shot and saw the president's skull torn open under the impact of the bullet. As she cradled her mortally wounded husband, Mrs. Kennedy cried, quote, Oh my God, they have shot my husband. I love you, Jack. End quote. Governor Connolly testified that he recognized the first noise as a rifle shot, and the thought immediately crossed his mind that it was an assassination attempt. From his position in the right jump seat immediately in front of the president, he instinctively turned to his right because the shot appeared to come from over his right shoulder. Unable to see the president as he turned to the right, the governor started to look back over his left shoulder, but he never completed the turn because he felt something strike him in the back. In his testimony before the commission, Governor Connolly was certain that he was hit by the second shot, which he stated he did not hear. Mrs. Connolly, too, heard a frightening noise from her right. Looking over her right shoulder, she saw that the president had both hands at his neck, but she observed no blood and heard nothing. She watched as he slumped down with an empty expression on his face. Roy Kellerman, in the right front seat of the limousine, heard a report like a firecracker pop. Turning to his right in the direction of the noise, Kellerman heard the president say, My God, I am hit, and saw both of the president's hands move up toward his neck. As he told the driver, quote, Let's get out of here, we are hit, end quote, Kellerman grabbed his microphone and radioed ahead to the lead car, quote, We are hit. Get us to the hospital immediately, end quote. The driver, William Greer, heard a noise which he took to be a backfire from one of the motorcycles flanking the presidential car. When he heard the same noise again, Greer glanced over his shoulder and saw Governor Connolly fall. At the sound of the second shot, he realized that something was wrong, and he pressed down on the accelerator as Kellerman said, 
quote, get out of here fast, end quote. As he issued his instructions to Greer and to the lead car, Kellerman heard a flurry of shots within five seconds of the first noise. According to Kellerman, Mrs. Kennedy then cried out, quote, What are they doing to you? End quote. Looking back from the front seat, Kellerman saw Governor Connolly in his wife's lap and Special Agent Clinton J. Hill lying across the trunk of the car. Mrs. Connolly heard a second shot fired and pulled her husband down into her lap. Observing his blood-covered chest as he was pulled into his wife's lap, Governor Connolly believed himself mortally wounded. He cried out, quote, Oh, no, no, no. My God, they are going to kill us all. End quote. At first, Mrs. Connolly thought that her husband had been killed, but then she noticed an almost imperceptible movement and knew that he was still alive. She said, quote, It's all right, be still. End quote. The governor was lying with his head on his wife's lap when he heard a shot hit the president. At that point, both Governor and Mrs. Connolly observed brain tissue splattered over the interior of the car. According to Governor and Mrs. Connolly, it was after this shot that Kellerman issued his emergency instructions and the car accelerated. Reaction by Secret Service Agents From the left front running board of the President's follow-up car, Special Agent Hill was scanning the few people standing on the south side of Elm Street after the motorcade had turned off Houston Street. He estimated that the motorcade had slowed down to approximately 9 or 10 miles per hour on the turn at the intersection of Houston and Elm Streets, and then proceeded at a rate of 12 to 15 miles per hour, with the follow-up car trailing the President's automobile by approximately 5 feet. Hill heard a noise which seemed to be a firecracker coming from his right rear. He immediately looked to his right, quote, and in so doing my eyes had to cross the presidential limousine and I saw President Kennedy grab at himself and lurch forward and to the left, end quote. Hill jumped from the follow-up car and ran to the president's automobile. At about the time he reached the president's automobile, Hill heard a second shot, approximately five seconds after the first, which removed a portion of the president's head. At the instant that Hill stepped onto the left rear step of the president's automobile and grasped the handhold, the car lurched forward, causing him to lose his footing. He ran three or four steps, regained his position, and mounted the car. Between the time he originally seized the handhold and the time he mounted the car, Hill recalled, quote, Mrs. Kennedy had jumped up from the seat and was, it appeared to me, reaching for something coming off the right rear bumper of the car, the right rear tail, when she noticed that I was trying to climb on the car. She turned toward me, and I grabbed her and put her back in the back seat, crawled up on top of the back seat, and lay there. End quote. David Powers, who witnessed the scene from the president's follow-up car, stated that Mrs. Kennedy would probably have fallen off the rear end of the car and been killed if Hill had not pushed her back into the presidential automobile. Mrs. Kennedy had no recollection of climbing onto the back of the car. Special Agent Reddy, on the right front running board of the presidential follow-up car, heard noises that sounded like firecrackers, and ran toward the president's limousine. But he was immediately called back by Special Agent Emery P. Roberts, in charge of the follow-up car, who did not believe that he could reach the president's car at the speed it was then traveling. Special Agent George W. Hickey, Jr., in the rear seat of the presidential follow-up car, picked up and cocked an automatic rifle as he heard the last shot. At this point, the cars were speeding through the underpass and had left the scene of the shooting, but Hickey kept the automatic weapon ready as the car raced to the hospital. 
Most of the other Secret Service agents in the motorcade had drawn their sidearms. Roberts noticed that the vice president's car was approximately one half block behind the presidential follow up car at the time of the shooting and signaled for it to move in closer. Directing the security detail for the vice president from the right front seat of the vice presidential car, Special Agent Youngblood recalled, quote, As we were beginning to go down this incline, all of a sudden there was an explosive noise. I quickly observed unnatural movement of crowds like ducking or scattering, and quick movements in the presidential follow-up car. So I turned around and hit the vice president on the shoulder and hollered, Get down! and then looked around again and saw more of this movement, and so I proceeded to go to the back seat and get on top of him. End quote. Youngblood was not positive that he was in the rear seat before the second shot, but thought it probable because of President Johnson's statement to that effect immediately after the assassination. President Johnson emphasized Youngblood's instantaneous reaction after the first shot. Quote, I was startled by the sharp report or explosion, but I had no time to speculate as to its origin, because Agent Youngblood turned in a flash immediately after the first explosion, hitting me on the shoulder, and shouted to all of us in the back seat to get down. I was pushed down by Agent Youngblood. Almost in the same moment in which he hit or pushed me, he vaulted over the back seat and sat on me. I was bent over under the weight of Agent Youngblood's body toward Mrs. Johnson and Senator Yarborough. End quote. Clifton C. Carter, riding in the vice president's follow-up car a short distance behind, reported that Youngblood was in the rear seat using his body to shield the vice president before the second and third shots were fired. Other Secret Service agents assigned to the motorcade remained at their posts during the race to the hospital. None stayed at the scene of the shooting, and none entered the Texas School Book Depository Building at or immediately after the shooting. Secret Service procedure requires that each agent stay with the person being protected and not be diverted unless it is necessary to accomplish the protective assignment. Forrest V. Sorrells, special agent in charge of the Dallas office, was the first Secret Service agent to return to the scene of the assassination approximately 20 or 25 minutes after the shots were fired. End of Section 5 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 6 of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 2. The Assassination. Part 3. Parkland Memorial Hospital. The Race to the Hospital. In the final instant of the assassination, the presidential motorcade began a race to Parkland Memorial Hospital, approximately four miles from the Texas School Book Depository Building. On receipt of the radio message from Kellerman to the lead car, that the president had been hit. Chief of Police Curry and police motorcyclists at the head of the motorcade led the way to the hospital. Meanwhile, Chief Curry ordered the police base station to notify Parkland Hospital that the wounded president was en route. The radio log of the Dallas Police Department shows that at 12.30 p.m. on November 22, Chief Curry radioed, quote, go to the hospital, Parkland Hospital. Have them stand by. End quote. A moment later, Curry added, quote, Looks like the president has been hit. Have Parkland stand by. End quote. The base station replied, quote, They have been notified. End quote. 
traveling at speeds estimated at times to be up to 70 or 80 miles per hour down the Stemmons Freeway and Harry Hines Boulevard, the presidential limousine arrived at the emergency entrance of the Parkland Hospital at about 12.35 p.m. Arriving almost simultaneously were the president's follow-up car, the vice president's automobile, and the vice president's follow-up car. Admiral Berkeley, the president's physician, arrived at the hospital, quote, between three and five minutes following the arrival of the president, end quote, since the riders in his car, quote, were not exactly aware what had happened, end quote, and the car went on to the trademark first. When Parkland Hospital received the notification, the staff in the emergency area was alerted and trauma rooms one and two were prepared. These rooms were for the emergency treatment of acutely ill or injured patients. Although the first message mentioned an injury only to President Kennedy, two rooms were prepared. As the President's limousine sped toward the hospital, 12 doctors to the emergency area, surgeons Drs. Malcolm O. Perry, Charles R. Baxter, Robert N. McClelland, Ronald C. Jones, the chief neurologist, Dr. William Kemp Clark, Four anesthesiologists, Drs. Marion T. Jenkins, Adolph H. Gesek, Jr., Jackie H. Hunt, Jean C. Aiken, urological surgeon, Dr. Paul C. Peters, an oral surgeon, Dr. Don T. Curtis, and a heart specialist, Dr. Fouad A. Bashur. Upon arriving at Parkland Hospital, Lawson jumped from the lead car and rushed into the emergency entrance, where he was met by hospital staff members wheeling stretchers out to the automobile. Special Agent Hill removed his suit jacket and covered the president's head and upper chest to prevent the taking of photographs. Governor Connolly, who had lost consciousness on the ride to the hospital, regained consciousness when the limousine stopped abruptly at the emergency entrance. Despite his serious wounds, Governor Connolly tried to get out of the way so that medical help could reach the president. Although he was reclining in his wife's arms, he lurched forward in an effort to stand upright and get out of the car, but he collapsed again. Then he experienced his first sensation of pain, which became excruciating. The governor was lifted onto a stretcher and taken into trauma room two. For a moment, Mrs. Kennedy refused to release the president whom she held in her lap, but then Kellerman, Greer, and Lawson lifted the president onto a stretcher and pushed it into trauma room one. Treatment of President Kennedy The first physician to see the president at Parkland Hospital was Dr. Charles J. Carrico, a resident in general surgery. Dr. Carrico was in the emergency area examining another patient, when he was notified that President Kennedy was en route to the hospital. Approximately two minutes later, Dr. Carrico saw the President on his back being wheeled into the emergency area. He noted that the President was blue-white or ashen in color, had slow spasmodic agonal respiration without any coordination, made no voluntary movements, had his eyes open with the pupils dilated without any reaction to light, evidenced no palpable pulse, and had a few chest sounds which were thought to be heartbeats. On the basis of these findings, Dr. Carrico concluded that President Kennedy was still alive. Dr. Carrico noted two wounds, a small bullet wound in the front lower neck and an extensive wound in the President's head, where a sizable portion of the skull was missing. He observed shredded brain tissue and, quote, considerable slow oozing, end quote, from the latter wound, followed by, quote, more profuse bleeding, end quote, after some circulation was established. Dr. Carrico felt the president's back and determined that there was no large wound there which would be an immediate threat to life. Observing the serious problems presented by the head wound and inadequate respiration, Dr. Carrico directed his attention to improving the president's breathing. He noted contusions, 
hematoma to the right of the larynx, which was deviated slightly to the left, and also ragged tissue, which indicated a tracheal injury. Dr. Carrico inserted a cuffed endotracheal tube past the injury, inflated the cuff, and connected it to a Bennett machine to assist in respiration. At that point, direction of the President's treatment was undertaken by Dr. Malcolm O. Perry, who arrived at Trauma Room 1 a few moments after the President. Dr. Perry noted the President's back brace as he felt for a femoral pulse, which he did not find. Observing that an effective airway had to be established if treatment was to be effective, Dr. Perry performed a tracheotomy which required three to five minutes. While Dr. Perry was performing the tracheotomy, Drs. Carrico and Ronald Jones made cut-downs on the President's right leg and left arm, respectively, to infuse blood and fluids into the circulatory system. Dr. Carrico treated the President's known adrenal insufficiency by administering hydrocortisone. Dr. Robert N. McClelland entered at that point and assisted Dr. Perry with the tracheotomy. Dr. Fouad Bashur, Chief of Cardiology, Dr. M. T. Jenkins, Chief of Anesthesiology, and Dr. A. H. Gisek, Jr., then joined in the effort to revive the President. When Dr. Perry noted free air and blood in the President's chest cavity, he asked that chest tubes be inserted to allow for drainage of blood and air. Doctors Paul C. Peters and Charles R. Baxter initiated these procedures. As a result of the infusion of liquids through the cut-downs, the cardiac massage, and the airway, the doctors were able to maintain peripheral circulation as monitored at the neck, carotid artery, and at the wrist, radial pulse. A femoral pulse was also detected in the president's leg. While these medical efforts were in progress, Dr. Clark noted some electrical activity on the cardiotachoscope attached to monitor the President's heart responses. Dr. Clark, who most closely observed the head wound, described a large, gaping wound in the right rear part of the head with substantial damage and exposure of brain tissue and a considerable loss of blood. Dr. Clark did not see any other hole or wound on the President's head. According to Dr. Clark, the small bullet hole on the right rear of the President's head discovered during the subsequent autopsy Quote, could have easily been hidden in the blood and hair. End quote. In the absence of any neurological, muscular, or heart response, the doctors concluded that efforts to revive the president were hopeless. This was verified by Admiral Berkeley, the president's physician, who arrived at the hospital after emergency treatment was underway, and concluded that quote, my direct services to him at that moment would have interfered with the action of the team which was in progress." End quote. At approximately 1 p.m., after last rites were administered to the President by Father Oscar L. Huber, Dr. Clark pronounced the President dead. He made the official determination because the ultimate cause of death, the severe head injury, was within his sphere of specialization. The time was fixed at 1 p.m., as an approximation since it was impossible to determine the precise moment when life left the president. President Kennedy could have survived the neck injury, but the head wound was fatal. From a medical viewpoint, President Kennedy was alive when he arrived at Parkland Hospital. The doctors observed that he had a heartbeat and was making some respiratory efforts, but his condition was hopeless, and the extraordinary efforts of the doctors to save him could not help but to have been unavailing. Since the Dallas doctors directed all their efforts to controlling the massive bleeding caused by the head wound and to reconstructing an airway to his lungs, the president remained on his back throughout his medical treatment at Parkland. When asked why he did not turn the president over, Dr. Carrico testified as follows. This man was in obvious extreme distress, and any more thorough inspection would have involved several minutes, well, several, considerable time, which at this juncture was not available. A thorough inspection would have involved washing and cleansing the back 
and this is not practical in treating an acutely injured patient. You have to determine which things, which are immediately life-threatening, and cope with them before attempting to evaluate the full extent of the injuries. Question. Did you ever have occasion to look at the President's back? Answer. No, sir. Before, well, in trying to treat an acutely injured patient, you have to establish an airway, adequate ventilation, and you have to establish adequate circulation. Before this was accomplished, the President's cardiac activity had ceased, and closed cardiac massage was instituted, which made it impossible to inspect his back. Question. Was any effort made to inspect the President's back after he had expired? Answer. No, sir. Question. And why was no effort made at that time to inspect his back? Answer. I suppose nobody really had the heart to do it. Moreover, the Parkland doctors took no further action after the President had expired because they concluded that it was beyond the scope of their permissible duties. Treatment of Governor Connolly While one medical team tried to revive President Kennedy, a second performed a series of operations on the bullet wounds sustained by Governor Connolly. Governor Connolly was originally seen by Dr. Carrico and Dr. Richard Delaney. While Dr. Carrico went on to attend the President, Dr. Delaney stayed with the Governor and was soon joined by several other doctors. At approximately 12.45 p.m., Dr. Robert Shaw, Chief of Thoracic Surgery, arrived at Trauma Room 2 to take charge of the care of Governor Connolly, whose major wound fell within Dr. Shaw's area of specialization. Governor Connolly had a large sucking wound in the front of the right chest, which caused extreme pain and difficulty in breathing. Rubber tubes were inserted between the second and third ribs to re-expand the right lung, which had collapsed because of the opening in the chest wall. At 1.35 p.m., after Governor Connolly had been moved to the operating room, Dr. Shaw started the first operation by cutting away the edges of the wound on the front of the governor's chest and suturing the damaged lung and lacerated muscles. The elliptical wound in the governor's back, located slightly to the left of the governor's right armpit, approximately five-eighths inch, a centimeter and a half, in its greatest diameter, was treated by cutting away the damaged skin and suturing the back muscle and skin. This operation was concluded at 3.20 p.m. Two additional operations were performed on Governor Connolly for wounds which he had not realized he had sustained until he regained consciousness the following day. From approximately 4 p.m. to 4.50 p.m. on November 22, Dr. Charles F. Gregory, Chief of Orthopedic Surgery, operated on the wounds of Governor Connolly's right wrist, assisted by Drs. William Osborne and John Parker. The wound on the back of the wrist was left partially open for draining, and the wound on the palm side was enlarged, cleansed, and closed. The fracture was set, and a cast was applied with some traction utilized. While the second operation was in progress, Dr. George T. Shires, assisted by Drs. Robert McClelland, Charles Baxter, and Ralph Don Patman, treated the gunshot wound in the left thigh, this punctuate missile wound, about two-fifths inch in diameter, one centimeter, and located approximately five inches above the left knee, was cleansed and closed with sutures, but a small metallic fragment remained in the governor's leg. Vice President Johnson at Parkland. As President Kennedy and Governor Connolly were being removed from the limousine onto stretchers, a protective circle of Secret Service agents surrounded Vice President and Mrs. Johnson, and escorted them into Parkland Hospital through the emergency entrance. The agents moved a nurse and patient out of a nearby room, lowered the shades, and took emergency security measures to protect the Vice President. Two men from the President's follow-up car were detailed to help protect the Vice President. An agent was stationed at the entrance to stop anyone who was not a member of the presidential party. U.S. Representatives Henry B. Gonzalez, 
Jack Brooks, Homer Thornberry, and Albert Thomas joined Clifton C. Carter and the group of special agents protecting the vice president. On one occasion, Mrs. Johnson, accompanied by two Secret Service agents, left the room to see Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Connolly. Concern that the vice president might also be a target for assassination prompted the Secret Service agents to urge him to leave the hospital and return to Washington immediately. The vice president decided to wait until he received definitive word of the president's condition. At approximately 1.20 p.m., Vice President Johnson was notified by O'Donnell that President Kennedy was dead. Special Agent Youngblood learned from Mrs. Johnson the location of her two daughters and made arrangements through Secret Service headquarters in Washington to provide them with protection immediately. When consulted by the Vice President, O'Donnell advised him to go to the airfield immediately and return to Washington. It was decided that the vice president should return on the presidential plane rather than on the vice presidential plane because it had better communication equipment. The vice president conferred with White House Assistant Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff and decided that there would be no release of the news of the president's death until the vice president had left the hospital. When told that Mrs. Kennedy refused to leave without the president's body, the vice president said that he would not leave Dallas without her. On the recommendation of the Secret Service agents, Vice President Johnson decided to board the presidential airplane, Air Force One, and wait for Mrs. Kennedy and the president's body. Secret Service Emergency Security Arrangements Immediately after President Kennedy's stretcher was wheeled into Trauma Room 1, Secret Service agents took positions at the door of the small emergency room. A nurse was asked to identify hospital personnel and to tell everyone except necessary medical staff members to leave the emergency room. Other Secret Service agents posted themselves in the corridors and other areas near the emergency room. Special Agent Lawson made certain that the Dallas police kept the public and press away from the immediate area of the hospital. Agents Kellerman and Hill telephoned the head of the White House detail, Gerald A. Benn, to advise him of the assassination. The telephone line to Washington was kept open throughout the remainder of the stay at the hospital. Secret Service agents, stationed at later stops on the President's itinerary of November 22, were redeployed. Men at the trademark were driven to Parkland Hospital in Dallas police cars. The Secret Service group awaiting the President in Austin were instructed to return to Washington. Meanwhile, the Secret Service agents in charge of security at Love Field started to make arrangements for departure. As soon as one of the agents learned of the shooting, he asked the officer in charge of the police detail at the airport to institute strict security measures for the presidential aircraft, the airport terminal, and the surrounding area. The police were cautioned to prevent picture-taking. Secret Service agents working with police cleared the areas adjacent to the aircraft, including warehouses, other terminal buildings, and the neighboring parking lots of all people. The agents decided not to shift the presidential aircraft to the far side of the airport because the original landing area was secure and a move would require new measures. When security arrangements at the airport were complete, the Secret Service made the necessary arrangements for the Vice President to leave the hospital. Unmarked police cars took the Vice President and Mrs. Johnson from Parkland Hospital to Love Field. Chief Curry drove one automobile occupied by Vice President Johnson, U.S. Representatives Thomas and Thornberry, and Special Agent Youngblood. In another car, Mrs. Johnson was driven to the airport, accompanied by Secret Service agents and Representative Brooks. Motorcade policemen who escorted the automobiles were requested by the Vice President and Agent Youngblood not to use sirens. During the drive, Vice President Johnson, at Youngblood's instruction, kept below window level. Removal of the President's Body while the team of doctors at Parkland Hospital tried desperately to save the life of President Kennedy, 
Mrs. Kennedy alternated between watching them and waiting outside. After the president was pronounced dead, O'Donnell tried to persuade Mrs. Kennedy to leave the area, but she refused. She said that she intended to stay with her husband. A casket was obtained, and the president's body was prepared for removal. Before the body could be taken from the hospital, two Dallas officials informed members of the president's start that the body could not be removed from the city until an autopsy was performed. Despite the protests of these officials, the casket was wheeled out of the hospital, placed in an ambulance, and transported to the airport shortly after 2 p.m. At approximately 2.15 p.m., the casket was loaded, with some difficulty because of the narrow airplane door, onto the rear of the presidential plane, where seats had been removed to make room. Concerned that the local officials might try to prevent the plane's departure, O'Donnell asked that the pilot take off immediately. He was informed that takeoff would be delayed until Vice President Johnson was sworn in. The End of the Trip Swearing in of the New President From the presidential airplane, the Vice President telephoned Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy who advised that Mr. Johnson take the presidential oath of office before the plane left Dallas. Federal Judge Sarah T. Hughes hastened to the plane to administer the oath. Members of the presidential and vice presidential parties filled the central compartment of the plane to witness the swearing-in. At 2.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Lyndon Baines Johnson took the oath of office as the 36th President of the United States. Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Johnson stood at the side of the new President as he took the oath of office. Nine minutes later, the presidential airplane departed for Washington, D.C. Return to Washington, D.C. On the return flight, Mrs. Kennedy sat with David Powers, Kenneth O'Donnell, and Lawrence O'Brien. At 5.58 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Air Force One landed at Andrews Air Force Base, where President Kennedy had begun his last trip only 31 hours before. Detailed security arrangements had been made by radio from the President's plane on the return flight. The public had been excluded from the base, and only government officials and the press were permitted near the landing area. Upon arrival, President Johnson made a brief statement over television and radio. President and Mrs. Johnson were flown by helicopter to the White House, from where Mrs. Johnson was driven to her residence under Secret Service escort. The President then walked to the Executive Office building, where he worked until 9 p.m. The Autopsy Given a choice between the National Naval Medical Center at Bethesda, Maryland, and the Army's Walter Reed Hospital, Mrs. Kennedy chose the hospital in Bethesda for the autopsy because the President had served in the Navy. Mrs. Kennedy and the Attorney General, with three Secret Service agents, accompanied President Kennedy's body on the 45-minute automobile trip from Andrews Air Force Base to the hospital. On the 17th floor of the hospital, Mrs. Kennedy and the Attorney General joined other members of the Kennedy family to await the conclusion of the autopsy. Mrs. Kennedy was guarded by Secret Service agents in quarters assigned to her in the Naval Hospital. The Secret Service established a communication system with the White House and screened all telephone calls and visitors. The hospital received the President's body for autopsy at approximately 7.35 p.m. X-rays and photographs were taken preliminarily, and the pathological examination began at about 8 p.m. The autopsy report noted that President Kennedy was 46 years of age, 72 and one-half inches tall, weighed 170 pounds, had blue eyes and reddish-brown hair. The body was muscular and well-developed, with no gross skeletal abnormalities except for those caused by the gunshot wounds. Under pathological diagnosis, the cause of death was set forth as gunshot wound, head. 
The autopsy examination revealed two wounds in the president's head. One wound, approximately one-fourth of an inch by five-eighths of an inch, six by fifteen millimeters, was located about an inch, 2.5 centimeters, to the right and slightly above the large bony protrusion, external occipital protuberance, which juts out at the center of the lower part of the back of the skull. The second head wound measured approximately 5 inches, 13 centimeters, in its greatest diameter, but was difficult to measure accurately because multiple crisscross fractures radiated from the large defect. During the autopsy examination, federal agents brought the surgeons three pieces of bone recovered from Elm Street and the presidential automobile. When put together, these fragments accounted for approximately three-quarters of the missing portion of the skull. The surgeons observed, through X-ray analysis, 30 or 40 tiny dust-like fragments of metal running in a line from the wound in the rear of the president's head toward the front part of the skull, with a sizable metal fragment lying just above the right eye. From this head wound, two small, irregularly shaped fragments of metal were recovered and turned over to the FBI. The autopsy also disclosed a wound near the base of the back of President Kennedy's neck, slightly to the right of his spine. The doctors traced the course of the bullet through the body, and as information was received from Parkland Hospital, concluded that the bullet had emerged from the front portion of the president's neck that had been cut away by the tracheotomy at Parkland. The nature and characteristics of this neck wound are discussed fully in the next chapter. After the autopsy was concluded at approximately 11 p.m., the president's body was prepared for burial. This was finished at approximately 4 a.m. Shortly thereafter, the president's wife, family, and aides left Bethesda Naval Hospital. The president's body was taken to the East Room of the White House, where it was placed under ceremonial military guard. End of Section 6 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 7 of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 3. The Shots from the Texas School Book Depository, Part 1. In this chapter, the Commission analyzes the evidence and sets forth its conclusions concerning the source, effect, number, and timing of the shots that killed President Kennedy and wounded Governor Connolly. In that connection, the Commission has evaluated 1. The testimony of eyewitnesses present at the scene of the assassination, 2. The damage to the President's limousine, 3. The examination by qualified experts of the rifle and cartridge cases found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository and the bullet fragments found in the President's limousine and at Parkland Hospital. 4. The wounds suffered by President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. 5. Wound ballistic tests. 6. The examination by qualified experts of the clothing worn by President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. And 7 motion picture films, and still photographs taken at the time of the assassination. The Witnesses As reflected in the previous chapter, passengers in the first few cars of the motorcade had the impression that the shots came from the rear and from the right, the general direction of the Texas School Book Depository building, although none of these passengers saw anyone fire the shots. Some spectators at Houston and Elm Streets, however, did see a rifle being fired in the direction of the president's car from the easternmost window of the sixth floor on the south side of the building. Other witnesses saw a rifle in this window immediately after the assassination. 
three employees of the depository observing the parade from the fifth floor heard the shots fired from the floor immediately above them no credible evidence suggests that the shots were fired from the railroad bridge over the triple underpass the nearby railroad yards or any place other than the texas school book depository building near the depository eyewitnesses testified that they saw a man fire a weapon from the sixth floor window howard l brennan a 45-year-old steam fitter watched the motorcade from a concrete retaining wall at the southwest corner of elm and houston where he had a clear view of the south side of the depository building he was approximately 107 feet from the depository entrance and 120 feet from the southeast corner of the sixth floor brennan's presence and vantage point are corroborated by a motion picture of the motorcade taken by amateur photographer abraham zapruder which shows brennan wearing gray khaki work clothes and a gray work helmet seated on the retaining wall brennan later identified himself in the zapruder movie while waiting about seven minutes for the president to arrive he observed the crowd on the street and the people at the windows of the depository building he noticed a man at the southeast corner window of the sixth floor and observed him leave the window a couple of times brennan watched the president's car as it turned the corner at houston and elm and moved down the incline toward the triple underpass soon after the president's car passed he heard an explosion like the backfire of a motorcycle brennan recalled well then something just right after this explosion made me think that it was a firecracker being thrown from the texas bookstore and i glanced up and this man that i saw previous was aiming for his last shot well as it appeared to me he was standing up and resting against the left window sill with gun shouldered to his right shoulder holding the gun with his left hand and taking positive aim and fired his last shot as i calculate a couple of seconds he drew the gun back from the window as though he was drawing it back to his side and maybe paused for another second as though to assure himself that he hit his mark and then he disappeared brennan stated that he saw seventy to eighty per cent of the gun when it was fired and the body of the man from the waist up the rifle was aimed southwesterly down elm street toward the underpass brennan saw the man fire one shot and he remembered hearing a total of only two shots when questioned about the number of shots brennan testified i don't know what made me think that there was firecrackers thrown out of the bookstore unless i did hear the second shot because i positively thought the first shot was a backfire and subconsciously i must have heard a second shot but i do not recall it i could not swear to it brennan quickly reported his observations to police officers brennan's description of the man he saw is discussed in the next chapter amos lee ewens a fifteen-year-old ninth grade student stated that he was facing the depository as the motorcade turned the corner at elm in houston he recalled then i was standing here and as the motorcade turned the corner i was facing looking dead at the building and so i seen this pipe thing sticking out of the window i wasn't paying too much attention to it then when the first shot was fired i started looking around thinking it was a backfire everybody else started looking around then i looked up at the window and he shot again after witnessing the first shots ewens hid behind a fountain bench and saw the man shoot again from the window in the southeast corner of the depository sixth floor according to ewens the man had one hand on the barrel and the other on the trigger ewens believed that there were four shots immediately after the assassination he reported his observations to sergeant d v harkness of the dallas police department and also to james underwood of station k r l d t v of dallas sergeant harkness testified that ewens told him that the shots came from the last window of the floor under the ledge on the side of the building they were facing based on ewen's statements harkness radioed to headquarters at two thirty six p m that i have a witness that says it came from the fifth floor of the texas book depository store ewen's accurately described the sixth floor as the floor under the ledge harkness testified that the error in the radio message was due to his own hasty count of the floors other witnesses saw a rifle in the window after the shots were fired robert h jackson staff photographer dallas times herald was in a press car in the presidential motorcade 
eight or nine cars from the front. On Houston Street, about halfway between Main and Elm, Jackson heard the first shot. As someone in the car commented that it sounded like a firecracker, Jackson heard two more shots. He testified, Then we realized, or we thought that it was gunfire, and then we could not at that point see the president's car. We were still moving slowly, and after the third shot, the second two shots seemed much closer together than the first shot, than they were to the first shot. Then after the last shot, I guess all of us were just looking around, and I just looked straight up ahead of me, which would have been looking at the school book depository, and I noticed two Negro men in a window straining to see directly above them, and my eyes followed right on up to the window above them, and I saw the rifle, or what looked like a rifle, approximately half of the weapon, I guess, I saw, and just as I looked at it, it was drawn fairly slowly back into the building, and I saw no one in the window with it. I didn't even see a form in the window. In the car with Jackson were James Underwood, television station KRLD TV, Thomas Dillard, chief photographer, Dallas Morning News, Malcolm O. Couch, and James Darnell, television newsreel cameraman. Dillard, Underwood, and the driver were in the front seat. Couch and Darnell were sitting on top of the back seat of the convertible with Jackson. Dillard, Couch, and Underwood confirmed that Jackson spontaneously exclaimed that he saw a rifle in the window. According to Dillard, at the time the shots were fired, he and his fellow passengers had an absolutely perfect view of the school depository from our position in the open car. Dillard immediately took two pictures of the building, one of the east two-thirds of the south side and the other of the southeast corner, particularly the fifth and sixth floor windows. These pictures show three Negro men in windows on the fifth floor and the partially open window on the sixth floor directly above them. Couch also saw the rifle in the window and testified. After the third shot, Bob Jackson, who was, as I recall, on my right, yelled something like, Look up in the window, there's the rifle. And I remember glancing up to a window on the far right, which at the time impressed me as the sixth or seventh floor, and seeing about a foot of a rifle being, the barrel brought into the window. Couch testified that he saw people standing in other windows on the third or fourth floor in the middle of the south side, one of them being a negro in a white t-shirt, leaning out to look up at the windows above him. Mayor and Mrs. Earl Cabell rode in the motorcade immediately behind the presidential follow-up car. Mrs. Cabell was seated in the back seat behind the driver and was facing U.S. Representative Ray Roberts on her right as the car made the turn at Elm and Houston. In this position, Mrs. Cabell was actually facing the seven-story depository when the first shot rang out. She jerked her head up immediately and saw a projection in the first group of windows on a floor which she described both as the sixth floor and the top floor. According to Mrs. Cabell, the object was rather long-looking, but she was unable to determine whether it was a mechanical object or a person's arm. She turned away from the window to tell her husband that the noise was a shot, and, just as I got the words out, the second two shots rang out. Mrs. Cabell did not look at the sixth-floor window when the second and third shots were fired. James N. Crawford and Mary Ann Mitchell, two deputy district clerks for Dallas County, watched the motorcade at the southeast corner of Elm and Houston. After the president's car turned the corner, Crawford heard a loud report, which he thought was backfire, coming from the direction of the triple underpass. He heard a second shot seconds later, followed quickly by a third. At the third shot, he looked up and saw a movement in the far east corner of the sixth floor of the depository, the only open window on that floor. He told Miss Mitchell that if those were shots, they came from that window. When asked to describe the movement more exactly, he said, I would say that it was a profile, somewhat from the waist up, but it was a very quick movement and rather indistinct, and it was very light-colored. When I saw it, I automatically in my mind came to the conclusion that it was a person having moved out of the window. He could not state whether the person was a man or woman. Miss Mitchell confirmed that after the third shot Crawford told her, those shots came from that building. She saw Crawford pointing at a window, but was not sure at which window he was pointing. On the fifth floor. Three depository employees shown in the picture taken by Dillard were on the fifth floor of the building when the shots were fired. J. 
James Jarman, Jr., age 34, a wrapper in the shipping department, Bonnie Ray Williams, age 20, a warehouseman temporarily assigned to lay a plywood floor on the sixth floor, and Harold Norman, age 26, an order filler. Norman and Jarman decided to watch the parade during the lunch hour from the fifth floor windows. From the ground floor, they took the west elevator, which operates with push-button controls, to the fifth floor. Meanwhile, Williams had gone up to the sixth floor where he had been working and ate his lunch on the south side of that floor. Since he saw no one around when he finished his lunch, he started down on the east elevator, looking for company. He left behind his paper lunch sack, chicken bones, and an empty pop bottle. Williams went down to the fifth floor, where he joined Norman and Jarman at approximately 12.20 p.m. Harold Norman was in the fifth floor window in the southeast corner, directly under the window where witnesses saw the rifle. He could see light through the ceiling cracks between the fifth and sixth floors. As the motorcade went by, Norman thought that the president was saluting with his right arm. And I can't remember what the exact time was, but I know I heard a shot, and then after I heard the shot, well, it seems as though the president, you know, slumped or something, and then another shot, and I believe Jarman or someone told me, he said, I believe someone is shooting at the president, and I think I made a statement, it is someone shooting at the president, and I can't believe it came from up above us. Well, I couldn't see it all during the time, but I know I heard a third shot fired, and I could also hear something sounding like the shell hulls, hitting the first floor and the ejecting of the rifle. Williams said that he really did not pay any attention to the first shot because he did not know what was happening. The second shot, it sounded like it was right in the building, the second and third shot, and it sounded, it even shook the building, the side we were on, cement fell on my head. Question. You say cement fell on your head. Answer. Cement, gravel, dirt, or something from the old building because it shook the windows and everything. Harold was sitting next to me, and he said it came from right over our head. Williams testified, Norman said, I can even hear the shell being ejected from the gun hitting the floor. When Jarman heard the first sound, he thought that it was either a backfire or an officer giving a salute to the president, and that at that time I didn't, you know, think too much about it. Well, after the third shot was fired, I think I got up, and run over to Harold Newman and Bonnie Ray Williams and told them, I said, I told them that it wasn't a backfire or anything, that somebody was shooting at the president. Jarman testified that Norman said that he thought the shots had come from above us, and I noticed that Bonnie Ray had a few debris in his head. It was a sort of white stuff or something. Jarman stated that Norman said that he was sure that the shot came from inside the building because he had been used to guns and all that, and he said it didn't sound like it was too far off anyway. The three men ran to the west side of the building where they could look toward the triple underpass to see what had happened to the motorcade. After the men had gone to the window on the west side of the building, Jarman got to thinking about all the debris on Bonnie Ray's head and said, that shot probably did come from upstairs, up over us. He testified that Norman said, I know it did because I could hear the action of the bolt and I could hear the cartridges drop to the floor. After pausing for a few minutes, the three men ran downstairs. Norman and Jarman ran out of the front entrance of the building, where they saw Brennan, the construction worker who had seen the man in the window firing the gun, talking to a police officer, and they then reported their own experience. On March 20, 1964, preceding their appearance before the commission, these witnesses were interviewed in Dallas. At that time, members of the commission's legal staff conducted an experiment— Norman, Williams, and Jarman placed themselves at the windows of the fifth floor as they had been on November 22nd. A Secret Service agent operated the bolt of a rifle directly above them at the southeast corner window of the sixth floor. At the same time, three cartridge shells were dropped to the floor at intervals of about three seconds. According to Norman, the noise outside was less on the day of the assassination than on the day of the test. He testified, Well, I heard the same sound, the sound similar. I heard three something that he dropped on the floor, and then I could hear the rifle or whatever he had up there. The experiment with the shells and rifle was repeated for members of the commission on May 9, 1964, on June 7, 1964, 
and again on September 6, 1964. All seven of the commissioners clearly heard the shells drop to the floor. End of section 7section eight of report of the president's commission on the assassination of president kennedy the warren commission report this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by marianne report of the president's commission on the assassination of president kennedy the warren commission report by the president's commission on the assassination of president kennedy chapter three the Shots from the Texas School Book Depository, Part 2 At the Triple Underpass In contrast to the testimony of the witnesses who heard and observed shots fired from the depository, the Commission's investigation has disclosed no credible evidence that any shots were fired from anywhere else. When the shots were fired, many people near the depository believed that the shots came from the railroad bridge over the Triple Underpass or from the area to the west of the depository. In the hectic moments after the assassination, many spectators ran in the general direction of the triple underpass or the railroad yards northwest of the building. Some were running toward the place from which the sound of the rifle appeared to have come. Others were fleeing the scene of the shooting. None of these people saw anyone with a rifle, and the Commission's inquiry has yielded no evidence that shots were fired from the bridge over the triple underpass or from the railroad yards. On the day of the motorcade, Patrolman W.J. Foster stood on the east side of the railroad bridge over the triple underpass, and Patrolman J.C. White stood on the west side. Patrolman Joe E. Murphy was standing over Elm Street on the Stemmons Freeway overpass, west of the railroad bridge, farther away from the depository. Two other officers were stationed on Stemmons Freeway to control traffic as the motorcade entered the freeway. Under the advance preparations worked out between the Secret Service and the Dallas Police Department, the policemen were under instructions to keep unauthorized people away from these locations. When the motorcade reached the intersection of Elm and Houston Streets, there were no spectators on Stemmons Freeway where Patrolman Murphy was stationed. Patrolman Foster estimated that there were 10 or 11 people on the railroad bridge where he was assigned. Another witness testified that there were between 14 and 18 people there as the motorcade came into view. Investigation has disclosed 15 persons who were on the railroad bridge at this time, including two policemen, two employees of the Texas-Louisiana Freight Bureau, and 11 employees of the Union Terminal Company. In the absence of any explicit definition of unauthorized persons, the policemen permitted these employees to remain on the railroad bridge to watch the motorcade. At the request of the policeman, S. M. Holland, signal supervisor for Union Terminal Company, came to the railroad bridge at about 11.45 a.m. and remained to identify those persons who were railroad employees. In addition, Patrolman Foster checked credentials to determine if persons seeking access to the bridge were railroad employees. Persons who were not railroad employees were ordered away, including one news photographer who wished only to take a picture of the motorcade. Another employee of the Union Terminal Company, Lee E. Bowers, Jr., was at work in a railroad tower about 14 feet above the tracks to the north of the railroad bridge and northwest of the corner of Elm and Houston, approximately 50 yards from the back of the depository. From the tower he could view people moving in the railroad yards and at the rear of the depository. According to Bowers, since approximately 10 o'clock in the morning traffic had been cut off into the area so that anyone moving around could actually be observed. During the 20 minutes prior to the arrival of the motorcade, Bowers noticed three automobiles which entered his immediate area, two left without discharging any passengers, and the third was apparently on its way out when last observed by Bowers. Bowers observed only three or four people in the general area, as well as a few bystanders on the railroad bridge over the triple underpass. As the motorcade proceeded towards the triple underpass, the spectators were clustered together along the east concrete wall of the railroad bridge facing the oncoming procession. Patrolman Foster stood immediately behind them and could observe them all. Secret Service agents in the lead car of the motorcade observed the bystanders and the police officer on the bridge. Special Agent 
Winston G. Lawson motioned through the windshield in an unsuccessful attempt to instruct Patrolman Foster to move the people away from their position directly over the path of the motorcade. Some distance away, on the Stemmons Freeway overpass above Elm Street, Patrolman Murphy also had the group on the railroad bridge within view. When he heard the shots, Foster rushed to the wall of the railroad bridge over the triple underpass and looked toward the street. After the third shot, Foster ran toward the depository and shortly thereafter informed Inspector Herbert J. Sawyer of the Dallas Police Department that he thought the shots came from the vicinity of Elm and Houston. Other witnesses on the railroad bridge had varying views concerning the source and number of the shots. Austin L. Miller, employed by the Texas-Louisiana Freight Bureau, heard three shots and thought they came from the area of the presidential limousine itself. One of his co-workers, Royce G. Skelton, thought he heard four shots, but could not tell their exact source. Frank E. Riley, an electrician at Union Terminal, heard three shots, which seemed to come from the trees, on the north side of Elm Street, at the corner up there. According to S. M. Holland, there were four shots, which sounded as though they came from the trees on the north side of Elm Street, where he saw a puff of smoke. Thomas J. Murphy, a male foreman at Union Terminal Company, heard two shots and said that they came from a spot just west of the depository. In the railroad tower, Bowers heard three shots, which sounded as though they came either from the depository building or near the mouth of the triple underpass. Prior to November 22, 1963, Bowers had noted the similarity of the sounds coming from the vicinity of the depository and those from the triple underpass, which he attributed to a reverberation which takes place from either location. Immediately after the shots were fired, neither the policemen, the spectators on the railroad bridge over the triple underpass, saw anything suspicious on the bridge in their vicinity. No one saw anyone with a rifle. As he ran around through the railroad yards to the depository, Patrolman Foster saw no suspicious activity. The same was true of the other bystanders, many of whom made an effort after the shooting to observe any unusual activity. Holland, for example, immediately after the shots, ran off the overpass to see if there was anyone behind the picket fence on the north side of Elm Street, but he did not see anyone among the parked cars. Miller did not see anyone running across the railroad tracks or on the plaza west of the depository. Bowers and others saw a motorcycle officer dismount hurriedly and come running up the incline on the north side of Elm Street. The motorcycle officer, Clyde A. Haygood, saw no one running from the railroad yards. The Presidential Automobile After the presidential car was returned to Washington on November 22, 1963, Secret Service agents found two bullet fragments in the front seat. One fragment, found on the seat beside the driver, weighed 44.6 grains and consisted of the nose portion of a bullet. The other fragment, found along the right side of the front seat, weighed 21.0 grains and consisted of the base portion of a bullet. During the course of an examination on November 23rd, agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation found three small lead particles, weighing between seven-tenths and nine-tenths of a grain each, on the rug underneath the left jump seat, which had been occupied by Mrs. Connolly. During this examination, the Bureau agents noted a small residue of lead on the inside surface of the laminated windshield and a very small pattern of cracks on the outer layer of the windshield immediately behind the lead residue. There was a minute particle of glass missing from the outside surface, but no penetration. The inside layer of glass was not broken. The agents also observed a dent in the strip of chrome across the top of the windshield, located to the left of the rear view mirror support. The lead residue on the inside of the windshield was compared under spectrographic analysis by FBI experts with the bullet fragments found on and alongside of the front seat and with the fragments under the left jump seat. It was also compared with bullet fragments found at Parkland Hospital. All these bullet fragments were found to be similar in metallic composition, but it was not possible to determine whether two or more of the fragments came from the same bullet. It is possible for the fragments from the front seat to have been a part of the same bullet as the three fragments found near the left jump seat, since a whole bullet of this type weighs 160 to 161 grains. 
the physical characteristics of the windshield after the assassination demonstrate that the windshield was struck on the inside surface the windshield is composed of two layers of glass with a very thin layer of plastic in the middle which bonds them together in the form of safety glass the windshield was extracted from the automobile and was examined during a commission hearing according to robert a frazier fbi firearms expert the fact that cracks were present on the outer layer of glass showed that the glass had been struck from the inside he testified that the windshield could not have been struck on the outside surface because of the manner in which the glass broke and further because of the lead residue on the inside surface the cracks appear in the outer layer of the glass because the glass is bent outward at the time of impact which stretches the outer layer of the glass to the point where these small radial or wagon spoke wagon wheel spoke type cracks appear on the outer surface although there is some uncertainty whether the dent in the chrome on the windshield was present prior to the assassination fraser testified that the dent had been caused by some projectile which struck the chrome on the inside surface if it was caused by a shot during the assassination fraser stated that it would not have been caused by a bullet traveling at full velocity but rather by a fragment traveling at a fairly high velocity it could have been caused by either fragment found in the front seat of the limousine expert examination of rifle cartridge cases and bullet fragments on the sixth floor of the depository building the dallas police found three spent cartridges and a rifle a nearly whole bullet was discovered on the stretcher used to carry governor Connolly at parkland hospital as described in the preceding section five bullet fragments were found in the president's limousine the cartridge cases the nearly whole bullet and the bullet fragments were all subjected to firearms identification analysis by qualified experts it was the unanimous opinion of the experts that the nearly whole bullet the two largest bullet fragments and the three cartridges were definitely fired in the rifle found on the sixth floor of the depository building to the exclusion of all other weapons discovery of cartridge cases and rifle shortly after the assassination police officers arrived at the depository building and began a search for the assassin and evidence around one p m deputy sheriff luke mooney noticed a pile of cartons in front of the window in the southeast corner of the sixth floor searching that area he found at approximately one twelve p m three empty cartridge cases on the floor near the window when he was notified of mooney's discovery captain j w fritz chief of the homicide bureau of the dallas police department issued instructions that nothing be moved or touched until technicians from the police crime laboratory could take photographs and check for fingerprints mooney stood guard to see that nothing was disturbed a few minutes later lieutenant j c day of the dallas police department arrived and took photographs of the cartridge cases before anything had been moved at one twenty two p m deputy sheriff eugene boone and deputy constable seymour weitzman found a bolt-action rifle with a telescopic sight between two rows of boxes in the northwest corner near the staircase on the sixth floor no one touched the weapon or otherwise disturbed the scene until captain fritz and lieutenant day arrived and the weapon was photographed as it lay on the floor after lieutenant day determined that there were no fingerprints on the knob of the bolt and that the wooden stock was too rough to take fingerprints he picked up the rifle by the stock and held it that way while captain fritz opened the bolt and ejected a live round lieutenant day retained possession of the weapon and took it back to the police department for examination neither boone nor weitzman handled the rifle discovery of bullet at parkland hospital a nearly whole bullet was found on governor Connolly's stretcher at parkland hospital after the assassination after his arrival at the hospital the governor was brought into trauma room number two on a stretcher removed from the room on that stretcher a short time later and taken on an elevator to the second floor operating room on the second floor he was transferred from the stretcher to an operating table which was then moved into the operating room and a hospital attendant wheeled the empty stretcher into an elevator shortly afterward darrell c tomlinson the hospital senior engineer removed this stretcher from the elevator and placed it in the corridor on the ground floor alongside another stretcher wholly unconnected with the care of governor Connolly. a few minutes later he bumped one of the stretchers against the wall and a bullet rolled out 
Although Tomlinson was not certain whether the bullet came from the Connolly stretcher or the adjacent one, the commission has concluded that the bullet came from the governor's stretcher. That conclusion is buttressed by evidence which eliminated President Kennedy's stretcher as a source of the bullet. President Kennedy remained on the stretcher on which he was carried into the hospital while the doctors tried to save his life. He was never removed from the stretcher from the time he was taken into the emergency room until his body was placed in a casket in the same room. After the president's body was removed from that stretcher, the linen was taken off and placed in a hamper, and the stretcher was pushed into trauma room number two, a completely different location from the site where the nearly whole bullet was found. Description of the Rifle the bolt-action, clip-fed rifle found on the sixth floor of the depository, described more fully in Appendix 10, is inscribed with various markings, including Made in Italy, CAL 6.5, 1940, and the number C2766. These markings have been explained as follows. Made in Italy refers to its origin. CAL 6.5 refers to the rifle's caliber. 1940 refers to the year of manufacture, and the number C2766 is the serial number. This rifle is the only one of its type bearing that serial number. After review of standard reference works and the markings on the rifle, it was identified by the FBI as a 6.5 mm model 9138 Manlicher Carcano rifle. Experts from the FBI made an independent determination of the caliber by inserting a Macliner Carcano 6.5 mm cartridge into the weapon for fit, and by making a sulfur cast of the inside of the weapon's barrel and measuring the cast with a micrometer. From outward appearance, the weapon would appear to be a 7.35 mm rifle, but its mechanism had been rebarreled with a 6.5 mm barrel. Constable Deputy Sheriff Weitzman, who only saw the rifle at a glance and did not handle it, thought the weapon looked like a 7.65 Mauser bolt-action rifle. The rifle is 40.2 inches long and weighs 8 pounds. The maximum length broken down is 34.8 inches, the length of the wooden stock. Expert Testimony Four experts in the field of firearms identification analyzed the nearly whole bullet, the two largest fragments and the three cartridge cases to determine whether they had been fired from the C-2766 Manlicher Carcano rifle found on the sixth floor of the depository. Two of these experts testified before the commission. One was Robert A. Frazier, a special agent of the FBI assigned to the FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. Frazier has worked generally in the field of firearms identification for 23 years, examining firearms of various types for the purpose of identifying the caliber and other characteristics of the weapons, and making comparisons of bullets and cartridge cases for the purpose of determining whether or not they were fired in a particular weapon. He estimated that he has made, in the neighborhood of 50,000 to 60,000 firearms comparisons, and has testified in court on about 400 occasions. The second witness who testified on the subject was Joseph D. Nickel, superintendent of the Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation for the State of Illinois. Nickel also has had long and substantial experience since 1941 in firearms identification and estimated that he has made thousands of bullet and cartridge case examinations. In examining the bullet fragments and cartridge cases, these experts applied the general principles accepted in the field of firearms identification, which are discussed in more detail in Appendix 10 at pages 547 to 553. In brief, a determination that a particular bullet or cartridge case has been fired in a particular weapon is based upon a comparison of the bullet or case under examination with one or more bullets or cases known to have been fired in that weapon. When a bullet is fired in any given weapon, it is engraved with the characteristics of the weapon. In addition to the rifling characteristics of the barrel, which are common to all weapons of a given make and model, Every weapon bears distinctive microscopic markings on its barrel, firing pin, and bolt face. These markings arise initially during manufacture, since the action of the manufacturing tools differs microscopically from weapon to weapon, and since, in addition, the tools change microscopically while being used. As a weapon is used, further distinctive markings are introduced. 
under a microscopic examination a qualified expert may be able to determine whether the markings on a bullet known to have been fired in a particular weapon and the markings on a suspect bullet are the same and therefore whether both bullets were fired in the same weapon to the exclusion of all other weapons similarly firearms identification experts are able to compare the markings left upon the base of cartridge cases and thereby determine whether both cartridges were fired by the same weapon to the exclusion of all other weapons according to fraser such an identification is made on the presence of sufficient individual microscopic characteristics so that a very definite pattern is formed and visualized on the two surfaces under some circumstances as where the bullet or cartridge case is seriously mutilated there are not sufficient individual characteristics to enable the expert to make a firm identification after making independent examinations both fraser and nickel positively identified the nearly whole bullet from the stretcher and the two larger bullet fragments found in the presidential limousine as having been fired in the c twenty seven sixty six manlicher carcano rifle found in the depository to the exclusion of all other weapons each of the two bullet fragments had sufficient unmutilated area to provide the basis for an identification however it was not possible to determine whether the two bullet fragments were from the same bullet or from two different bullets with regard to the other bullet fragments discovered in the limousine and in the course of treating president kennedy and governor connolly however expert examination could demonstrate only that the fragments were similar in metallic composition to each other to the two larger fragments and to the nearly whole bullet after examination of the three cartridge cases found on the sixth floor of the depository fraser and nickel concluded that they had been fired in the c twenty seven sixty six manlicher carcano rifle to the exclusion of all other weapons two other experts from the federal bureau of investigation who made independent examinations of the nearly whole bullet bullet fragments and cartridge cases reached the identical conclusions end of section eight section nine of report of the president's commission on the assassination of president kennedy the warren commission report this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by marianne report of the president's commission on the assassination of president kennedy the warren commission report by the president's commission on the assassination of president kennedy chapter three the shots from the texas school book depository part three the bullet wounds in considering the question of the source of the shots fired at president kennedy and governor connolly the commission has also evaluated the expert medical testimony of the doctors who observed the wounds during the emergency treatment at parkland hospital and during the autopsy at bethesda naval hospital it paid particular attention to any wound characteristics which would be of assistance in identifying a wound as the entrance or exit point of a missile additional information regarding the source and nature of the injuries was obtained by expert examination of the clothes worn by the two men particularly those worn by president kennedy and from the results of special wound ballistics tests conducted at the commission's request using the c two seven six six manlicher carcano rifle with ammunition of the same type as that used and found on november twenty second nineteen sixty three the president's head wounds the detailed autopsy of president kennedy performed on the night of november twenty two at the bethesda naval hospital led the three examining pathologists to conclude that the smaller hole in the rear of the president's skull was the point of entry and that the large opening on the right side of his head was the wound of exit the smaller hole on the back of the president's head measured one-fourth of an inch by five-eighths of an inch six by fifteen millimeters the dimensions of that wound were consistent with having been caused by a six point five millimeter bullet fired from behind and above which struck at a tangent or an angle causing a fifteen millimeter cut the cut reflected a larger dimension of entry than the bullet's diameter of six point five millimeters since the missile in effect sliced along the skull for a fractional distance until it entered the dimension of six millimeters somewhat smaller than the diameter of a six point five millimeter bullet was caused by the elastic recoil of the skull which shrinks the size of an opening after a missile passes through it lieutenant colonel pierre a fink 
chief of the wound ballistics pathology branch of the armed forces institute of pathology who has had extensive experience with bullet wounds illustrated the characteristics which led to his conclusions about the head wound by a chart prepared by him this chart based on colonel fink's studies of more than four hundred cases depicted the effect of a perforating missile wound on the human skull when a bullet enters the skull cranial vault at one point and exits at another it causes a beveling or cratering effect where the diameter of the hole is smaller on the impact side than on the exit side based on his observations of that beveling effect on the president's skull colonel fink testified president kennedy was in my opinion shot from the rear the bullet entered in the back of the head and went out on the right side of his skull he was shot from above and behind commander james j humes senior pathologist and director of laboratories at the bethesda naval hospital who acted as chief autopsy surgeon concurred in colonel fink's analysis he compared the beveling or coning effect to that caused by a bb shot which strikes a pane of glass causing a round or oval defect on the side of the glass where the missile strikes and a belled out or coned out surface on the opposite side of the glass referring to the bullet hole on the back of president kennedy's head commander humes testified the wound on the inner table however was larger and had what in the field of wound ballistics is described as a shelving or coning effect after studying the other hole in the president's skull commander humes stated we concluded that the large defect to the upper right side of the skull, in fact, would represent a wound of exit. Those characteristics led Commander Humes and Commander J. Thornton Boswell, chief of pathology at Bethesda Naval Hospital, who assisted in the autopsy, to conclude that the bullet penetrated the rear of the president's head and exited through a large wound on the right side of his head. Ballistics experiments, discussed more fully in Appendix 10, pages 585 to 586, showed that the rifle and bullets identified above were capable of producing the president's head wound the wound ballistics branch of the united states army laboratories at edgewood arsenal maryland conducted an extensive series of experiments to test the effect of western cartridge company 6.5 millimeter bullets the type found on governor Connolly's stretcher and in the presidential limousine fired from the c2766 manlicher carcano rifle found in the depository the Edgewood Arsenal tests were performed under the immediate supervision of Alfred G. Oliver, a doctor who had spent seven years in wounds ballistics research for the U.S. Army. One series of tests, performed on reconstructed inert human skulls, demonstrated that the president's head wound could have been caused by the rifle and bullets fired by the assassin from the sixth floor window. The results of this series were illustrated by the findings on one skull which was struck at a point closely approximating the wound of entry on President Kennedy's head. That bullet blew out the right side of the reconstructed skull in a manner very similar to the head wound of the President. As a result of these tests, Dr. Oliver concluded that a Western Cartridge Company 6.5 bullet fired from the C-2766 Manlicher Carcano rifle at a distance of 90 yards would make the same type of wound as that found on the president's head. Referring to the series of tests, Dr. Oliver testified, It disclosed that the type of head wounds that the president received could be done by this type of bullet. This surprised me very much, because this type of stable bullet I didn't think would cause a massive head wound. I thought it would go through, making a small entrance and exit, but the bones of the skull are enough to deform the end of the bullet, causing it to expend a lot of energy and blowing out the side of the skull or blowing out fragments of the skull. After examining the fragments of the bullet which struck the reconstructed skull, Dr. Oliver stated that the recovered fragments were very similar to the ones recovered on the front seat and on the floor of the car. To me, this indicates that those fragments did come from the bullet that wounded the president in the head. The President's Neck Wounds During the autopsy at Bethesda Naval Hospital, another bullet wound was observed near the base of the back of President Kennedy's neck, slightly to the right of the spine, which provides further enlightenment as to the source of the shots. The hole was located approximately five and one-half inches, 14 centimeters, from the tip of the right shoulder joint and approximately the same distance below the tip of the right mastoid process, the bony point immediately behind the ear. The wound was approximately one-fourth by one-seventh of an inch, had clean edges, was sharply delineated, and had margins similar in all respects to those of the entry wound in the skull. 
Commanders Hume and Boswell agreed with Colonel Fink's testimony that this hole is a wound of entrance. The basis for that conclusion is that this wound was relatively small with clean edges. It was not a jagged wound, and that is what we see in a wound of entrance at long range. The autopsy examination further disclosed that, after entering the president, the bullet passed between two large muscles, produced a contusion on the upper part of the pleural cavity, without penetrating that cavity, bruised the top portion of the right lung, and ripped the windpipe, trachea, in its path through the president's neck. The examining surgeons concluded that the wounds were caused by the bullet rather than the tracheotomy performed at Parkland Hospital. The nature of the bruises indicated that the president's heart and lungs were functioning when the bruises were caused, whereas there was very little circulation in the president's body when incisions on the president's chest were made to insert tubes during the tracheotomy. No bone was struck by the bullet, which passed through the president's body. By projecting from a point of entry on the rear of the neck and proceeding at a slightly downward angle through the bruised interior portions, the doctors concluded that the bullet exited from the front portion of the president's neck that had been cut away by the tracheotomy. Concluding that a bullet passed through the president's neck, the doctors at Bethesda Naval Hospital rejected a theory that the bullet lodged in the large muscles of the back of his neck and fell out through the point of entry when external heart massage was applied at Parkland Hospital. In the earlier stages of the autopsy, the surgeons were unable to find a path into any large muscle in the back of the neck. At that time, they did not know that there had been a bullet hole in the front of the president's neck when he arrived at Parkland Hospital because the tracheotomy incision had completely eliminated that evidence. While the autopsy was being performed, surgeons learned that a whole bullet had been found at Parkland Hospital on a stretcher which, at that time, was thought to be the stretcher occupied by the president. This led to speculation that the bullet might have penetrated a short distance into the back of the neck and then dropped out onto the stretcher as a result of the external heart massage. Further exploration during the autopsy disproved this theory. The surgeons determined that the bullet had passed between two large strap muscles and bruised them without leaving any channel, since the bullet merely passed between them. Commander Humes, who believed that a tracheotomy had been performed from his observations at the autopsy, talked by telephone with Dr. Perry early on the morning of November 23rd and learned that his assumption was correct and that Dr. Perry had used the missile wound in the neck as the point to make the incision. This confirmed the Bethesda surgeon's conclusion that the bullet had exited from the front part of the neck. The findings of the doctors who conducted the autopsy were consistent with the observations of the doctors who treated the president at Parkland Hospital. Dr. Charles S. Carrico, a resident surgeon at Parkland, noted a small wound approximately one-fourth of an inch in diameter, five to eight millimeters, in the lower third of the neck below the Adam's apple. Dr. Malcolm O. Perry, who performed the tracheotomy, described the wound as approximately one-fifth of an inch in diameter, five millimeters, and exuding blood which partially hid the edges that were neither clean-cut, that is, punched out, nor were they very ragged. Dr. Carrico testified as follows. Question. Based on your observations on the neck wound alone did have a sufficient basis to form an opinion as to whether it was entrance or an exit wound? Answer. No, sir, we did not. Not having completely evaluated all the wounds, traced out the course of the bullets, this wound would have been compatible with either entrance or exit wound depending upon the size, the velocity, the tissue structure, and so forth. The same response was made by Dr. Perry to a similar query. Question. Based on the appearance of the neck wound alone, could it have been either an entrance or an exit wound? Answer. It could have been either. Then each doctor was asked to take into account the other known facts, such as the autopsy findings, the approximate distance the bullet traveled, and tested muzzle velocity of the assassination weapon. With these additional factors, the doctors commented on the wound on the front of the president's neck as follows. Dr. Carrico. With those facts, and the fact as I understand it no other bullet was found, this would be, this was, I believe, an exit wound. Dr. Perry. A full jacketed bullet without deformation passing through skin would leave a similar wound for an exit and entrance wound, and with the facts which you have made available, and with those assumptions, I believe that it was an exit wound. Other doctors at Parkland Hospital who observed the wound prior to the tracheotomy agreed with the observations of doctors Perry and Carrico. The bullet wound in the neck could be seen for only a short time since Dr. Perry eliminated evidence of it 
when he performed the tracheotomy. He selected that spot since it was the point where such an operation was customarily performed, and it was one of the safest and easiest spots from which to reach the trachea. In addition, there was possibly an underlying wound to the muscles in the neck, the cartoid artery, or the jugular vein, and Dr. Perry concluded that the incision, therefore, had to be low in order to maintain respiration. Considerable confusion has arisen because of comments attributed to Dr. Perry concerning the nature of the neck wound. Immediately after the assassination, many people reached erroneous conclusions about the source of the shots because of Dr. Perry's observations to the press. On the afternoon of November 22nd, a press conference was organized at Parkland Hospital by members of the White House press staff and a hospital administrator. Newsmen with microphones and cameras were crowded into a room to hear statements by Drs. Perry and William Kemp Clark, chief neurosurgeon at Parkland, who had attended to President Kennedy's head injury. Dr. Perry described the situation as bedlam. The confusion was compounded by the fact that some questions were only partially answered before other questions were asked. At the news conference, Dr. Perry answered a series of hypothetical questions and stated to the press that a variety of possibilities could account for the president's wounds. He stated that a single bullet could have caused the president's wounds by entering through the throat, striking the spine, and being deflected upward, with the point of exit being through the head. This would have accounted for the two wounds he observed, the hole in the front of the neck and the large opening in the skull. At that time, Dr. Perry did not know about either the wound on the back of the president's neck or the small bullet hole wound in the back of the head. As described in Chapter 2, the president was lying on his back during his entire time at Parkland. The small hole in the head was also hidden from view by the large quantity of blood which covered the president's head. Dr. Perry said his answers at the press conference were intended to convey his theory about what could have happened, based on his limited knowledge at the time, rather than his professional opinion about what did happen. Commenting on his answers at the press conference, Dr. Perry testified before the commission. I expressed it, his answers, as a matter of speculation, that this was conceivable. But again, Dr. Clark, who also answered questions at the conference, and I emphasized that we had no way of knowing. Dr. Perry's recollection of his comments is corroborated by some of the news stories after the press conference. The New York Herald Tribune on November 23, 1963, reported as follows. Dr. Malcolm Perry, 34, attendant surgeon at Parkland Hospital, who attended the president, said he saw two wounds, one below the Adam's apple, the other at the back of the head. He said he did not know if two bullets were involved. It is possible, he said, that the neck wound was the entrance and the other the exit of the missile. According to this report, Dr. Perry stated merely that it was possible that the neck wound was a wound of entrance. This conforms with his testimony before the commission, where he stated that by themselves, the characteristics of the neck wound were consistent with being either a point of entry or exit. Wound Ballistics Tests Experiments performed by the Army Wound Ballistics Experts at Edgewood Arsenal, Maryland, discussed in Appendix 10, page 582, show that under simulated conditions, entry and exit wounds are very similar in appearance. After reviewing the path of the bullet through the president's neck, as disclosed in the autopsy report, the experts simulated the neck by using comparable material with a thickness of approximately 5.5 inches, 3.5 to 14.5 centimeters, which was the distance traversed by the bullet. Animal skin was placed on each side, and Western Cartridge Company's 6.5 bullets were fired from the C-2766 Manlicher Carcano rifle from a distance of 180 feet. The animal skin on the entry side showed holes which were regular and round. On the exit side, two holes were only slightly elongated, indicating that the bullet had become only a little unstable at the point of exit. A third exit hole was round, although not quite as regular as the entry holes. The exit holes, especially the one most nearly round, appeared similar to the descriptions given by Drs. Perry and Carrico of the hole in the front of the president's neck. The autopsy disclosed that the bullet which entered the back of the president's neck hit no bony structure and proceeded in a slightly downward angle. The markings on the president's clothing indicate that the bullet moved in a slight right-to-left lateral direction as it passed through the president's body. After the examining doctors expressed the thought that a bullet would have lost very little velocity in passing through the soft tissue of the neck, wound ballistics experts conducted tests to measure the exit velocity of the bullet. The tests were the same as those used to create entry and exit holes, supplemented by the use of brake-type screens, which measure the velocity of bullets. 
the entrance velocity of the bullet fired from the rifle averaged 1,904 feet per second after it traveled 180 feet. The exit velocity averaged 1,772 to 1,798 feet per second, depending upon the substance through which the bullet passed. A photograph of the path of the bullet traveling through the simulated neck showed that it proceeded in a straight line and was stable. Examination of Clothing The clothing worn by President Kennedy on November 22nd had holes and tears, which showed that a missile entered the back of his clothing in the vicinity of his lower neck and exited through the front of his shirt immediately behind his tie, nicking the knot of his tie in its forward flight. Although the caliber of the bullet could not be determined, and some of the clothing items precluded a positive determination that some tears were made by a bullet, all the defects could have been caused by a 6.5 millimeter bullet entering the back of the president's lower neck and exiting in the area of the knot of his tie. An examination of the suit jacket worn by the president by FBI agent Frazier revealed a roughly circular hole approximately one-fourth of an inch in diameter on the rear of the coat, five and three-eighths inches below the top of the collar and one and three-quarter inches to the right of the center back seam of the coat. The hole was visible on the upper rear of the coat slightly to the right of center. Traces of copper were found in the margins of the hole, and the cloth fibers around the margins were pushed inward. Those characteristics established that the hole was caused by an entering bullet. Although the precise size of the bullet could not be determined from the hole, it was consistent with having been made by a 6.5 millimeter bullet. The shirt worn by the president contained a hole on the back side, five and three quarter inches below the top of the collar, and one and one eighth inches to the right of the middle of the back of the shirt. The hole on the rear of the shirt was approximately circular in shape and about one fourth of an inch in diameter, with the fibers pressed inward. These factors established it as a bullet entrance hole. The relative position of the hole in the back of the suit jacket to the hole in the back of the shirt indicated that both were caused by the same penetrating missile. On the front of the shirt, examination revealed a hole seven-eighths of an inch below the collar button and a similar opening seven-eighths of an inch below the buttonhole. These two holes fell into alignment on overlapping positions when the shirt was buttoned. Each hole was a vertical, ragged slit approximately one-half of an inch in height, with the cloth fibers protruding outward. Although the characteristics of the slit established that the missile had exited to the front, the irregular nature of the slit precluded a positive determination that it was a bullet hole. However, the hole could have been caused by a round bullet, although the characteristics were not sufficiently clear to enable the examining expert to render a conclusive opinion. When the president's clothing was removed at Parkland Hospital, his tie was cut off by severing the loop immediately to the wearer's left of the knot, leaving the knot in its original condition. The tie had a nick on the left side of the knot. The nick was elongated horizontally, indicating that the tear was made by some object moving horizontally, but the fibers were not affected in a manner which would shed light on the direction or the nature of the missile. End of section 9 Section 10 of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 3. The Shots from the Texas School Book Depository, Part 4 The Governor's Wounds While riding in the right jump seat of the presidential limousine on November 22nd, Governor Connolly sustained wounds of the back, chest, right wrist, and left thigh. Because of the small size and clean-cut edges of the wound on the governor's back, Dr. Robert Shaw concluded that it was an entry wound. The bullet traversed the governor's chest in a downward angle, shattering his fifth rib and exiting below the right nipple. The ragged edges of the two-inch, five-centimeter opening on the front of the chest led Dr. Shaw to conclude that it was the exit point of the bullet. When Governor Connolly testified before the commission five months after the assassination, on April 21, 1964, the commission observed the governor's chest wounds, as well as the injuries to his wrist and thigh, and watched Dr. Shaw measure with a caliper and angle of declination of 25 degrees 
from the point of entry on the back to the point of exit on the front of the governor's chest. At the time of the shooting, Governor Connolly was unaware that he had sustained any injuries other than his chest wounds. On the back of his arm, about two inches, five centimeters, above the wrist joint on the thumb side, Dr. Charles F. Gregory observed a linear perforating wound approximately one-fifth of an inch, one-half centimeter, wide, and one inch, two and one-half centimeters, long. During his operation on this injury, the doctor concluded that this ragged wound was the point of entry because thread and cloth had been carried into the wound to the region of the bone. Dr. Gregory's conclusions were also based upon the location in the governor's wrist, as revealed by X-ray, of small fragments of metal shed by the missile upon striking the firm surface of the bone. Evidence of different amounts of air in the tissues of the wrist gave further indication that the bullet passed from the back to the front of the wrist. An examination of the palm surface of the wrist showed a wound approximately one-fifth of an inch, one-half centimeter, long, and approximately three-fourths of an inch, two centimeters, above the crease of the right wrist. Dr. Shaw had initially believed that the missile entered on the palm side of the governor's wrist and exited on the back side. After reviewing the factors considered by Dr. Gregory, however, Dr. Shaw withdrew his earlier opinion. He deferred to the judgment of Dr. Gregory, who had more closely examined the wound during the wrist operation. In addition, Governor Connolly suffered a puncture wound in the left thigh that was approximately two-fifths of an inch, one centimeter in diameter, and located approximately five or six inches above the governor's knee. On the governor's leg, very little soft tissue damage was noted, which indicated a tangential wound, or the penetration of a larger missile entering at low velocity and stopping after entering the skin. X-ray examination disclosed a tiny metallic fragment embedded in the governor's leg. The surgeons who attended the governor concluded that the thigh wound was not caused by the small fragment in the thigh, but resulted from the impact of a larger missile. Examination of Clothing The clothing worn by Governor Connolly on November 22, 1963, contained holes which matched his wounds. On the back of the governor's coat, a hole was found one and one-eighth inches from the seam where the right sleeve attached to the coat, and seven and one-quarter inches to the right of the midline. This hole was elongated in a horizontal direction approximately five-eighths of an inch in length and one-fourth of an inch in height. The front side of the governor's coat contained a circular hole three-eighths of an inch in diameter, located five inches to the right of the front right edge of the coat, slightly above the top button. A rough hole approximately five-eighths of an inch in length and three-eighths of an inch in width was found near the end of the right sleeve. Each of these holes could have been caused by a bullet, but a positive determination of this fact or the direction of the missile was not possible because the garment had been cleaned and pressed prior to any opportunity for scientific examination. An examination of the governor's shirt disclosed a very ragged tear five-eighths of an inch long horizontally and one-half of an inch vertically on the back of the shirt near the right sleeve two inches from the line where the sleeve attaches. Immediately to the right was another small tear approximately three-sixteenths of an inch long the two holes corresponded in position to the hole in the back of the governor's coat. A very irregular tear in the form of an H was observed on the front side of the governor's shirt, approximately one and one-half inches high, with a crossbar approximately one inch wide, located five inches from the right side seam and nine inches from the top of the right sleeve. Because the shirt had been laundered, there was insufficient characteristics for the expert examiner to form a conclusive opinion on the direction or nature of the object causing the holes. The rear hole could have been caused by the entrance of a 6.5 millimeter bullet and the front hole by the exit of such a bullet. On the French cuff of the right sleeve of the governor's shirt was a ragged, irregularly shaped hole located one and a half inches from the end of the sleeve and five and one half inches from the outside cuff link hole. The characteristics after laundering did not permit positive conclusions, but these holes could have been caused by a bullet passing through the governor's right wrist from the back to the front sides. The governor's trousers contained a hole approximately one-fourth of an inch in diameter in the region of the left knee. The roughly circular shape of the hole and the slight tearing away from the edges gave the hole the general appearance of a bullet hole, but it was not possible to determine the direction of the missile which caused the hole. Course of Bullet Ballistics experts and medical findings established that the missile which passed through the governor's wrist 
and penetrated his thigh had first traversed his chest the army wound ballistics experts conducted tests which proved that the governor's wrist wound was not caused by a pristine bullet see appendix 10 pages 582 to 585 a bullet is pristine immediately on exiting from a rifle muzzle when it moves in a straight line with a spinning motion and maintains its uniform trajectory with but a minimum of nose surface striking the air through which it passes when the straight line of flight of a bullet is deflected by striking some object it starts to wobble or become irregular in flight a condition called yaw a bullet with yaw has a greater surface exposed to the striking material or air since the target or air is struck not only by the nose of the bullet its smallest striking surface but also by the bullet's sides the ballistics experts learned the exact nature of the governor's wrist wound by examining parkland hospital records and x-rays and conferring with dr gregory the c2766 manlicher carcano rifle found in the depository was fired with bullets of the same type as a bullet found on the governor's stretcher and the fragments found in the president's limousine shots were fired from a distance of seventy yards at comparable flesh and bone protected by material similar to the clothing worn by the governor one of the test shots wounded the comparable flesh and bone structure in virtually the same place and from the same angle as the wound inflicted on governor connolly's wrist an x-ray and photograph of the simulated wrist confirmed the similarity the bullet which inflicted that injury during the tests had a nose which was substantially flattened from striking the material the striking velocity at seventy yards of seven shots fired during the tests averaged one thousand eight hundred and fifty eight feet per second the average exit velocity of five shots was one thousand seven hundred and seventy six feet per second the conclusion that the governor's wrist was not struck by a pristine bullet was based upon the following one greater damage was inflicted on the test material than on the governor's wrist. 2. The test material had a smaller entry wound and a larger exit wound, characteristic of a pristine bullet, while the governor's wrist had a larger entry wound as compared with its exit wound, indicating a bullet which was tumbling. 3. Cloth was carried into the wrist wound, which is characteristic of an irregular missile. 4. The partial cutting of a radial nerve and tendon leading to the governor's thumb further suggested that the bullet which struck him was not pristine since such a bullet would merely push aside a tendon and nerve rather than catch and tear them five the bullet found on the governor's stretcher probably did not pass through the wrist as a pristine bullet because its nose was not considerably flattened as was the case with the pristine bullet which struck the simulated wrist and six the bullet which caused the governor's thigh injury and then fell out of the wound had a very low velocity whereas the pristine bullets fired during the tests possessed a very high exit velocity. All the evidence indicated that the bullet found on the governor's stretcher could have caused all his wounds. The weight of the whole bullet prior to firing was approximately 160 to 161 grains, and that of the recovered bullet was 158.6 grains. An x-ray of the governor's wrist showed very minute metallic fragments, and two or three of these fragments were removed from his wrist. All these fragments were sufficiently small and light so that the nearly whole bullet found on the stretcher could have deposited those pieces of metal as it tumbled through his wrist. In their testimony, the three doctors who attended Governor Connolly at Parkland Hospital expressed independently their opinion that a single bullet had passed through his chest, tumbled through his wrist with very little exit velocity, leaving small metal fragments from the rear portion of the bullet, punctured his left thigh after the bullet had lost virtually all its velocity, and had fallen out of the leg wound. Governor Connolly himself thought it likely that all his wounds were caused by a single bullet. In his testimony before the commission, he repositioned himself as he recalled his position on the jump seat with his right palm on his left thigh, and he said, I wound up the next day realizing I was hit in three places, and I was not conscious of having been hit but by one bullet, so I tried to reconstruct how I could have been hit in three places by the same bullet, and merely, I know it penetrated from the back through the chest first. I assumed that I had turned, as I described a moment ago, placing my right hand on my left leg, and that it hit my wrist, went out the center of the wrist, the underside, and then into my leg, but it might not have happened that way at all. The governor's 
posture explained how a single missile through his body would cause all his wounds. His doctors at Parkland Hospital had recreated his position also, but they placed his right arm somewhat higher than his left thigh, although in the same alignment. The wound ballistics experts concurred in the opinion that a single bullet caused all the governor's wounds. The Trajectory the cumulative evidence of eyewitnesses, firearms and ballistic experts, and medical authorities demonstrated that the shots were fired from above and behind President Kennedy and Governor Connolly, more particularly from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building. In order to determine the facts with as much precision as possible and to ensure that all data were consistent with shots having been fired from the sixth floor window, the Commission requested additional investigation including the analysis of motion picture films of the assassination and on-site tests. The facts developed through this investigation by the FBI and Secret Service confirmed the conclusions reached by the Commission regarding the source and trajectory of the shots which hit the President and the Governor. Moreover, these facts enabled the Commission to make certain approximations regarding the locations of the presidential limousine at the time of the shots and the relevant time intervals. Films and Tests when the shots rang out, the presidential limousine was moving beyond the Texas School Book Depository Building in a southwesterly direction on Elm Street between Houston Street and the Triple Underpass. The general location of the car was described and marked on maps by eyewitnesses as precisely as their observations and recollections permitted. More exact information was provided by motion pictures taken by Abraham Zapruder, Orville O. Nix, and Mary Muchmore, who were spectators at the scene. Substantial light has been shed on the assassination sequence by viewing these motion pictures, particularly the Zapruder film, which was the most complete and from which individual 35mm slides were made of each motion picture frame. Examination of the Zapruder motion picture camera by the FBI established that 18.3 pictures or frames were taken each second, and therefore the timing of certain events could be calculated by allowing 1 over 18.3 seconds for the action depicted from one frame to the next. The films and slides made from individual frames were viewed by Governor and Mrs. Connolly, the Governor's doctors, the autopsy surgeons, and the Army wound ballistics scientists in order to apply the knowledge of each to determine the precise course of events. Tests of the assassin's rifle disclosed that at least 2.8 seconds were required between shots. In evaluating the films in light of these timing guides, it was kept in mind that a victim of a bullet wound may not react immediately, and, in some situations, according to experts, the victim may not even know where he has been hit or when. On March 24, 1964, agents of the FBI and Secret Service conducted a series of tests to determine as precisely as possible what happened on November 22, 1963. Since the presidential limousine was being remodeled and was therefore unavailable, it was simulated by using the Secret Service follow-up car, which is similar in design. Any differences were taken into account. Two bureau agents with approximately the same physical characteristics sat in the car in the same relative positions as President Kennedy and Governor Connolly had occupied. The back of the stand-in for the president was marked with chalk at the point where the bullet entered. The governor's model had on the same coat worn by Governor Connolly when he was shot, with the hole in the back circled in chalk. To stimulate the conditions which existed at the assassination scene on November 22nd, the lower part of the sixth floor window at the southeast corner of the depository building was raised halfway. The cardboard boxes were repositioned. The C-2766 Manlicher Carcano rifle found on the sixth floor of the depository was used, and mounted on that rifle was a camera which recorded the view as was seen by the assassin. In addition, the Zapruder, Nix, and much more cameras were on hand so that photographs taken by these cameras from the same locations where they were used on November 22, 1963, could be compared with the films of that date. The agents ascertained that the foliage of an oak tree that came between the gunman and his target along the motorcade route on Elm Street was approximately the same as on the day of the assassination. The first bullet that hit. The position of President Kennedy's car when he was struck in the neck was determined with substantial precision from the films and on-site tests. The pictures or frames in the Zapruder film were marked by the agents, with the number one given to the first frame where the motorcycles leading the motorcade came into view on Houston Street. 
The numbers continue in sequence as Zapruder filmed the presidential limousine as it came around the corner and proceeded down Elm. The president was in clear view of the assassin as he rode up Houston Street and for 100 feet as he proceeded down Elm Street until he came to a point denoted as frame 166 on the Zapruder film. These facts were determined in the test by placing the car and men on Elm Street in the exact spot where they were when each frame of the Zapruder film was photographed. To pinpoint their locations, a man stood at Zapruder's position and directed the automobile and both models to the position shown on each frame, after which a bureau photographer crouched at the sixth floor window and looked through a camera whose lens recorded the view through the telescopic sight of the C-2766 Manlikur-Carcano rifle. See Commission Exhibit Number 887, page 99. Each position was measured to determine how far President Kennedy had gone down Elm from a point which was designated as Station C on a line drawn along the west curb line of Houston Street. Based on these calculations, the agents concluded that at frame 166 of the Zapruder film, the President passed beneath the foliage of the large oak tree, and the point of impact on the President's back disappeared from the gunman's view as seen through the telescopic lens. See Commission Exhibit Number 889, page 100. For a fleeting instant, the President came back into view in the telescopic lens at frame 186 as he appeared in an opening among the leaves. See Commission Exhibit Number 891, page 101. The test revealed that the next point at which the rifleman had a clear view through the telescopic sight of the point where the bullet entered the President's back was when the car emerged from behind the tree at frame 210. See Commission Exhibit Number 893, page 102. According to FBI agent Lyndall L. Shanifelt, there is no obstruction from the sixth floor window from the time they leave the tree until they disappear down toward the triple underpass. As the president rode along Elm Street for a distance of about 140 feet, he was waving to the crowd. Shanifelt testified that the waving is seen on the Zapruder movie until about frame 205, when road sign blocked out most of the president's body from Zapruder's view through the lens of his camera. However, the assassin continued to have a clear view of the president as he proceeded down Elm. When President Kennedy again came fully into view in the Zapruder film at frame 225, he seemed to be reacting to his neck wound by raising his hands to his throat. See Commission Exhibit 895, page 103. According to Shanifelt, the reaction was clearly apparent in 226 and barely apparent in 225. It is probable that the president was not shot before frame 210, since it is unlikely that the assassin would deliberately have shot at him with a view obstructed by the oak tree when he was about to have a clear opportunity. It is also doubtful that even the most proficient marksman would have hit him through the oak tree. In addition, the president's reaction is barely apparent in frame 225, which is 15 frames or approximately 8 tenths second after frame 210. And a shot much before 210 would assume a longer reaction time than was recalled by eyewitnesses at the scene. Thus, the evidence indicated that the president was not hit until at least frame 210 and that he was probably hit by frame 225. The possibility of variations in reaction time, in addition to the obstruction of Zapruder's view by the sign, precluded a more specific determination that the president was probably shot through the neck between frames 210 and 225, which marked his position between 138.9 and 153.8 feet west of Station C. According to Special Agent Robert A. Frazier, who occupied the position of the assassin in the sixth floor window during the reenactment, it is likely that the bullet which passed through the president's neck, as described previously, then struck the automobile or something else in the automobile. The minute examination by the FBI inspection team, conducted in Washington between 14 and 16 hours after the assassination, revealed no damage indicating that a bullet had struck any part of the interior of the president's limousine, with the exception of the cracking of the windshield and the dent of the windshield chrome. Neither of these points of damage to the car could have been caused by the bullet which exited from the president's neck at a velocity of 1,772 to 1,779 feet per second. If the trajectory had permitted the bullet to strike the windshield, 
the bullet would have penetrated it and traveled a substantial distance down the road unless it struck some other object en route had that bullet struck the metal framing which was dented it would have torn a hole in the chrome and penetrated the framing both inside and outside the car at that exit velocity the bullet would have penetrated any other metal or upholstery surface of the interior of the automobile the bullet that hit president kennedy in the back and exited through his throat most likely could not have missed both the automobile and its occupants since it did not hit the automobile fraser testified that it probably struck governor connolly the relative positions of president kennedy and governor connolly at the time when the president was struck in the neck confirmed that the same bullet probably passed through both men pictures taken of the president's limousine on october twenty second nineteen sixty three show that the governor sat immediately in front of the president even though the precise distance cannot be ascertained it is apparent that president kennedy was somewhat to the governor's right the president sat on the extreme right as noted in the films and by eyewitnesses while the right edge of the jump seat in which the governor sat is six inches from the right door see commission exhibit number six ninety seven page one o four the president wore a back brace which tended to make him sit up straight and the governor also sat erect since the jump seat gave him little leg room based on his observations during the reenactment and the position of governor connolly showed in the zapruder film after the car emerged from behind the sign fraser testified that governor connolly was in a position during the span from frame two o seven to frame two twenty five to receive a bullet which would have caused the wounds he actually suffered governor connolly viewed the film and testified that he was hit between frames two thirty one and two thirty four according to fraser between frames two thirty five and two forty the governor turned sharply to his right so that by frame two forty he was too far to the right to have received his injuries at that time at some point between frames two thirty five and two forty therefore is the last occasion when governor connolly could have received his injuries since in the frames following two forty he remained turned too far to his right if governor connolly was hit by a separate shot between frames two thirty five and two forty which followed the shot which hit the president's neck it would follow that one the assassin's first shot assuming a minimum firing time of two point three seconds or forty two frames was fired between frames one ninety three and one ninety eight when his view was obscured by the oak tree two president kennedy continued waving to the crowd after he was hit and did not begin to react for about one and a half seconds and three the first shot although hitting no bones in the president's body was deflected after its exit from the president's neck in such a way that it failed to hit either the automobile or any of the other occupants viewed through the telescopic sight of the c two seven six six manlicker carcano rifle from the sixth floor window during the test the marks that simulated the entry wounds on the stand-ins for the president and the governor were generally in a straight line that alignment became obvious to the viewer through the scope as the governor's model turned slightly to his right and assumed the position which governor connolly had described as his position when he was struck viewing the stand-ins for the president and the governor in the sight of the c two seven six six manlicker carcano rifle at the location depicted in frames two o seven and two ten fraser testified they both are in direct alignment with the telescopic sight at the window the governor is immediately behind the president in the field of view see commission exhibit number eight ninety three page one o two a surveyor then placed his sighting equipment at the precise point of entry on the back of the president's neck assuming that the president was struck at frame two ten and measured the angle to the end of the muzzle of the rifle positioned where it was believed to have been held by the assassin that angle measured twenty one degrees thirty four minutes from the same points of reference the angle at frame two twenty five was measured at twenty degrees eleven giving an average angle of twenty degrees fifty two minutes and thirty seconds from frame two ten to frame two twenty five allowing for a downward street grade of three hundred and nine feet the probable angle through the president's body was calculated at seventeen degrees forty three minutes and thirty seconds assuming that he was sitting in a vertical position that angle was consistent with the trajectory of a bullet passing through the president's neck and then striking governor connolly's back causing the wounds which were discussed above shortly after that angle was ascertained the open car and the stand-ins were taken by the agents to a nearby garage where a photograph was taken to determine through closer study whether the angle of that shot could have accounted for the wounds in the president's neck 
and the governor's back. A rod was placed at an angle of 17 degrees, 43 minutes, 30 seconds, next to the stand-ins for the president and the governor, who were seated in the same relative positions. The wounds of entry and exit on the president were approximately based on information gained from the autopsy reports and photographs. The hole in the back of the jacket worn by the governor and the medical description of the wound on his back marked that entry point. That line of fire from the sixth floor of the depository would have caused the bullet to exit under the governor's right nipple, just as the bullet did. Governor Connolly's doctors measured an angle of declination on his body from the entry wound on his back to the exit wound on the front of his chest at about 25 degrees when he sat erect. The difference was explained by either a slight deflection of the bullet caused by striking the fifth rib, or the governor's leaning slightly backward at the time he was struck. In addition, the angle could not be fixed with absolute precision, since the large wound on the front of his chest precluded an exact determination of the point of exit. The alignment of the points of entry was only indicative and not conclusive that one bullet hit both men. The exact positions of the men could not be recreated. Thus, the angle could only be approximated. Had President Kennedy been leaning forward or backward, the angle of declination of the shot to a perpendicular target would have varied. The angle of 17 degrees 40 minutes 30 seconds was approximately the angle of declination reproduced in an artist's drawing. That drawing, being made from data provided by the autopsy surgeons, could not reproduce the exact line of the bullet, since the exit wound was obliterated by the tracheotomy. Similarly, if the president or the governor had been sitting in a different lateral position, the conclusion might have varied, or if the governor had not turned in exactly the way calculated, the alignment would have been destroyed. Additional experiments by the Army Wound Ballistics Branch further suggested that the same bullet probably passed through both President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. See Appendix 10, pages 582 to 585. Correlation of a test simulating the governor's chest wound with the neck and wrist experiments indicated that course. After reviewing the Parkland Hospital medical records and x-rays of the governor and discussing his chest injury with the attending surgeon, the Army ballistics experts virtually duplicated the wound using the assassination weapon and animal flesh covered by cloth. The bullet that struck the animal flesh displayed characteristics similar to the bullet found on Governor Connolly's stretcher. Moreover, the imprint on the velocity screen immediately behind the animal flesh showed that the bullet was tumbling after exiting from the flesh, having lost a total average of 265 feet per second. Taking into consideration the governor's size, the reduction in velocity of a bullet passing through his body would be approximately 400 feet per second. Based upon the medical evidence on the wounds of the governor and the president and the wound ballistics tests performed at Edgewood Arsenals, Drs. Oliver and Arthur J. Zemain, chief of the Army Wound Ballistics Branch, who had spent 17 years in that area of specialization, concluded that it was probable that the same bullet passed through the president's neck and then inflicted all the wounds on the governor. Referring to the president's neck wound and all the governor's wounds, Dr. Zemain testified, I think the probability is very good that it is, that all the wounds were caused by one bullet. Both Drs. Zemain and Oliver believed that the wound on the governor's wrist would have been more extensive had the bullet which inflicted that injury merely passed through the governor's chest exiting at a velocity of approximately 1,500 feet per second. Thus, the governor's wrist wound suggested that the bullet passed through the president's neck, began to yaw in the air between the president and the governor, and then lost more velocity than 400 feet per second in passing through the governor's chest. A bullet which was yawing on entering into the governor's back would lose substantially more velocity in passing through his body than a pristine bullet. In addition, the bullet that struck the animal flesh was flattened to a greater extent than the bullet which presumably struck the governor's rib, which suggested that the bullet which entered the governor's chest had already lost velocity by passing through the president's neck. Moreover, the large wound on the governor's back would be explained by a bullet which was yawing, although that type of wound might also be accounted for by a tangential striking. Dr. Frederick W. Light, Jr., the third of the wound ballistics experts, who has been engaged in the specialty at Edgewood Arsenal since 1951, 
testified that the anatomical findings were insufficient for him to formulate a firm opinion as to whether the same bullet did or did not pass through the president's neck first before inflicting all the wounds on governor Connolly. based on the other circumstances such as the relative positions of the president and the governor in the automobile dr light concluded that it was probable that the same bullet traversed the president's neck and inflicted all the wounds on governor Connolly. end of section ten Section 11 of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 3. The Shots from the Texas School Book Depository, Part 5. The subsequent bullet that hit. After a bullet penetrated President Kennedy's neck, a subsequent shot entered the back of his head and exited through the upper right portion of his skull. The Zapruder, Nix, and much more films show the instant in the sequence when that bullet struck. See Commission Exhibit Number 902, page 108. That impact was evident from the explosion of the President's brain tissues from the right side of his head. The immediately preceding frame from the Zapruder film shows the president slumped to his left, clutching at his throat, with his chin close to his chest, and his head tilted forward at an angle. Based upon information provided by the doctors who conducted the autopsy, an artist's drawing depicting the path of the bullet through the president's head, with his head being in the same approximate position. By using the Zapruder, Nix, and much more motion pictures, the President's location at the time the bullet penetrated his head was fixed with reasonable precision. A careful analysis of the Nix and much more films led to fixing the exact location of these cameramen. The point of impact of the bullet on the President's head was apparent in all the movies. At that point in the Nix film, a straight line was plotted from the camera position to a fixed point in the background, and the President's location along this line was marked on a plat map. A similar process was followed with the much more film. The president's location on the plat map was identical to that determined from the Nix film. The president's location, established through the Nix and much more films, was confirmed by comparing his position on the Zapruder film. This location had hitherto only been approximated, since there were no landmarks in the background of the Zapruder frame for alignment purposes other than a portion of a painted line on the curb. Through these procedures, it was determined that President Kennedy was shot in the head when he was 230.8 feet from a point on the west curb line on Houston Street, where it intersected with Elm Street. The President was 265.3 feet from the rifle in the sixth floor window, and at that position the approximate angle of declination was 15 degrees 21 minutes. Number of Shots The consensus among the witnesses at the scene was that three shots were fired. However, some heard only two shots, while others testified that they heard four and perhaps as many as five or six shots. The difficulty of accurate perception of the sound of gunshots required careful scrutiny of all of this testimony regarding the number of shots. The firing of a bullet causes a number of noises. The muzzle blast, caused by the smashing of the hot gases which propel the bullet into the relatively stable air at the gun's muzzle. The noise of the bullet, caused by the shock wave built up ahead of the bullet's nose as it travels through the air, and the noise caused by the impact of the bullet on its target. Each noise can be quite sharp and may be perceived as a separate shot. The tall buildings in the area might have further distorted the sound. The physical and other evidence examined by the Commission compels the conclusion that at least two shots were fired. As discussed previously, the nearly whole bullet discovered at Parkland Hospital and the two larger fragments found in the presidential automobile, which were identified as coming from the assassination rifle, came from at least two separate bullets and possibly from three. The most convincing evidence relating to the number of shots was provided by the presence on the sixth floor of three spent cartridges, which were demonstrated to have been fired by the same rifle that fired the bullets which caused the wounds. It is possible that the assassin carried an empty shell in the rifle and fired only two shots, with the witnesses hearing multiple noises made by the same shot. Soon after the three empty cartridges were found, officials at the scene decided that three shots were fired, and that conclusion was widely circulated by the press. 
the eyewitness testimony may be subconsciously colored by the extensive publicity given the conclusion that three shots were fired nevertheless the preponderance of the evidence in particular the three spent cartridges led the commission to conclude that there were three shots fired the shot that missed from the initial findings that a one shot passed through the president's neck and then most probably passed through the governor's body b a subsequent shot penetrated the president's head c no other shot struck any part of the automobile and d three shots were fired it follows that one shot probably missed the car and its occupants the evidence is inconclusive as to whether it was the first second or third shot which missed the first shot if the first shot missed the assassin perhaps missed in an effort to fire a hurried shot before the president passed under the oak tree or possibly he fired as the president passed under the tree and the tree obstructed his view the bullet might have struck a portion of the tree and been completely deflected on the other hand the greatest cause for doubt that the first shot missed is the improbability that the same marksman who twice hit a moving target would be so inaccurate on the first and closest of his shots as to miss completely not only the target but the large automobile some support for the contention that the first shot missed is found in the statement of secret service agent glenn a bennett stationed in the right rear seat of the president's follow-up car who heard a sound like a firecracker as the motorcade proceeded down elm street at that moment agent bennett stated i looked at the back of the president i heard another firecracker noise and saw that shot hit the president about four inches down from the right shoulder a second shot followed immediately and hit the right rear high of the president's head substantial weight may be given to bennett's observations although his formal statement was dated november twenty third nineteen sixty three his notes indicate that he recorded what he saw and heard at five thirty p m november nineteen sixty three on the airplane en route back to washington prior to the autopsy when it was not yet known that the president had been hit in the back it is possible of course that bennett did not observe the hole in the president's back which might have been there immediately after the first noise governor connolly's testimony supports the view that the first shot missed because he stated that he heard a shot turned slightly to his right and as he started to turn back toward his left was struck by the second bullet he never saw the president during the shooting sequence and it is entirely possible that he heard the missed shot and that both men were struck by the second bullet mrs connolly testified that after the first shot she turned and saw the president's hands moving toward his throat as seen in the films at frame two hundred and twenty five however mrs connolly further stated that she thought her husband was hit immediately thereafter by a second bullet if the same bullet struck both the president and the governor it is entirely possible that she saw the president's movements at the same time as she heard the second shot her testimony therefore does not preclude the possibility of the first shot having missed other eyewitness testimony however supports the conclusion that the first of the shots fired hit the president as discussed in chapter two special agent hill's testimony indicates that the president was hit by the first shot and that the head injury was caused by a second shot which followed about five seconds later james w atkins a photographer in dallas for the associated press had stationed himself on elm street opposite the depository to take pictures of the passing motorcade atkins took a widely circulated photograph which showed president kennedy reacting to the first of the two shots which hit him see commission exhibit number nine hundred page one thirteen according to atkins he snapped the picture almost simultaneously with a shot which he is confident was the first one fired comparison of his photograph with the zapruder film however revealed that atkins took his picture at approximately the same moment as frame two hundred and fifty five of the movie thirty to forty five frames approximately two seconds later than the point at which the president was shot in the neck see commission exhibit number nine hundred one page one hundred fourteen another photographer philip l willis snapped a picture at a time which he also asserts was simultaneous with the first shot analysis of his photograph revealed that it was taken at approximately frame two hundred and ten of the zapruder film which was the approximate time of the shot that probably hit the president and the governor if willis accurately recalled that there were no previous shots this would be strong evidence that the first shot did not miss if the first shot did not miss there must be an explanation for governor connolly's recollection that he was not hit by it there was conceivably a delayed reaction between the time the bullet struck him and the time he realized that he was hit despite the fact that the bullet struck a glancing blow to a rib and penetrated his wrist bone 
the governor did not even know that he had been struck in the wrist or the thigh until he regained consciousness in the hospital the next day moreover he testified that he did not hear what he thought was the second shot although he did hear a subsequent shot which coincided with the shattering of the president's head one possibility therefore would be a sequence in which the governor heard the first shot did not immediately feel the penetration of the bullet then felt the delayed reaction of the impact on his back later heard the shot which shattered the president's head and then lost consciousness without hearing a third shot which might have occurred later the second shot the possibility that the second shot missed is consistent with the elapsed time between the two shots that hit their mark from the timing evidenced by the zapruder films there was an interval of from four point eight to five point six seconds between the shot which struck president kennedy's neck between frames two ten and two twenty five and the shot which struck his head at frame eight thirteen since a minimum of two point three seconds must elapse between shots a bullet could have been fired from the rifle and missed during this interval this possibility was buttressed by the testimony of witnesses who claimed that the shots were evenly spaced since a second shot occurring within an interval of approximately five seconds would have to be almost exactly midway in this period if Aldigan's recollection is correct that he snapped his picture at the same moment as he heard a shot then it is possible that he heard a second shot which missed since a shot fired two point three seconds before he took his picture at frame two fifty five could have hit the president at about frame two thirteen on the other hand a substantial majority of the witnesses stated that the shots were not evenly spaced most witnesses recalled that the second and third shots were bunched together although some believed that it was the first and second which were bunched to the extent that reliance can be placed on recollection of witnesses as to the spacing of the shots the testimony that the shots were not evenly spaced would militate against a second shot missing another factor arguing against the second shot missing is that the gunman would have been shooting at very near the minimum allowable time to have fired three shots within four point eight to five point six seconds although it was entirely possible for him to have done so see chapter four pages one eighty eight to one ninety four the third shot the last possibility of course is that it was the third shot which missed this conclusion conforms most easily with the probability that the assassin would most likely have missed the farthest shot particularly since there was an acceleration of the automobile after the shot which struck the president's head the limousine also changed direction by following the curve to the right whereas previously it had been proceeding in almost a straight line with a rifle protruding from the sixth floor window of the depository building one must consider however the testimony of the witnesses who described the headshot as the concluding event in the assassination sequence illustrative is the testimony of associated press photographer altgens who had an excellent vantage point near the president's car he recalled that the shot which hit the president's head was the last shot that much i will say with a great degree of certainty on the other hand emmett j hudson the groundskeeper of dealey plaza testified that from his position on elm street midway between houston street and the triple underpass he heard a third shot after the shot which hit the president in the head in addition mrs kennedy's testimony indicated that neither the first nor the second shot missed immediately after the first noise she turned because of the governor's yell and saw her husband raise his hand to his forehead then the second shot struck the president's head some evidence suggested that a third shot may have entirely missed and hit the turf or street by the triple underpass royce g skelton who watched the motorcade from the railroad bridge testified that after two shots the car came on down close to the triple underpass and an additional shot hit in the left front of the president's car on the cement skelton thought that there had been a total of four shots either the third or fourth of which hit in the vicinity of the underpass dallas patrolman j w foster who was also on the triple underpass testified that a shot hit the turf near a manhole cover in the vicinity of the underpass examination of this area however disclosed no indication that a bullet struck at the locations indicated by skelton or foster at a different location on dealey plaza the evidence indicated that a bullet fragment did hit the street james t Togg, who got out of his car to watch the motorcade from a position between commerce and main streets near the triple underpass was hit on the cheek by an object during the shooting 
Within a few minutes, Tog reported this to Deputy Sheriff Eddie R. Walthers, who was examining the area to see if any bullets had struck the turf. Walthers immediately started to search where Tog had been standing and located a place on the south curb of Main Street where it appeared a bullet had hit the cement. According to Tog, there was a mark quite obviously that was a bullet, and it was very fresh. In Tog's opinion, it was the second shot which caused the mark, since he thinks he heard the third shot after he was hit in the face. This incident appears to have been recorded in the contemporaneous report of Dallas Patrolman L. L. Hill, who radioed in around 12.40 p.m. I have one guy that was possibly hit by a ricochet from the bullet off the concrete. Scientific examination of the mark on the south curb of Main Street by FBI experts disclosed metal smears, which were spectrographically determined to be essentially lead, with a trace of antimony. The mark on the curb could have originated from the lead core of a bullet, but the absence of copper precluded the possibility that the mark on the curbing section was made by an unmutilated military full metal jacketed bullet, such as the bullet from Governor Connolly's stretcher. It is true that the noise of a subsequent shot might have been drowned out by the siren on the Secret Service follow-up car immediately after the headshot, or the dramatic effect of the headshot might have caused so much confusion that the memory of subsequent events was blurred. Nevertheless, the preponderance of the eyewitness testimony that the headshot was the final shot must be weighed in any determination as to whether it was the third shot that missed. Even if it were caused by a bullet fragment, the mark on the south curb of Main Street cannot be identified conclusively with any of the three shots fired. Under the circumstances, it might have come from the bullet which hit the president's head, or it might have been a product of the fragmentation of the missed shot upon hitting some other object in the area. Since he did not observe any of the shots striking the president, Tog's testimony that the second shot, rather than the third, caused the scratch on his cheek does not assist in limiting the possibilities. The wide range of possibilities and the existence of conflicting testimony, when coupled with the impossibility of scientific verification, precludes a conclusive finding by the commission as to which shot missed. Time span of shots. Witnesses at the assassination scene said that the shots were fired within a few seconds, with the general estimate being five to six seconds. That approximation was most probably based on the earlier publicized reports that the first shot struck the president in the neck, the second wounded the governor, and the third shattered the president's head with the time span from the neck to the head shots on the president being approximately five seconds. As previously indicated, the time span between the shots entering the back of the president's neck and the bullet which shattered his skull was 4.8 to 5 seconds. If the shot missed, then 4.8 to 5 seconds was the total time span of the shots. If either the first or third shot missed, then a minimum of 2.3 seconds, necessary to operate the rifle, must be added to the time span of the shots which hit, giving a minimum time of 7.1 to 7.9 seconds for all three shots. If more than 2.3 seconds elapsed between a shot that missed and one that hit, then the time span would be correspondingly increased. Conclusion Based on the evidence analyzed in this chapter, the Commission has concluded that the shots which killed President Kennedy and wounded Governor Connolly were fired from the sixth floor window at the southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository Building. Two bullets probably caused all the wounds suffered by President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. Since the preponderance of the evidence indicated that three shots were fired, the Commission concluded that one shot probably missed the presidential limousine and its occupants, and that the three shots were fired in a time period ranging from approximately 4.8 to in excess of seven seconds. End of section 11. Section 12 of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by... The President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 4. The Assassin. Part 1. The preceding chapter has established that the bullets which killed President Kennedy and wounded Governor Connolly 
were fired from the southeast corner window of the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building, and that the weapon which fired these bullets was a Manlicker Carcano 6.5 millimeter Italian rifle bearing the serial number C2766. In this chapter, the Commission evaluates the evidence upon which it has based its conclusion concerning the identity of the assassin. This evidence includes 1. The ownership and possession of the weapon used to commit the assassination. 2. The means by which the weapon was brought into the depository building. 3. The identity of the person present at the window from which the shots were fired. 4. The killing of Dallas Patrolman J.D. Tippett within 45 minutes after the assassination. 5. The resistance to arrest and the attempted shooting of another police officer by the man, Lee Harvey Oswald, subsequently accused of assassinating President Kennedy and killing Patrolman Tippett. 6. The lies told to the police by Oswald. 7. The evidence linking Oswald to the attempted killing of Major General Edwin A. Walker, resigned U.S. Army, on April 10, 1963. And 8. Oswald's capability with a rifle. Ownership and Possession of Assassination Weapon Purchase of Rifle by Oswald Shortly after the Manlicker Carcano rifle was found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building, agents of the FBI learned from retail outlets in Dallas that Crescent Firearms, Inc. of New York City was a distributor of surplus Italian 6.5 millimeter military rifles. During the evening of November 22, 1963, a review of the records of Crescent Firearms revealed that the firm had shipped an Italian carbine, serial number C2766, to Klein's Sporting Goods Company of Chicago, Illinois. After searching their records from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., the officers of Klein's discovered that a rifle bearing serial number C2766 had been shipped to 1A Hidel, Post Office Box 2915, Dallas, Texas, on March 20, 1963. According to its microfilm records, Kleins received an order for a rifle on March 13, 1963, on a coupon clipped from the February 1963 issue of the American Rifleman magazine. The order coupon was signed in hand printing A. Hidel, P.O. Box 2915, Dallas, Texas. It was sent in an envelope bearing the same name and return address in handwriting. Document examiners for the Treasury Department and the FBI testified unequivocally that the bold printing on the face of the mail order coupon was in the hand printing of Lee Harvey Oswald and that the writing on the envelope was also his. Oswald's writing on these and other documents was identified by comparing the writing and printing on the documents in question with that appearing on documents known to have been written by Oswald, such as his letters, passport application, and endorsements of checks. In addition to the order coupon, the envelope contained a U.S. postal money order for $21.45 purchased as number 2202130462 in Dallas, Texas, on March 12, 1963. The canceled money order was obtained from the Post Office Department. Opposite the printed words, Pay To, were written the words, Klein's Sporting Goods. And opposite the printed word, From, were written the words, A. Hidel, P.O. Box 2915, Dallas, Texas. These words were also in the handwriting of Lee Harvey Oswald. From Klein's records, it was possible to trace the processing of the order after its receipt. A bank deposit made on March 13, 1963, included an item of $21.45. Klein's shipping order form shows an imprint made by the cash register, which recorded the receipt of $21.45 on March 13, 1963. This price included $19.95 for the rifle and the scope, and $1.50 for postage and handling. 
the rifle without the scope cost only $12.78. According to the vice president of Kleins, William Waldman, the scope was mounted on the rifle by a gunsmith employed by Kleins, and the rifle was shipped fully assembled in accordance with customary company procedures. The specific rifle shipped against the order had been received by Kleins from Crescent on February 21, 1963. It bore the manufacturer's serial number C2766. On that date, Kleins placed an internal control number VC836 on this rifle. According to Kleins' shipping order form, one Italian carbine 6.5 X4 X scope, control number VC836, serial number C2766, was shipped parcel post to A. Hedell, P.O. Box 2915, Dallas, Texas, on March 20, 1963. Information received from the Italian Armed Forces Intelligence Service has established that this particular rifle was the only rifle of its type bearing serial number C2766. The post office box to which the rifle was shipped was rented to Lee H. Oswald from October 9, 1962 to May 14, 1963. Experts on handwriting identification from the Treasury Department and the FBI testified that the signature and other writing on the application for that box were in the handwriting of Lee Harvey Oswald, as was a change of address card dated May 12, 1963, by which Oswald requested that mail addressed to that box be forwarded to him in New Orleans, where he had moved on April 24. Since the rifle was shipped from Chicago on March 20, 1963, it was received in Dallas during the period when Oswald rented and used the box. It is not known whether the application for Post Office Box 2915 listed A. Hedell as a person entitled to receive mail at this box. In accordance with postal regulations, the portion of the application which lists names of persons other than the applicant entitled to receive mail was thrown away after the box was closed in May 1963. Postal Inspector Harry D. Holmes of the Dallas Post Office Testified, however, that when a package is received for a certain box, a notice is placed in that box regardless of whether the name on the package is listed on the application as a person entitled to receive mail through that box. The person having access to the box then takes the notice to the window and is given the package. Ordinarily, Inspector Holmes testified, identification is not requested because it is assumed that the person with the notice is entitled to the package. Oswald's use of the name Hedell to purchase the assassination weapon was one of several instances in which he used this name as an alias. When arrested on the day of the assassination, he had in his possession a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber revolver purchased by mail order coupon from Seaport Traders, Inc., a mail order division of George Rose & Company, Los Angeles. The mail order coupon listed the purchaser as A.J. Hedell, age 28, with the address of Post Office Box 2915 in Dallas. Handwriting experts from the FBI and the Treasury Department testified that the writing on the mail order form was that of Lee Harvey Oswald. Among other identification cards in Oswald's wallet at the time of his arrest were a Selective Service Notice of Classification a Selective Service Registration Certificate, and a Certificate of Service in the U.S. Marine Corps, all three cards being in his own name. Also in his wallet at that time were a Selective Service Notice of Classification and a Marine Certificate of Service in the name of Alec James Hedell. On the Hedell Selective Service card, there appeared a signature, Alec J. Hedell, and the photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald. Experts on questioned documents from the Treasury Department and the FBI testified that the Hedell cards were counterfeit photographic reproductions made by photographing the Oswald cards, retouching the resulting negatives, 
and producing prints from the retouched negatives. The Hedell signature on the notice of classification was in the handwriting of Oswald. In Oswald's personal effects found in his room at 1026 North Beckley Avenue in Dallas was a purported international certificate of vaccination signed by Dr. A. J. Hedell, Post Office Box 30016, New Orleans. It certified that Lee Harvey Oswald had been vaccinated for smallpox on June 8, 1963. This, too, was a forgery. The signature of A. J. Hedeel was in the handwriting of Lee Harvey Oswald. There is no Dr. Hedeel licensed to practice medicine in Louisiana. There is no post office box 30016 in the New Orleans post office. But Oswald had rented post office box 30061 in New Orleans on June 3, 1963, listing Marina Oswald and A.J. Hedell as additional persons entitled to receive mail in the box. The New Orleans postal authorities had not discarded the portion of the application listing the names of those, other than the owner of the box, entitled to receive mail through the box. Expert testimony confirmed that the writing on this application was that of Lee Harvey Oswald. Hedell's name on the post office box application was part of Oswald's use of a non-existent Hedell to serve as president of the so-called New Orleans chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Marina Oswald testified that she first learned of Oswald's use of the fictitious name Hedell in connection with his pro-Castro activities in New Orleans. According to her testimony, he compelled her to write the name Hedell on membership cards in the space designated for the signature of the chapter president. The name Hedell was stamped on some of the chapter's printed literature and on the membership application blanks. Marina Oswald testified, quote, I knew there was no such organization, and I know Hedell is merely an altered Fidel, and I laughed at such foolishness, end quote. Hedell was a fictitious president of an organization of which Oswald was the only member. When seeking employment in New Orleans, Oswald listed a Sergeant Robert Hedell as a reference on one job application, and George Hedell as a reference on another. Both names were found to be fictitious. Moreover, the use of Alec as a first name for Hedell is a further link to Oswald because Alec was Oswald's nickname in Russia. Letters received by Marina Oswald from her husband signed Alec were given to the commission. Oswald's palm print on rifle barrel. Based on the above evidence, the commission concluded that Oswald purchased the rifle found on the sixth floor of the depository building. Additional evidence of ownership was provided in the form of palm print identification, which indicated that Oswald had possession of the rifle he had purchased. A few minutes after the rifle was discovered on the sixth floor of the depository building, it was examined by Lieutenant J.C. Day of the Identification Bureau of the Dallas Police. He lifted the rifle by the wooden stock after his examination convinced him that the wood was too rough to take fingerprints. Captain J.W. Fritz then ejected a cartridge by operating the bolt, but only after Day viewed the knob on the bolt through a magnifying glass and found no prints. Day continued to examine the rifle with the magnifying glass, looking for possible fingerprints. He applied fingerprint powder to the side of the metal housing near the trigger and noticed traces of two prints. At 11.45 p.m. on November 22, the rifle was released to the FBI and forwarded to Washington, where it was examined on the morning of November 23 by Sebastian F. Latona, supervisor of the latent fingerprint section of the FBI's identification division. In his testimony before the commission, Latona stated that when he received the rifle, the area where prints were visible was protected by cellophane. 
he examined these prints as well as photographs of them which the dallas police had made and concluded that quote, the formations the ridge formations and characteristics were insufficient for purposes of either affecting identification or a determination that the print was not identical with the prints of people. Accordingly, my opinion simply was that the latent prints which were there were of no value. End quote. Latona then processed the complete weapon, but developed no identifiable prints. He stated that the poor quality of the wood and the metal would cause the rifle to absorb moisture from the skin, thereby making a clear print unlikely. On November 22, however, before surrendering possession of the rifle to the FBI laboratory, Lieutenant Day of the Dallas Police Department had lifted a palm print from the underside of the gun barrel, quote, near the firing end of the barrel, about three inches under the woodstock, when I took the woodstock loose, end quote. Lifting a print involves the use of adhesive material to remove the fingerprint powder which adheres to the original print. In this way, the powdered impression is actually removed from the object. The lifting had been so complete in this case that there was no trace of the print on the rifle itself when it was examined by Latona. Nor was there any indication that the lift had been performed. Day, on the other hand, believed that sufficient traces of the print had been left on the rifle barrel because he did not release the lifted print until November 26, when he received instructions to send everything that we had to the FBI. The print arrived in the FBI laboratory in Washington on November 29, mounted on a card on which Lieutenant Day had written the words, quote, off underside gun barrel, near end of grip, C2766, end quote. The print's positive identity as having been lifted from the rifle was confirmed by FBI laboratory tests which established that the adhesive material bearing the print also bore impressions of the same irregularities that appeared on the barrel of the rifle. Latona testified that this palm print was the right palm print of Lee Harvey Oswald. At the request of the commission, Arthur Mandela, fingerprint expert with the New York City Police Department, conducted an independent examination and also determined that this was the right palm print of Oswald. Latona's findings were also confirmed by Ronald G. Whitmus, another FBI fingerprint expert. In the opinion of these experts, it was not possible to estimate the time which elapsed between the placing of the print on the rifle and the date of the lift. Experts testifying before the commission agreed that palm prints are as unique as fingerprints for purposes of establishing identification. Oswald's palm print on the underside of the barrel demonstrates that he handled the rifle when it was disassembled. A palm print could not be placed on this portion of the rifle when assembled because the wooden foregrip covers the barrel at this point. The print is additional proof that the rifle was in Oswald's possession. Fibers on Rifle In a crevice between the butt plate of the rifle and the wooden stock was a tuft of several cotton fibers of dark blue, gray-black, and orange-yellow shades. On November 23, 1963, these fibers were examined by Paul M. Stombaugh, a special agent assigned to the hair and fiber unit of the FBI laboratory. He compared them with the fibers found in the shirt which Oswald was wearing when arrested in the Texas theater. This shirt was also composed of dark blue, gray-black, and orange-yellow cotton fibers. Stombaugh testified that the colors, shades, and twist of the fibers found in the tuft on the rifle matched those in Oswald's shirt. Stombaugh explained in his testimony that in fiber analysis, as distinct from fingerprint or firearms identification, it is not possible to state with scientific certainty that a particular small group of fibers come from a certain piece of clothing to the exclusion of all others because there are not enough microscopic characteristics present in fibers. Judgments as to probability will depend on the number and types of matches. He concluded, quote, There is no doubt in my mind that these fibers could have come from this shirt. 
There is no way, however, to eliminate the possibility of the fibers having come from another identical shirt. End quote. Having considered the probabilities as explained in Stombaugh's testimony, the Commission has concluded that the fibers in the tuft on the rifle most probably came from the shirt worn by Oswald when he was arrested, and that this was the same shirt which Oswald wore on the morning of the assassination. Marina Oswald testified that she thought her husband wore this shirt to work on that day. The testimony of those who saw him after the assassination was inconclusive about the color of Oswald's shirt, but Mary Bledsoe, a former landlady of Oswald, saw him on a bus approximately ten minutes after the assassination and identified the shirt as being the one worn by Oswald primarily because of a distinctive hole in the shirt's right elbow. Moreover, the bus transfer which he obtained as he left the bus was still in the pocket when he was arrested. Although Oswald returned to his rooming house after the assassination and, when questioned by the police, claimed to have changed his shirt, the evidence indicates that he continued wearing the same shirt which he was wearing all morning and which he was still wearing when arrested. In light of these findings, the Commission evaluated the additional testimony of Stombaugh that the fibers were caught in the crevice of the rifle's butt plate, quote, in the recent past, end quote. Although Stombaugh was unable to estimate the period of time the fibers were on the rifle, he said that the fibers, quote, were clean, they had good color to them, there was no grease on them, and they were not fragmented. They looked as if they had just been picked up. End quote. The relative freshness of the fibers is strong evidence that they were caught on the rifle on the morning of the assassination or during the preceding evening. For ten days prior to the eve of the assassination, Oswald had not been present at Ruth Payne's house in Irving, Texas, where the rifle was kept. Moreover, the Commission found no reliable evidence that Oswald used the rifle at any time between September 23 when it was transported from New Orleans, and November 22, the day of the assassination. The fact that, on the morning of the assassination, Oswald was wearing the shirt from which these relatively fresh fibers most probably originated, provides some evidence that they were placed on the rifle that day, since there was limited, if any, opportunity for Oswald to handle the weapon during the two months prior to November 22. On the other hand, Stombaugh pointed out that fibers might retain their freshness if the rifle had been, quote, put aside, end quote, after catching the fibers. The rifle used in the assassination probably had been wrapped in a blanket for about eight weeks prior to November 22. Because the relative freshness of these fibers might be explained by the continuous storage of the rifle in the blanket, the Commission was unable to reach any firm conclusion as to when the fibers were caught in the rifle. The Commission was able to conclude, however, that the fibers most probably came from Oswald's shirt. This adds to the conviction of the Commission that Oswald owned and handled the weapon used in the assassination. Photograph of Oswald with Rifle During the period from March 2, 1963 to April 24, 1963, the Oswalds lived on Neely Street in Dallas, in a rented house which had a small backyard. One Sunday, while his wife was hanging diapers, Oswald asked her to take a picture of him holding a rifle, a pistol, and issues of two newspapers, later identified as the worker and the militant. Two pictures were taken. The Commission has concluded that the rifle shown in these pictures is the same rifle which was found on the sixth floor of the depository building on November 22, 1963. One of these pictures, exhibit number 133A, shows most of the rifle's configuration. Special Agent Lindahl L. Shaneyfeldt, a photography expert with the FBI, photographed the rifle used in the assassination attempting to duplicate the position of the rifle and the lighting in exhibit number 133A. After comparing the rifle in the simulated photograph with the rifle in exhibit number 133A, Shaney Felt testified, quote, 
I found it to be the same general configuration. All appearances were the same, end quote. He found, quote, one notch in the stock at this point that appears very faintly in the photograph, end quote. He stated, however, that while he, quote, found no differences, end quote, between the rifles in the two photographs, he could not make a, quote, positive identification to the exclusion of all other rifles of the same general configuration, end quote. The authenticity of these pictures has been established by expert testimony, which links the second picture, Commission Exhibit No. 133B, to Oswald's Imperial Reflex Camera, with which Marina Oswald testified she took the pictures. The negative of that picture, Commission Exhibit No. 133B, was found among Oswald's possessions. Using a recognized technique of determining whether a picture was taken with a particular camera, Shaney Felt compared this negative with a negative which he made by taking a new picture with Oswald's camera. He concluded that the negative of exhibit number 133B was exposed in Oswald's imperial reflex camera to the exclusion of all other cameras. He could not test exhibit number 133A in the same way because the negative was never recovered. Both pictures, however, have identical backgrounds and lighting and judging from the shadows were taken at the same angle. They are photographs of the same scene. Since exhibit number 133B was taken with Oswald's camera, it is reasonably certain that exhibit number 133A was taken by the same camera at the same time as Marina Oswald testified. Moreover, Shaney Felt testified that in his opinion the photographs were not composites of two different photographs and that Oswald's face had not been superimposed on another body. One of the photographs taken by Marina Oswald was widely published in newspapers and magazines, and in many instances the details of these pictures differed from the original and even from each other, particularly as to the configuration of the rifle. The Commission sought to determine whether these photographs were touched prior to publication. Shaney Felt testified that the published photographs appeared to be based on a copy of the original, which the publications had each retouched differently. Several of the publications furnished the commission with the prints they had used, or described by correspondence the retouching they had done. This information enabled the commission to conclude that the published pictures were the same as the original, except for retouching done by these publications, apparently for the purpose of clarifying the lines of the rifle and other details in the picture. The dates surrounding the taking of this picture and the purchase of the rifle reinforce the belief that the rifle in the photograph is the rifle which Oswald bought from Kleins. The rifle was shipped from Kleins in Chicago on March 20, 1963, at a time when the Oswalds were living on Neely Street. From an examination of one of the photographs, the Commission determined the dates of the issues of the militant and the worker which Oswald was holding in his hand. By checking the actual mailing dates of these issues and the time it usually takes to effect delivery to Dallas, it was established that the photographs must have been taken sometime after March 27. Marina Oswald testified that the photographs were taken on a Sunday, about two weeks before the attempted shooting of Major General Edwin A. Walker on April 10, 1963. By Sunday, March 31, 1963, ten days prior to the Walker attempt, Oswald had undoubtedly received the rifle shipped from Chicago on March 20, the revolver shipped from Los Angeles on the same date, and the two newspapers which he was holding in the picture. Rifle Among Oswald's Possessions Marina Oswald testified that the rifle found on the sixth floor of the depository building was the, quote, fateful rifle of Lee Oswald, unquote. Moreover, it was the only rifle owned by her husband following his return from the Soviet Union in June 1962. It had been purchased in March 1963 and taken to New Orleans, where Marina Oswald saw it in their rented apartment during the summer of 1963. It appears from his wife's testimony that Oswald may have sat on the screened-in porch at night practicing with the rifle by looking through the telescopic sight and operating the bolt. 
In September 1963, Oswald loaded their possessions into a station wagon owned by Ruth Payne, who had invited Marina Oswald and the baby to live at her home in Irving, Texas. Marina Oswald has stated that the rifle was among these possessions, although Ruth Payne testified that she was not aware of it. From September 24, 1963, when Marina Oswald arrived in Irving from New Orleans, until the morning of the assassination, the rifle was, according to the evidence, stored in a green and brown blanket in the Payne's garage among the Oswald's other possessions. About one week after the return from New Orleans, Marina Oswald was looking in the garage for parts to the baby's crib and thought that the parts might be in the blanket. When she started to open the blanket, she saw the stock of the rifle. Ruth and Michael Payne both noticed the rolled-up blanket in the garage during the time that Marina Oswald was living in their home. On several occasions, Michael Payne moved the blanket in the garage. He thought it contained tent poles or possibly other camping equipment, such as a folding shovel. When he appeared before the commission, Michael Payne lifted the blanket with the rifle wrapped inside and testified that it appeared to be the same approximate weight and shape as the package in his garage. About three hours after the assassination, a detective and deputy sheriff saw the blanket roll, tied with a string, lying on the floor of the Payne's garage. Each man testified that he thought he could detect the outline of a rifle in the blanket, even though the blanket was empty. Paul M. Stombaugh of the FBI laboratory examined the blanket and discovered a bulge approximately 10 inches long midway in the blanket. This bulge was apparently caused by a hard protruding object which had stretched the blanket's fibers. It could have been caused by the telescopic sight of the rifle, which was approximately 11 inches long. Conclusion Having reviewed the evidence that 1. Lee Harvey Oswald purchased the rifle used in the assassination. 2. Oswald's palm print was on the rifle, in a position which shows that he had handled it while it was disassembled. 3. Fibers found on the rifle most probably came from the shirt Oswald was wearing on the day of the assassination. 4. A photograph taken in the yard of Oswald's apartment showed him holding this rifle, and 5. The rifle was kept among Oswald's possessions from the time of its purchase until the day of the assassination. The Commission concluded that the rifle used to assassinate President Kennedy and wound Governor Connolly was owned and possessed by Lee Harvey Oswald. End of Section 12 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 13 of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 4, The Assassin, Part 2. The Rifle in the Building The Commission has evaluated the evidence tending to show how Lee Harvey Oswald's Manlicker Carcano rifle, serial number C2766, was brought into the depository building, where it was found on the sixth floor shortly after the assassination. In this connection, the Commission considered, one, the circumstances surrounding Oswald's return to Irving, Texas on Thursday, November 21, 1963, two, the disappearance of the rifle from its normal place of storage, three, Oswald's arrival at the depository building on November 22, carrying a long and bulky brown paper package, four, the presence of a long, handmade brown paper bag near the point from which the shots were fired, and five, the palm print, fiber, 
and paper analyses linking Oswald and the assassination weapon to this bag. The Curtain Rod Story During October and November of 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald lived in a rooming house in Dallas, while his wife and children lived in Irving, at the home of Ruth Payne, approximately 15 miles from Oswald's place of work at the Texas School Book Depository. Oswald traveled between Dallas and Irving on weekends in a car driven by a neighbor of the Paynes, Buell Wesley Frazier, who also worked at the depository. Oswald generally would go to Irving on Friday afternoon and return to Dallas Monday morning. According to the testimony of Frazier, Marina Oswald, and Ruth Payne, it appears that Oswald never returned to Irving in midweek prior to November 21, 1963, except on Monday, October 21, when he visited his wife in the hospital after the birth of their second child. During the morning of November 21, Oswald asked Frazier whether he could ride home with him that afternoon. Frazier, surprised, asked him why he was going to Irving on Thursday night rather than Friday. Oswald replied, quote, I'm going home to get some curtain rods to put in an apartment, end quote. The two men left work at 4.40 p.m. and drove to Irving. There was little conversation between them on the way home. Mrs. Linney May Randall, Frazier's sister, commented to her brother about Oswald's unusual midweek return to Irving. Frazier told her that Oswald had come home to get curtain rods. It would appear, however, that obtaining curtain rods was not the purpose of Oswald's trip to Irving on November 21. Mrs. A.C. Johnson, his landlady, testified that Oswald's room at 1026 North Beckley Avenue had curtains and curtain rods and that Oswald had never discussed the subject with her. In the Payne's garage, along with many other objects of a household character, there were two flat, lightweight curtain rods belonging to Ruth Payne, but they were still there on Friday afternoon, after Oswald's arrest. Oswald never asked Mrs. Payne about the use of curtain rods, and Marina Oswald testified that Oswald did not say anything about curtain rods on the day before the assassination. No curtain rods were known to have been discovered in the depository building after the assassination. In deciding whether Oswald carried a rifle to work in a long paper bag on November 22, the commission gave weight to the fact that Oswald gave a false reason for returning home on November 21, and one which provided an excuse for the carrying of a bulky package the following morning. The Missing Rifle Before dinner on November 21, Oswald played on the lawn of the Paynes' home with his daughter June. After dinner, Ruth Payne and Marina Oswald were busy cleaning house and preparing their children for bed. Between the hours of 8 and 9 p.m., they were occupied with the children in the bedrooms located at the extreme east end of the house. On the west end of the house is the attached garage, which can be reached from the kitchen or from the outside. In the garage were the personal belongings of the Oswald family, including, as the evidence has shown, the rifle wrapped in the old brown and green blanket. At approximately 9 p.m., after the children had been put to bed, Mrs. Payne, according to her testimony before the commission, quote, went out to the garage to paint some children's blocks and worked in the garage for half an hour or so. I noticed when I went out that the light was on, end quote. Mrs. Payne was certain that she had not left the light on in the garage after dinner. According to Mrs. Payne, Oswald had gone to bed by 9 p.m., Marina Oswald testified that it was between 9 and 10 p.m. Neither Marina Oswald nor Ruth Payne saw Oswald in the garage. The period between 8 and 9 p.m., however, provided ample opportunity for Oswald to prepare the rifle for his departure the next morning. Only if disassembled could the rifle fit into the paper bag found near the window 
from which the shots were fired. A firearms expert with the FBI assembled the rifle in six minutes using a ten-cent coin as a tool, and he could disassemble it more rapidly. While the rifle may have already been disassembled when Oswald arrived home on Thursday, he had ample time that evening to disassemble the rifle and insert it into the paper bag. On the day of the assassination, Marina Oswald was watching television when she learned of the shooting. A short time later, Mrs. Payne told her that someone had shot the president, quote, from the building in which Lee is working, end quote. Marina Oswald testified that at the time, quote, my heart dropped. I then went to the garage to see whether the rifle was there, and I saw that the blanket was still there, and I said, thank God, end quote. She did not unroll the blanket. She saw that it was in its usual position, and it appeared to her to have something inside. Soon afterward, at about 3 p.m., police officers arrived and searched the house. Mrs. Payne pointed out that most of the Oswald's possessions were in the garage. With Ruth Payne acting as an interpreter, Detective Rose asked Marina whether her husband had a rifle. Mrs. Payne, who had no knowledge of the rifle, first said no, but when the question was translated, Marina Oswald replied yes. She pointed to the blanket which was on the floor very close to where Ruth Payne was standing. Mrs. Payne testified, quote, As she, Marina, told me about it, I stepped onto the blanket roll, and she indicated to me that she had peered into this roll and saw a portion of what she took to be a gun she knew her husband to have, a rifle. And I then translated this to the officers, that she knew that her husband had a gun that he had stored in here. I then stepped off of it, and the officer picked it up in the middle, and it bent so. End quote. Mrs. Payne had the actual blanket before her as she testified, and she indicated that the blanket hung limp in the officer's hand. Marina Oswald testified that this was her first knowledge that the rifle was not in its accustomed place. The Long and Bulky Package on the morning of November 22, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald left the Payne House in Irving at approximately 7.15 a.m., while Marina Oswald was still in bed. Neither she nor Mrs. Payne saw him leave the house. About half a block away from the Payne House was the residence of Mrs. Linney May Randall, the sister of the man with whom Oswald drove to work, Buell Wesley Frazier. Mrs. Randall stated that on the morning of November 22, while her brother was eating breakfast, she looked out the breakfast room window and saw Oswald cross the street and walk toward the driveway where her brother parked his car near the carport. He carried a, quote, heavy brown bag, end quote. Oswald gripped the bag in his right hand near the top, quote, it tapered like this as he hugged it in his hand. It was more bulky toward the bottom, end quote, than toward the top. She then opened the kitchen door and saw Oswald open the right rear door of her brother's car and place the package in the back of the car. Mrs. Randall estimated that the package was approximately 28 inches long and about 8 inches wide. She thought that its color was similar to that of the bag found on the sixth floor of the school book depository after the assassination. Frazier met Oswald at the kitchen door, and together they walked to the car. After entering the car, Frazier glanced over his shoulder and noticed a brown paper package on the back seat. He asked, quote, what's the package, Lee, end quote. Oswald replied, quote, curtain rods, end quote. Frazier told the commission, quote, the main reason he was going over there that Thursday afternoon when he was to bring back some curtain rods so I didn't think any more about it when he told me that, end quote. Frazier estimated that the bag was two feet long, quote, give or take a few inches, end quote, and about five or six inches wide. As they sat in the car, Frazier asked Oswald where his lunch was, and Oswald replied that he was going to buy his lunch that day. Frazier testified that Oswald carried no lunch bag that day, quote, when he rode with me, I say he always brought lunch, 
except that one day on November 22, he didn't bring his lunch that day, end quote. Frazier parked the car in the company parking lot, about two blocks north of the depository building. Oswald left the car first, picked up the brown paper bag, and proceeded toward the building ahead of Frazier. Frazier walked behind, and as they crossed the railroad tracks, he watched the switching of the cars. Frazier recalled that one end of the package was under Oswald's armpit, and the lower part was held with his right hand, so that it was carried straight and parallel to his body. When Oswald entered the rear door of the depository building, he was about 50 feet ahead of Frazier. It was the first time that Oswald had not walked with Frazier from the parking lot to the building entrance. When Frazier entered the building, he did not see Oswald. One employee, Jack Doherty, believed that he saw Oswald coming to work but he does not remember that Oswald had anything in his hands as he entered the door. No other employee has been found who saw Oswald enter that morning. In deciding whether Oswald carried the assassination weapon in the bag which Frazier and Mrs. Randall saw, the Commission has carefully considered the testimony of these two witnesses with regard to the length of the bag. Frazier and Mrs. Randall testified that the bag which Oswald was carrying was approximately 27 or 28 inches long, whereas the wooden stock of the rifle, which is its largest component, measured 34.8 inches. The bag found on the sixth floor was 88 inches long. When Fraser appeared before the commission and was asked to demonstrate how Oswald carried the package, he said, quote, Like I said, I remember that I didn't look at the package very much. But when I did look at it, he did have his hands on the package like that, end quote. And at this point, Fraser placed the upper part of the package under his armpit and attempted to cup his right hand beneath the bottom of the bag. The disassembled rifle was too long to be carried in this manner. Similarly, when the butt of the rifle was placed in Fraser's hand, it extended above his shoulder to ear level. Moreover, in an interview on December 1, 1963, with agents of the FBI, Frazier had marked the point on the back seat of his car, which he believed was where the bag reached when it was laid on the seat with one edge against the door. The distance between the point on the seat and the door was 27 inches. Mrs. Randall said, when shown the paper bag, that the bag she saw Oswald carrying, quote, wasn't that long. I mean, it was folded down at the top, as I told you. It definitely wasn't that long, end quote. And she folded the bag to length of about 28 and a half inches. Frazier doubted whether the bag that Oswald carried was as wide as the bag found on the sixth floor, although Mrs. Randall testified that the width was approximately the same. The Commission has weighed the visual recollection of Fraser and Mrs. Randall against the evidence here presented that the bag Oswald carried contained the assassination weapon and has concluded that Fraser and Randall are mistaken as to the length of the bag. Mrs. Randall saw the bag fleetingly, and her first remembrance is that it was held in Oswald's right hand, quote, and it almost touched the ground as he carried it, end quote. Frazier's view of the bag was from the rear. He continually advised that he was not paying close attention. For example, he said, quote, I didn't pay too much attention the way he was walking because I was walking along there looking at the railroad cars and watching the men on the diesel switch them cars, and I didn't pay too much attention on how he carried the package at all, end quote. Frazier could easily have been mistaken when he stated, that Oswald held the bottom of the bag cupped in his hand with the upper end tucked into his armpit. Location of Bag A handmade bag of wrapping paper and tape was found in the southeast corner of the sixth floor, alongside the window from which the shots were fired. It was not a standard type bag which could be obtained in a store, and it was presumably made for a particular purpose. It was the appropriate size to contain, in disassembled form, Oswald's Manlicher Carcano Rifle Serial Number C2766, 
which was also found on the sixth floor. Three cartons had been placed at the window, apparently to act as a gun rest, and a fourth carton was placed behind those at the window. A person seated on the fourth carton could assemble the rifle without being seen from the rest of the sixth floor, because the cartons stacked around the southeast corner would shield him. The presence of the bag in this corner is cogent evidence that it was used as the container for the rifle. At the time the bag was found, Lieutenant Day of the Dallas Police wrote on it, quote, found next to the sixth floor window, gun fired from may have been used to carry gun, Lieutenant J.C. Day, end quote. Scientific evidence linking rifle and Oswald to paper bag. Oswald's fingerprint and palm print found on bag. Using a standard chemical method involving silver nitrates, the FBI laboratory developed a latent palm print and latent fingerprint on the bag. Sebastian F. Latona, supervisor of the FBI's latent fingerprint section, identified these prints as the left index fingerprint and right palm print of Lee Harvey Oswald. The portion of the palm which was identified was the heel of the right palm, i.e. the area near the wrist, on the little finger side. These prints were examined independently by Ronald G. Whitmiss of the FBI and by Arthur Mandela, a fingerprint expert with the New York City Police Department. Both concluded that the prints were the right palm and left index finger of Lee Oswald. No other identifiable prints were found on the bag. Oswald's palm print on the bottom of the paper bag indicated, of course, that he had handled the bag. Furthermore, it was consistent with the bag having contained a heavy or bulky object when he handled it, since a light object is usually held by the fingers. The palm print was found on the closed end of the bag. It was from Oswald's right hand, in which he carried the long package as he walked from Frazier's car to the building. Materials used to make bag. On the day of the assassination, the Dallas police obtained a sample of wrapping paper and tape from the shipping room of the depository and forwarded it to the FBI laboratory in Washington. James C. Cadigan, a questioned documents expert with the Bureau, compared the samples with the paper and tape in the actual bag. He testified, quote, In all of the observations and physical tests that I made, I found the bag and the paper sample were the same, end quote. Among other tests, the paper and tape were submitted to fiber analysis and spectrographic examination. In addition, the tape was compared to determine whether the sample tape and the tape on the bag had been taken from the tape dispensing machine at the depository. When asked to explain the similarity of characteristics, Cadigan stated, quote, Well, briefly, it would be the thickness of both the paper and the tape the color under various lighting conditions of both the paper and the tape, the width of the tape, the knurled markings on the surface of the fiber, the texture of the fiber, the letting pattern. I found that the paper sack found on the sixth floor and the sample had the same observable characteristics both under the microscope and all the visual tests that I could conduct. The papers I also found were similar in fiber composition, Therefore, in addition to the visual characteristics, microscopic and UV ultraviolet characteristics, end quote. Mr. Cadigan concluded that the paper and tape from the bag were identical in all respects to the sample paper and tape taken from the Texas School Book Depository shipping room on November 22, 1963. On December 1, 1963, a replica bag was made from materials found on that date in the shipping room. This was done as an investigatory aid since the original bag had been discolored during various laboratory examinations and could not be used for valid identification by witnesses. Cadigan found that the paper used to make this replica sack had different characteristics from the paper in the original bag. 
the science of paper analysis enabled him to distinguish between different rolls of paper even though they were produced by the same manufacturer since the depository normally used approximately one roll of paper every three working days it was not surprising that the replica sack made on december one nineteen sixty three had different characteristics from both the actual bag and the sample taken on november twenty two on the other hand since two rolls could be made from the same batch of paper one cannot estimate when prior to november twenty two oswald made the paper bag however the complete identity of characteristics between the paper and tape in the bag found on the sixth floor and the paper and tape found in the shipping room of the depository on november twenty two enabled the commission to conclude that the bag was made from these materials the depository shipping department was on the first floor to which oswald had access in the normal performance of his duties filling orders fibers in paper bag matched fibers in blanket when paul m stombaugh of the fbi laboratory examined the paper bag he found on the inside a single brown delustered viscose fiber and several light green cotton fibers the blanket in which the rifle was stored was composed of brown and green cotton viscose and woolen fibers the single brown viscose fiber found in the bag matched some of the brown viscose fibers from the blanket in all observable characteristics the green cotton fibers found in the paper bag matched some of the green cotton fibers in the blanket quote, in all observable microscopic characteristics end quote. despite these matches however stombaugh was unable to render an opinion that the fibers which he found in the bag had probably come from the blanket because other types of fibers present in the blanket were not found in the bag he concluded quote, all i would say here is that it is possible that these fibers could have come from this blanket because this blanket is composed of brown and green woolen fibers brown and green delustered viscose fibers and brown and green cotton fibers we found no brown cotton fibers no green viscose fibers and no woolen fibers so if i found all of these then i would have been able to say these fibers probably had come from this blanket but since i found so few then i would say the possibility exists these fibers could have come from this blanket End quote. stombaugh confirmed that the rifle could have picked up fibers from the blanket and transferred them to the paper bag in light of the other evidence linking lee harvey oswald the blanket and the rifle to the paper bag found on the sixth floor the commission considered stombaugh's testimony of probative value in deciding whether oswald carried the rifle into the building in the paper bag conclusion the preponderance of the evidence supports the conclusion that lee harvey oswald won told the curtain rod story to Fraser to explain both the return to Irving on a Thursday and the obvious bulk of the package which he intended to bring to work the next day, two, took paper and tape from the wrapping bench of the depository and fashioned a bag large enough to carry the disassembled rifle, three, removed the rifle from the blanket in the Payne's garage on Thursday evening, four, carried the rifle into the depository building concealed in the bag and five left the bag alongside the window from which the shots were fired end of section thirteen recording by linda johnson section fourteen of report of the president's commission on the assassination of president kennedy the warren commission report this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. The Warren Commission Report by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 4 The Assassin Part 3 Oswald at Window. Lee Harvey Oswald was hired on October 15th 
1963, by the Texas School Book Depository, as an order filler. He worked principally on the first and sixth floors of the building, gathering books listed on orders and delivering them to the shipping room on the first floor. He had ready access to the sixth floor from the southeast corner window of which the shots were fired. The commission evaluated the physical evidence found near the window after the assassination and the testimony of eyewitnesses in deciding whether Lee Harvey Oswald was present at this window at the time of the assassination. Palm prints and fingerprints on cartons and paper bag. Below the southeast corner window on the sixth floor was a large carton of books measuring approximately 18 by 12 by 14 inches which had been moved from a stack along the south wall. Atop this carton was a small carton marked Rolling Readers, measuring approximately 13 by 9 by 8 inches. In front of this small carton, and resting partially on the window sill, was another small Rolling Readers carton. These two small cartons had been moved from a stack about three aisles away. The boxes in the window appeared to have been arranged as a convenient gun rest. Behind these boxes was another carton placed on the floor on which a man sitting could look southwesterly down Elm Street over the top of the rolling readers cartons. Next to these cartons was the handmade paper bag previously discussed on which appeared the print of the left index finger and right palm of Lee Harvey Oswald. The cartons were forwarded to the FBI in Washington. Sebastian F. Latona, supervisor of the latent fingerprint section, testified that 20 identifiable fingerprints and 8 palm prints were developed on these cartons. The carton on the windowsill and the large carton below the window contained no prints which could be identified as being those of Lee Harvey Oswald. The other rolling readers carton, however, contained a palm print and a fingerprint which were identified by Latona as being the left palm print and right index fingerprint of Lee Harvey Oswald. The Commission has considered the possibility that the cartons might have been moved in connection with the work that was being performed on the sixth floor on November 22. Depository employees were laying a new floor at the west end and transferring books from the west to the east end of the building. The rolling readers' cartons, however, had not been moved by the floor layers and had apparently been taken to the window from their regular position for some particular purpose. The rolling readers' boxes contained, instead of books, light blocks used as reading aids. They could be easily adjusted and were still solid enough to serve as a gun rest. The box on the floor, behind the three near the window, had been one of these moved by the floor layers from the west wall to near the east side of the building in preparation for the laying of the floor. During the afternoon of November 22, Lieutenant Day of the Dallas Police dusted this carton with powder and developed a palm print on the top edge of the carton on the side nearest the window. The position of this palm print on the carton was parallel with the long axis of the box and at right angles with the short axis. The bottom of the palm rested on the box. Someone sitting on the box facing the window would have his palm in this position if he placed his hand alongside his right hip. This print, which had been cut out of the box, was also forwarded to the FBI, and Latona identified it as Oswald's right palm print. In Latona's opinion, quote, not too long, end quote, a time had elapsed between the time that the print was placed on the carton and the time that it had been developed by the Dallas police. Although Bureau experiments had shown that 24 hours was a likely maximum time, Latona stated that he could only testify with certainty that the print was less than three days old. The print, therefore, could have been placed on the carton at any time within this period. The freshness of this print could be estimated only because the Dallas police developed it through the use of powder. Since cartons absorb perspiration, powder can successfully develop a print on such material only within a limited time. 
when the fbi in washington received the cartons the remaining prints including oswald's on the rolling readers carton were developed by chemical processes the freshness of prints developed in this manner cannot be estimated so no conclusions can be drawn as to whether these remaining prints preceded or followed the print developed in dallas by powder most of the prints were found to have been placed on the cartons by an fbi clerk and a Dallas police officer after the cartons had been processed with powder by the Dallas police. In his independent investigation, Arthur Mandela of the New York City Police Department reached the same conclusion as Latona that the prints found on the cartons were those of Lee Harvey Oswald. In addition, Mandela was of the opinion that the print taken from the carton on the floor was probably made within a day or a day and a half of the examination on November 22. Moreover, another expert with the FBI, Ronald G. Whitmus, conducted a separate examination and also agreed with Latona that the prints were Oswald's. In evaluating the significance of these fingerprint and palm print identifications, the Commission considered the possibility that Oswald handled these cartons as part of his normal duties. Since other identifiable prints were developed on the cartons, the Commission requested that they be compared with the prints of the 12 warehouse employees, who, like Oswald, might have handled the cartons. They were also compared with the prints of those law enforcement officials who might have handled the cartons. The results of this investigation are fully discussed in Chapter 6, page 249. Although a person could handle a carton, and not leave identifiable prints, none of these employees except Oswald left identifiable prints on the cartons. This finding, in addition to the freshness of one of the prints and the presence of Oswald's prints on two of the four cartons and the paper bag, led the Commission to attach some probative value to the fingerprint and palm print identifications in reaching the conclusion that Oswald was at the window from which the shots were fired although the prints do not establish the exact time he was there. Oswald's presence on sixth floor approximately 35 minutes before the assassination. Additional testimony linking Oswald with the point from which the shots were fired was provided by the testimony of Charles Givens, who was the last known employee to see Oswald inside the building prior to the assassination. During the morning of November 22, Givens was working with the floor-laying crew in the southwest section of the sixth floor. At about 11.45 a.m., the floor-laying crew used both elevators to come down from the sixth floor. The employees raced the elevators to the first floor. Givens saw Oswald standing at the gate on the fifth floor as the elevator went by. Givens testified that after reaching the first floor, quote, I discovered I left my cigarettes in my jacket pocket upstairs, and I took the elevator back upstairs to get my jacket with my cigarettes in it, end quote. He saw Oswald, a clipboard in hand, walking from the southeast corner of the sixth floor toward the elevator. Givens said to Oswald, quote, Boy, are you going downstairs? It's near lunchtime, end quote. Oswald said, quote, No, sir, when you get downstairs, close the gate to the elevator. End quote. Oswald was referring to the west elevator, which operates by push button and only with the gate closed. Givens said, OK, and rode down in the east elevator. When he reached the first floor, the west elevator, the one with the gate was not there. Givens thought this was about 11.55 a.m. None of the depository employees is known to have seen Oswald again until after the shooting. The significance of Givens' observation that Oswald was carrying his clipboard became apparent on December 2, 1963, when an employee, Frankie Kaiser, found a clipboard hidden by book cartons in the northwest corner of the sixth floor at the west wall a few feet from where the rifle had been found. This clipboard had been made by Kaiser and had his name on it. Kaiser identified it as the clipboard which Oswald had appropriated from him when Oswald came to work at the depository. Three invoices on this clipboard, each dated November 22, were for Scott Forsman books located on the first and sixth floors. 
Oswald had not filled any of the three orders. Eyewitness Identification of Assassin Howard L. Brennan was an eyewitness to the shooting. As indicated previously, the commission considered his testimony as probative in reaching the conclusion that the shots came from the sixth floor, southeast corner window of the depository building. Brennan also testified that Lee Harvey Oswald, whom he viewed in a police lineup on the night of the assassination, was the man he saw fire the shots from the sixth floor window of the depository building. When the shots were fired, Brennan was in an excellent position to observe anyone in the window. He was sitting on a concrete wall on the southwest corner of Elm and Houston Streets, looking north at the depository building, which was directly in front of him. The window was approximately 120 feet away. In the six to eight minute period before the motorcade arrived, Brennan saw a man leave and return to the window, quote, a couple of times, end quote. After hearing the first shot, which he thought was a motorcycle backfire, Brennan glanced up at the window. He testified that, quote, This man I saw previously was aiming for his last shot. As it appeared to me, he was standing up and resting against the left window sill. End quote. Brennan saw the man fire the last shot and disappear from the window. Within minutes of the assassination, Brennan described the man to the police. This description most probably led to the radio alert sent to police cars at approximately 12.45 p.m., which described the suspect as white, slender, weighing about 165 pounds, about 5 foot 10 inches tall, and in his early 30s. In his sworn statement to the police later that day, Brennan described the man in similar terms, except that he gave the weight as between 165 and 175 pounds, and the height was omitted. In his testimony before the commission, Brennan described the person he saw as, quote, a man in his early 30s, fair complexion, slender, but neat, neat slender, possible 5 foot 10, 160 to 170 pounds. Oswald was 5 foot 9 inches, slender, and 24 years old. When arrested, he gave his weight as 140 pounds. On other occasions, he gave weights of both 140 and 150 pounds. The New Orleans police records of his arrest in August of 1963 show a weight of 136 pounds. The autopsy report indicated an estimated weight of 150 pounds. Brennan's description should also be compared with the eyewitness description broadcast over the Dallas Police Radio at 1.22 p.m. of the man who shot patrolman J.D. Tippett. The suspect was described as, quote, a white male, about 30, 5 foot 8, black hair, slender, end quote. At 1.29 p.m., the police radio reported that the description of the suspect in the Tippett shooting was similar to the description which had been given by Brennan in connection with the assassination. Approximately seven or eight minutes later, the police radio reported that, quote, an eyeball witness, end quote, described the suspect in the Tippett shooting as, quote, a white male, 27, 5 foot 11, 165 pounds, black wavy hair, end quote. As will be discussed fully below, the commission has concluded that this suspect was Lee Harvey Oswald. Although Brennan testified that the man in the window was standing when he fired the shots, most probably he was either sitting or kneeling. The half-open window, the arrangement of the boxes, and the angle of the shots virtually preclude a standing position. It is understandable, however, for Brennan to have believed that the man with the rifle was standing. A photograph of the building, taken seconds after the assassination, shows three employees looking out of the fifth-floor window directly below the window from which the shots were fired. Brennan testified that they were standing, which is their apparent position in the photograph. But the testimony of these employees, together with photographs subsequently taken of them at the scene of the assassination, establishes that they were either squatting or kneeling. Since the window ledges in the depository building are lower than in most buildings, 
a person squatting or kneeling exposes more of his body than would normally be the case. From the street, this creates the impression that the person is standing. Brennan could have seen enough of the body of a kneeling or squatting person to estimate his height. Shortly after the assassination, Brennan noticed two of these employees leaving the building and immediately identified them as having been in the fifth floor windows. When the three employees appeared before the commission, Brennan identified the two whom he saw leave the building. The two men, Harold Norman and James Jarman, Jr., each confirmed that when they came out of the building, they saw and heard Brennan describing what he had seen. Norman stated, quote, I remember him talking, and I believe I remember seeing him saying that he saw us when we first went up to the fifth floor window. He saw us then. End quote. Jarman heard Brennan, quote, talking to this officer about that he had heard these shots and he had seen the barrel of the gun sticking out the window, and he said that the shots came from inside the building, end quote. During the evening of November 22, Brennan identified Oswald as the person in the lineup who bore the closest resemblance to the man in the window, but he said he was unable to make a positive identification. Prior to the lineup, Brennan had seen Oswald's picture on television, and he told the commission that whether this affected his identification, quote, is something I do not know, end quote. In an interview with FBI agents on December 17, 1963, Brennan stated that he was sure that the person firing the rifle was Oswald. In another interview with FBI agents on January 7, 1964, Brennan appeared to revert to his earlier inability to make a positive identification, but in his testimony before the commission, Brennan stated that his remarks of January 7 were intended by him merely as an accurate report of what he said on November 22. Brennan told the commission that he could have made a positive identification in the lineup on November 22, but did not do so because he felt that the assassination was, quote, a communist activity, and I felt like there hadn't been more than one eyewitness, and if it got to be a known fact that I was an eyewitness, my family or I, either one, might not be safe. End quote. When specifically asked before the commission whether or not he could positively identify the man he saw in the sixth floor window as the same man he saw in the police station, Brennan stated, quote, I could at that time, I could with all sincerity identify him as being the same man. End quote. Although the record indicates that Brennan was an accurate observer, he declined to make a positive identification of Oswald when he first saw him in the police lineup. The commission, therefore, does not base its conclusion concerning the identity of the assassin on Brennan's subsequent certain identification of Lee Harvey Oswald as the man he saw fire the rifle. Immediately after the assassination, however, Brennan described to the police the man he saw in the window and then identified Oswald as the person who most nearly resembled the man he saw. The commission is satisfied that, at the least, Brennan saw a man in the window who closely resembled Lee Harvey Oswald, and that Brennan believes the man he saw was, in fact, Lee Harvey Oswald. Two other witnesses were able to offer partial descriptions of a man they saw in the southeast corner window of the sixth floor approximately one minute before the assassination, although neither witness saw the shots being fired. Ronald Fisher and Robert Edwards were standing on the curb at the southwest corner of Elm and Houston Streets, the same corner where Brennan was sitting on a concrete wall. Fisher testified that about 10 or 15 seconds before the motorcade turned onto Houston Street from Main Street, Edwards said, quote, look at that guy there in that window, end quote. Fisher looked up and watched the man in the window for 10 or 15 seconds and then started watching the motorcade, which came into view on Houston Street. He said that the man held his attention until the motorcade came because the man, quote, appeared uncomfortable for one, and secondly, he wasn't watching, 
He didn't look like he was watching for the parade. He looked like he was looking down toward the Trinity River and the triple underpass down at the end, toward the end of Elm Street. And all the time I watched him, he never moved his head. He never, he never moved anything, just was there, transfixed. End quote. Fisher placed the man in the easternmost window on the south side of the depository building on either the fifth or the sixth floor. He said that he could see the man from the middle of his chest to the top of his head, and that as he was facing the window, the man was in the lower right-hand portion of the window, and, quote, seemed to be sitting a little forward, end quote. The man was dressed in a light-colored open-neck shirt, which could have been either a sports shirt or a t-shirt, and he had brown hair, a slender face and neck, with light complexion, and looked to be 22 or 24 years old. The person in the window was a white man, and, quote, looked to me like he was looking straight at the triple underpass, end quote, down Elm Street. Boxes and cases were stacked behind him. Approximately one week after the assassination, according to Fisher, policemen showed him a picture of Oswald. In his testimony, he said, quote, I told them that that could have been the man, that that could have been the man that I saw in the window in the schoolbook depository building, but that I was not sure, end quote. Fisher described the man's hair as some shade of brown, quote, it wasn't dark and it wasn't light, end quote. On November 22, Fisher had apparently described the man as, quote, light-headed, end quote. Fisher explained that he did not mean by the earlier statement that the man was blonde, but rather that his hair was not black. Robert Edwards said that while looking at the south side of the depository building shortly before the motorcade, he saw nothing of importance, quote, except maybe one individual who was up there in the corner room of the sixth floor which was crowded in among boxes, end quote. He said that this was a white man about average in size, quote, possibly thin, end quote, and that he thought the man had light brown hair. Fisher and Edwards did not see the man clearly enough or long enough to identify him. Their testimony is of probative value, however, because their limited description is consistent with that of the man who has been found by the commission, based on other evidence, to have fired the shots from the window. Another person who saw the assassin, as the shots were fired, was Amos L. Ewens, age 15, who was one of the first witnesses to alert the police to the depository as the source of the shots, as has been discussed in Chapter 3. Ewens, who was on the southwest corner of Elm and Houston Streets, testified that he could not describe the man he saw in the window. According to Ewens, however, as the man lowered his head in order to aim the rifle down Elm Street, he appeared to have a white bald spot on his head. Shortly after the assassination, Ewens signed an affidavit describing the man as white. But a radio reporter testified that Ewens described the man to him as, quote, colored, end quote. In his commission testimony, Ewens stated that he could not ascertain the man's race, and that the statement in the affidavit was intended to refer only to the white spot on the man's head and not to his race. A Secret Service agent who spoke to Ewens approximately 20 to 30 minutes after the assassination confirmed that Ewens could neither describe the man in the window nor indicate his race. Accordingly, Ewens's testimony is considered probative as to the source of the shots but is inconclusive as to the identity of the man in the window. In evaluating the evidence that Oswald was at the southeast corner window of the sixth floor at the time of the shooting, the Commission has considered the allegation that Oswald was photographed standing in front of the building when the shots were fired. The picture which gave rise to these allegations was taken by Associated Press photographer James W. Altgens, who was standing on the south side of Elm Street between the triple underpass and the depository building. As the motorcade started its descent down Elm Street, Altgens snapped a picture of the presidential limousine with the entrance to the depository building in the background. Just before snapping the picture, Altgens heard a noise which sounded like the popping of a firecracker. 
investigation has established that Alchin's picture was taken approximately two seconds after the firing of the shot which entered the back of the president's neck. In the background of this picture were several employees watching the parade from the steps of the depository building. One of these employees was alleged to resemble Lee Harvey Oswald. The commission has determined that the employee was, in fact, Billy Lovelady, who identified himself in the picture. Standing alongside him were Buell Wesley Frazier and William Shelley, who also identified Lovelady. The commission is satisfied that Oswald does not appear in this photograph. End of section 14. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 15 of Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, the Warren Commission Report, by the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy. Chapter 4, The Assassin, Part 4, Oswald's Actions in Building After Assassination. In considering whether Oswald was at the southeast corner window at the time the shots were fired, the Commission has reviewed the testimony of witnesses who saw Oswald in the building within minutes after the assassination. The Commission has found that Oswald's movements, as described by these witnesses, are consistent with his having been at the window at 12.30 p.m. The Encounter in the Lunchroom The first person to see Oswald after the assassination was Patrolman M. L. Baker of the Dallas Police Department. Baker was riding a two-wheeled motorcycle behind the last press car of the motorcade. As he turned the corner from Maine onto Houston, at a speed of about 5 to 10 miles per hour, a strong wind blowing from the north almost unseated him. At about this time, he heard the first shot. Having recently heard the sounds of rifles while on a hunting trip, Baker recognized the shots as that of a high-powered rifle. Quote, it sounded high, and I immediately kind of looked up, and I had a feeling that it came from the building, either right in front of me, the depository building, or of the one across to the right of it, end quote. He saw pigeons flutter upward. He was not certain, quote, but I am pretty sure they came from the building right on the northwest corner, end quote. He heard two more shots, spaced, quote, pretty well even to me, end quote. After the third shot, he, quote, revved that motorcycle up, end quote, drove to the northwest corner of Elm and Houston, and parked approximately 10 feet from the traffic signal. As he was parking, he noted that people were, quote, falling and they were rolling around down there, grabbing their children, end quote, and rushing about. A woman screamed, quote, Oh, they have shot that man, they have shot that man, end quote. Baker, quote, had it in mind that the shots came from the top of this building here, end quote. So he ran straight to the entrance of the depository building. Baker testified that he entered the lobby of the building and, quote, spoke out and asked where the stairs or elevator was, and this man, Mr. Truly, spoke up and says, it seems to me like he says, I am a building manager, follow me, officer, and I will show you, end quote. Baker and building superintendent Roy Truly went through a second set of doors and stopped at a swinging door where Baker bumped into Truly's back. They went through the swinging door and continued at, quote, a good trot, end quote, to the northwest corner of the floor where Truly hoped to find one of the two freight elevators. Neither elevator was there. Truly pushed the button for the west elevator, which operates automatically if the gate is closed. He shouted twice, quote, turn loose the elevator, end quote. When the elevator failed to come, Baker said, quote, let's take the stairs, end quote, and he followed Truly up the stairway, which is to the west of the elevator. The stairway is located in the northwest corner of the depository building. 
The stairs from one floor to the next are L-shaped, with both legs of the L approximately the same length. Because the stairway itself is enclosed, neither Baker nor Truly could see anything on the second floor hallway until they reached the landing at the top of the stairs. On the second floor landing, there is a small open area with a door at the east end. This door leads into a small vestibule, and another door leads from the vestibule into the second floor lunchroom. The lunchroom door is usually open, but the first door is kept shut by a closing mechanism on the door. This vestibule door is solid, except for a small glass window in the upper part of the door. As Baker reached the second floor, he was about 20 feet from the vestibule door. He intended to continue around to his left toward the stairway going up, but through the window in the door, he caught a fleeting glimpse of a man walking in the vestibule toward the lunchroom. Since the vestibule door is only a few feet from the lunchroom door, the man must have entered the vestibule only a second or two before Baker arrived at the top of the stairwell. Yet, he must have entered the vestibule door before Truly reached the top of the stairwell, since Truly did not see him. If the man had passed from the vestibule into the lunchroom, Baker could not have seen him. Baker said, quote, He, Truly, had already started around the bend to come to the next elevator going up. I was coming out this one on the second floor, and I don't know, I was kind of sweeping this area as I come up. I was looking from right to left, and as I got to this door here, I caught a glimpse of this man, just, you know, a sudden glimpse, and it looked to me like he was going away from me. I can't say whether he had gone on through that door, the lunchroom door, or not. All I did was catch a glance at him, and evidently he was, this door might have been, you know, closing and almost shut at that time, end quote. With his revolver drawn, Baker opened the vestibule door and ran into the vestibule. He saw a man walking away from him in the lunchroom. Baker stopped at the door of the lunchroom and commanded, quote, come here, end quote. The man turned and walked back toward Baker. He had been proceeding toward the rear of the lunchroom. Along a side wall of the lunchroom was a soft drink vending machine, but at that time the man had nothing in his hands. Meanwhile, Truly had run up several steps toward the third floor. Missing Baker, he came back to find the officer in the doorway to the lunchroom facing Lee Harvey Oswald. Baker turned to Truly and said, quote, Do you know this man? Does he work here? End quote. Truly replied, Yes. Baker stated later that the man did not seem to be out of breath. He seemed calm. Quote, he never did say a word or nothing. In fact, he didn't change his expression one bit, end quote. Truly said of Oswald, quote, He didn't seem to be excited or overly afraid or anything. He might have been a bit startled, like I might have been if somebody confronted me. But I cannot recall any change in expression of any kind on his face, end quote. Truly thought that the officer's gun at that time appeared to be almost touching the middle portion of Oswald's body. Truly also noted at this time that Oswald's hands were empty. In an effort to determine whether Oswald could have descended to the lunchroom from the sixth floor by the time Baker and Truly arrived, Commission Counsel asked Baker and Truly to repeat their movements from the time of the shot until Baker came upon Oswald in the lunchroom. Baker placed himself on a motorcycle about 200 feet from the corner of Elm and Houston Streets, where he said he heard the shots. Truly stood in front of the building. At a given signal, they reenacted the event. Baker's movements were timed with a stopwatch. On the first test, the elapsed time between the simulated first shot and Baker's arrival on the second floor stair landing was one minute and 30 seconds. The second test run required one minute and 15 seconds. A test was also conducted to determine the time required to walk from the southeast corner of the sixth floor to the second floor lunchroom by stairway. Special Agent John Howlett of the Secret Service carried a rifle from the southeast corner of the sixth floor along the east aisle to the northeast corner. He placed the rifle on the floor near the site where Oswald's rifle was actually found after the shooting. Then Howlett walked down the stairway to the second floor landing and entered the lunchroom. 
The first test, run at normal walking pace, required 1 minute 18 seconds. The second test, at a fast walk, took 1 minute 14 seconds. The second test followed immediately after the first. The only interval was the time necessary to ride in the elevator from the second to the sixth floor and walk back to the southeast corner. Howlett was not short-winded at the end of either test run. The minimum time required by Baker to park his motorcycle and reach the second floor lunchroom was within three seconds of the time needed to walk from the southeast corner of the sixth floor down the stairway to the lunchroom. The time actually required for Baker and Truly to reach the second floor on November 22 was probably longer than in the test runs. For example, Baker required 15 seconds after the simulated shot to ride his motorcycle 180 to 200 feet, park it, and run 45 feet to the building. No allowance was made for the special conditions which existed on the day of the assassination, possible delayed reaction to the shot, jostling with the crowd of people on the steps, and scanning the area along Elm Street and the Parkway. Baker said, quote, We simulated the shots, and by the time we got there, we did everything that I did that day, and this would be the minimum because I'm sure that I, you know, it took me a little longer, end quote. On the basis of this time test, therefore, the Commission concluded that Oswald could have fired the shots and still have been present in the second floor lunchroom when seen by Baker and Truly. That Oswald descended by stairway from the sixth floor to the second floor lunchroom is consistent with the movements of the two elevators, which would have provided the other possible means of descent. When Truly, accompanied by Baker, ran to the rear of the first floor, he was certain that both elevators, which occupy the same shaft, were on the fifth floor. Baker, not realizing that there were two elevators, thought that only one elevator was in the shaft and that it was two or three floors above the second floor. In the few seconds which elapsed while Baker and Truly ran from the first to the second floor, neither of these slow elevators could have descended from the fifth to the second floor. Furthermore, no elevator was at the second floor when they arrived there. Truly and Baker continued up the stairs after the encounter with Oswald in the lunchroom. There was no elevator on the third or fourth floor. The east elevator was on the fifth floor when they arrived. The west elevator was not. They took the east elevator to the seventh floor and ran up a stairway to the roof where they searched for several minutes. Jack Darty, an employee working on the fifth floor, testified that he took the west elevator to the first floor after hearing a noise which sounded like a backfire. Eddie Piper, the janitor, told Darty that the president had been shot, but in his testimony, Piper did not mention either seeing or talking with Darty during these moments of excitement. Both Darty and Piper were confused witnesses. They had no exact memory of the events of that afternoon. Truly was probably correct in stating that the west elevator was on the fifth floor when he looked up the elevator shaft from the first floor. The west elevator was not on the fifth floor when Baker and Truly reached that floor, probably because Jack Doherty took it to the first floor while Baker and Truly were running up the stairs or in the lunchroom with Oswald. Neither elevator could have been used by Oswald as a means of descent. Oswald's use of the stairway is consistent with the testimony of other employees in the building. Three employees, James Jarman, Jr., Harold Norman, and Bonnie Ray Williams, were watching the parade from the fifth floor, directly below the window from which the shots were fired. They rushed to the west windows after the shots were fired and remained there, until after they saw Patrolman Baker's white helmet on the fifth floor moving toward the elevator. While they were at the west windows, their view of the stairwell was completely blocked by shelves and boxes. This is the period during which Oswald would have descended the stairs. In all likelihood, Doherty took the elevator down from the fifth floor after Jarman, Norman, and Williams ran to the west windows and were deciding what to do. None of these three men saw Doherty, 
probably because of the anxiety of the moment and because of the books which may have blocked the view. Neither Jarman, Norman, Williams, or Doherty saw Oswald. Victoria Adams, who worked on the fourth floor of the depository building, claimed that within about one minute following the shots, she ran from a window on the south side of the fourth floor, down the rear stairs to the first floor, where she encountered two depository employees, William Shelley and Billy Lovelady. If her estimate of time is correct, she reached the bottom of the stairs before Truly and Baker started up, and she must have run down the stairs ahead of Oswald and would probably have seen or heard him. Actually, she noticed no one on the back stairs. If she descended from the fourth to the first floor as fast as she claimed in her testimony, she would have seen Baker or Truly on the first floor or on the stairs unless they were already in the second floor lunchroom talking to Oswald. When she reached the first floor, she actually saw Shelley and Lovelady slightly east of the east elevator. Shelley and Lovelady, however, have testified that they were watching the parade from the top step of the building entrance when Gloria Calverly, who works in the depository building, ran up and said that the president had been shot. Lovelady and Shelley moved out into the street. About this time, Shelley saw Truly and Patrolman Baker go into the building. Shelley and Lovelady, at a fast walk or trot, turned west into the railroad yards and then to the west side of the depository building. They re-entered the building by the rear door several minutes after Baker and Truly rushed through the front entrance. On entering, Lovelady saw a girl on the first floor who he believes was Victoria Adams. If Miss Adams accurately recalled meeting Shelley and Lovelady when she reached the bottom of the stairs, then her estimate of the time when she descended from the fourth floor is incorrect, and she actually came down the stairs several minutes after Oswald and after Truly and Baker as well. Oswald's Departure from Building Within a minute after Baker and Truly left Oswald in the lunchroom, Mrs. R. A. Reed, clerical supervisor for the Texas School Book Depository, saw him walk through the clerical office on the second floor toward the door leading to the front stairway. Mrs. Reed had watched the parade from the sidewalk in front of the building with Truly and Mr. O. V. Campbell, vice president of the depository. She testified that she heard three shots, which she thought came from the building. She ran inside and up the front stairs into the large open office reserved for clerical employees. As she approached her desk, she saw Oswald. He was walking into the office from the back hallway, carrying a full bottle of Coca-Cola in his hand, presumably purchased after the encounter with Baker and Truly. As Oswald passed Mrs. Reed, she said, quote, Oh, the president has been shot, but maybe they didn't hit him. End quote. Oswald mumbled something and walked by. She paid no more attention to him. The only exit from the office, in the direction Oswald was moving, was through the door to the front stairway. Mrs. Reed testified that when she saw Oswald, he was wearing a t shirt and no jacket. When he left home that morning, Marina Oswald, who was still in bed, suggested that he wear a jacket. A blue jacket, later identified by Marina Oswald as her husband's, was subsequently found in the building, apparently left behind by Oswald. Mrs. Reed believes that she returned to her desk from the street about two minutes after the shooting. Reconstructing her movements, Mrs. Reed ran the distance three times and was timed in two minutes by stopwatch. The reconstruction was the minimum time. Accordingly, she probably met Oswald at about 12.32, approximately 30 to 45 seconds, after Oswald's lunchroom encounter with Baker and Truly. After leaving Mrs. Reed in the front office, Oswald could have gone down the stairs and out the front door by 12.33 p.m., three minutes after the shooting. At that time, the building had not yet been sealed off by the police. While it was difficult to determine exactly when the police sealed off the building, 
the earliest estimates would still have permitted Oswald to leave the building by 1233. One of the police officers assigned to the corner of Elm and Houston Streets for the presidential motorcade, W. E. Barnett, testified that immediately after the shots, he went to the rear of the building to check the fire escape. He then returned to the corner of Elm and Houston, where he met a sergeant who instructed him to find out the name of the building. Barnett ran to the building, noted its name, and then returned to the corner. There he was met by a construction worker, in all likelihood Howard Brennan, who was wearing his work helmet. This worker told Barnett that the shots had been fired from a window in the depository building, whereupon Barnett posted himself at the front door to make certain that no one left the building. The sergeant did the same thing at the rear of the building. Barnett estimated that approximately three minutes elapsed between the time he heard the last of the shots and the time he started guarding the front door. According to Barnett, quote, there were people going in and out, end quote, during this period. Sergeant D. V. Harkness of the Dallas Police said that to his knowledge the building was not sealed off at 12.36 p.m. when he called in on police radio that a witness, Amos Ewens, had seen shots fired from a window of the building. At that time, Inspector Herbert V. Sawyer's car was parked in front of the building. Harkness did not know whether or not two officers with Sawyer were guarding the doors. At 12.34 p.m., Sawyer heard a call over the police radio that the shots had come from the depository building. He then entered the building and took the front passenger elevator as far as it would go, the fourth floor. After inspecting this floor, Sawyer returned to the street about three minutes after he entered the building. After he returned to the street, he directed Sergeant Harkness to station two patrolmen at the front door and not let anyone in or out. He also directed that the back door be sealed off. This was no earlier than 12.37 p.m. and may have been later. Special Agent Forrest V. Sorrells of the Secret Service, who had been in the motorcade, testified that after driving to Parkland Hospital, he returned to the depository building about 20 minutes after the shooting, found no police officers at the rear door, and was able to enter through this door without identifying himself. Although Oswald probably left the building at about 12.33 p.m., his absence was not noticed until at least one half hour later. Truly, who had returned with Patrolman Baker from the roof, saw the police questioning the warehouse employees. Approximately 15 men worked in the warehouse and truly noticed that Oswald was not among those being questioned. Satisfying himself that Oswald was missing, truly obtained Oswald's address, phone number, and description from his employment application card. The address listed was for the Payne home in Irving. Truly gave this information to Captain Fritz, who was on the sixth floor at the time. Truly estimated that he gave this information to Fritz about 15 or 20 minutes after the shots, but it was probably no earlier than 1.22 p.m., the time when the rifle was found. Fritz believed that he learned of Oswald's absence after the rifle was found. The fact that Truly found Fritz in the northwest corner of the floor, near the point where the rifle was found, supports Fritz's recollection. Conclusion Fingerprint and palm print evidence establishes that Oswald handled two of the four cartons next to the window, and also handled a paper bag which was found near the cartons. Oswald was seen in the vicinity of the southeast corner of the sixth floor approximately 35 minutes before the assassination, and no one could be found who saw Oswald anywhere else in the building until after the shooting. An eyewitness to the shooting immediately provided a description of the man in the window, which was similar to Oswald's actual appearance. This witness identified Oswald in a lineup as the man most nearly resembling the man he saw, and later identified Oswald as the man he observed. 
Oswald's known actions in the building immediately after the assassination are consistent with his having been at the southeast corner window of the sixth floor at 12.30 p.m. On the basis of these findings, the Commission has concluded that Oswald, at the time of the assassination, was present at the window from which the shots were fired. End of section 15. Recording by Linda Johnson.